Confessions of Augustine Book 1 In God's searching presence, Augustine undertakes to plumb the depths of his memory to trace the mysterious pilgrimage of grace which his life has been, and to praise God for his constant and omnipotent grace. In a mood of sustained prayer, he recalls what he can of his infancy, his learning to speak, and his childhood experiences in school. He concludes with a pian of grateful praise to God. Chapter 1 Great art thou, O Lord, and greatly to be praised. Great is thy power, and infinite is thy wisdom. And man desires to praise thee, for he is a part of thy creation. He bears his mortality about with him, and carries the evidence of his sin, and the proof that thou dost resist the proud. Still, he desires to praise thee, this man who is only a part of thy creation. Thou hast prompted him, that he should delight to praise thee, for thou hast made us for thyself, and restless is our heart until it comes to rest in thee. Grant me, O Lord, to know and understand whether first to invoke thee or to praise thee, whether first to know thee or call upon thee. But who can invoke thee, knowing thee not? For he who knows thee not may invoke thee as another than thou art. It may be that we should invoke thee in order that we may come to know thee, but how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Or how shall they believe without a preacher? Now they shall praise the Lord who seek him. For those who seek shall find him, and finding him shall praise him. I will seek thee, O Lord, and call upon thee. I call upon thee, O Lord, in my faith which thou hast given me, which thou hast inspired in me through the humanity of thy Son, and through the ministry of thy preacher. Chapter 2 And how shall I call upon my God, my God and my Lord? For when I call on him, I ask him to come into me. On what place is there in me, into which my God can come? How could God, the God who made both heaven and earth, Come into me. Is there anything in me, O Lord my God, that can contain thee? Do even the heaven and the earth which thou hast made, and in which thou didst make me, contain thee? Is it possible that, since without thee nothing would be which does exist, thou didst make it so, that whatever exists has some capacity to receive thee? Why then, do I ask thee to come into me, since I also am, and could not be if thou wert not in me? For I am not, after all, in hell, and yet thou art there too. For if I go down into hell, thou art there. Therefore I would not exist, I would simply not be at all, unless I exist in thee, from whom and by whom and in whom all things are. Even so, Lord, even so. Where do I call thee to, when I am already in thee? Or from whence wouldst thou come into me? Wherefore, beyond heaven and earth, could I go that there my God might come to me? He who hath said, I fill heaven and earth. <laughs> Chapter 3 Since then thou dost fill the heaven and the earth, do they contain thee? Or dost thou fill and overflow them, because they cannot contain thee? And where dost thou pour out what remains of thee after heaven and earth are full? Or, indeed, is there no need that thou, who dost contain all things, shouldst be contained by any? since those things which thou dost fill thou fillest by containing them. For the vessels which thou dost fill do not confine thee, since even if they were broken, 
thou wouldst not be poured out. And when thou art poured out on us, thou art not thereby brought down, rather, we are uplifted. Thou art not scattered, rather, thou dost gather us together. But when thou dost fill all things, dost thou fill them with thy whole being? Or, since not even all things together could contain thee altogether, does any one thing contain a single part? And do all things contain that same part at the same time? Do singulars contain thee singly? Do greater things contain more of thee, and smaller things less? Or is it not rather that thou art wholly present everywhere, yet in such a way that nothing contains thee wholly? <laughs> Chapter 4 What, therefore, is my God? What, I ask, but the Lord God? For who is Lord but the Lord himself? Or who is God besides our God? Most high, most excellent, most potent, most omnipotent, most merciful, and most just, most secret, and most truly present, most beautiful, and most strong. Stable, yet not supported. Unchangeable, yet changing all things. Never new, never old. Making all things new, yet bringing old age upon the proud, and they know it not. Always working, ever at rest. Gathering, yet needing nothing. Sustaining, pervading, and protecting creating, nourishing, and developing, seeking, and yet possessing all things. Thou dost love, but without passion, art jealous, yet free from care, dost repent without remorse, art angry, yet remainest serene. Thou changest thy ways, leaving thy plans unchanged, Thou recoverest what thou hast never really lost. Thou art never in need, but still thou dost rejoice at thy gains, art never greedy, yet demandest dividends. Men pay more than is required so that thou dost become a debtor. Yet who can possess anything at all which is not already thine? Thou owest men nothing yet payest out to them as if in debt to thy creature. And when thou dost cancel debts, thou losest nothing thereby. Yet, O oh my God, my life, my holy joy, what is this I have said? What can any man say when he speaks of thee? But woe to them that keep silence, since even those who say most are dumb. Chapter 5 Who shall bring me to rest in thee? Who will send thee into my heart so to overwhelm it that my sins shall be blotted out, and I may embrace thee, my only good? What art thou to me? Have mercy that I may speak. What am I to thee that thou shouldst command me to love thee? And if I do it not, art angry, and threatenest vast misery. Is it then a trifling sorrow not to love thee? It is not so to me. Tell me, by thy mercy, O Lord, my God, what thou art to me. Say to my soul, I am your salvation, so speak that I may hear. Behold, the ears of my heart are before thee, O Lord. Open them, and say to my soul, I am your salvation. I will hasten after that voice, and I will lay upon thee. Hide not thy face from me. 
Even if I die, let me see thy face lest I die. The house of my soul is too narrow for thee to come into me. Let it be enlarged by thee. It is in ruins. Do thou restore it. There is much about it which must offend thy eyes. I confess and know it. But who will cleanse it? Or to whom shall I cry but to thee? Cleanse thou me from my secret faults, O Lord, and keep back thy servant from strange sins. I believe, and therefore do I speak. But thou, O Lord, thou knowest. Have I not confessed my transgressions unto thee, O my God? And hast thou not put away the iniquity of my heart? I do not contend in judgment with thee, who art truth itself, and I would not deceive myself, lest my iniquity lie even to itself. I do not, therefore, contend in judgment with thee, for if thou, Lord, shouldst mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? <laughs> Chapter 6 Still, dust and ashes as I am, allow me to speak before thy mercy. Allow me to speak, for, behold, it is to thy mercy that I speak, and not to a man who scorns me. Yet perhaps even thou mightest scorn me. But when thou dost turn and attend to me, thou wilt have mercy upon me. For what do I wish to say, O Lord my God, but that I know not whence I came hither into this life and death? Or should I call it death and life? I do not know. And yet the consolations of thy mercy have sustained me from the very beginning, as I have heard from my fleshy parents, from whom and in whom thou didst form me in time for I cannot myself remember. Thus, even though they sustained me by the consolation of woman's milk, neither my mother nor my nurses filled their own breasts but thou. Through them didst give me the food of infancy according to thy ordinance, and thy bounty which underlie all things. For it was thou who didst cause me not to want more than thou gavest, and it was thou who gavest to those who nourished me the will to give me what thou didst give them. And they, by an instinctive affection, were willing to give me what thou hadst supplied abundantly. It was, indeed, good for them that my good should come through them, though, in truth, it was not from them, but by them. For it is from thee, O God, that all good things come, and from my God is all my health. This is what I have since learned, as thou hast made it abundantly clear, by all that I have seen thee give, both to me and to those around me. For even at the very first I knew how to suck, to lie quiet when I was full, and to cry when in pain. Nothing more. Afterward, I began to laugh, at first in my sleep, then when waking. For this I have been told about myself, and believe it, though I cannot remember it. For I see the same things in other infants. Then, little by little, I realized where I was, and wished to tell my wishes to those who might satisfy them, but I could not. For my wants were inside me and they were outside, and they could not by any powers of theirs come into my soul. And so I would fling my arms and legs about and cry, making the few and feeble gestures that I could, though indeed the signs were not much like what I inwardly desired. And when I was not satisfied, either from not being understood, or because what I got was not good for me, 
I grew indignant that my elders were not subject to me, and that those on whom I actually had no claim did not wait on me as slaves, and I avenged myself on them by crying. That infants are like this. I have myself been able to learn by watching them, and they, though they knew me not, have shown me better what I was like than my own nurses who knew me. And behold, my infancy died long ago, but I am still living. But thou, O Lord, whose life is forever, and in whom nothing dies, since before the world was, indeed, before all that can be called before, thou wast, and thou art the God and Lord of all thy creatures, and with thee abide all the stable causes of all unstable things, the unchanging sources of all changeable things, and the eternal reasons of all non-rational and temporal things. Tell me, thy suppliant, O God, tell me, O merciful one. In pity, tell a pitiful creature whether my infancy followed yet an earlier age of my life that had already passed away before it. Was it such another age which I spent in my mother's womb? For something of that sort has been suggested to me, and I have myself seen pregnant women. But what, O oh God, my joy, preceded that period of life? Was I indeed anywhere or anybody? No one can explain these things to me, neither father nor mother, nor the experience of others, nor my own memory. Dost thou laugh at me for asking such things? Or dost thou command me to praise and confess unto thee only what I know? I give thanks to thee, O Lord of heaven and earth, giving praise to thee for that first being and my infancy of which I have no memory. For thou hast granted to man that he should come to self-knowledge through the knowledge of others, and that he should believe many things about himself on the authority of the women folk. Now, clearly, I had life and being, and as my infancy closed, I was already learning signs by which my feelings could be communicated to others. Whence could such a creature come but from thee, O Lord? Is any man skillful enough to have fashioned himself? Or is there any other source from which being and life could flow into us, save this, that thou, O Lord, hast made us? Thou, with whom being and life are one, since thou thyself art supreme being and supreme life both together. For thou art infinite, and in thee there is no change, nor an end to this present day although there is a sense in which it ends in thee, since all things are in thee, and there would be no such thing as days passing away unless thou didst sustain them. And since thy years shall have no end, thy years are an ever-present day. And how many of ours and our father's days have passed through this thy day, and received from it what measure and fashion of being they had. And all the days to come shall so receive and so pass away. But thou art the same, and all the things of tomorrow, and the days yet to come, and all of yesterday, and the days that are past, thou wilt gather into this thy day. What is it to me? If someone does not understand this, let him still rejoice and continue to ask, What is this? Let him also rejoice and prefer to seek thee, even if he fails to find an answer, rather than to seek an answer and not find thee. <laughs> Chapter 7 
Hear me, O God. Woe to the sins of men. When a man cries thus, thou showest him mercy, for thou didst create the man, but not the sin in him. Who brings to remembrance the sins of my infancy? For in thy sight there is none free from sin, not even the infant who has lived but a day upon this earth. Who brings this to my remembrance? Does not each little one, in whom I now observe what I no longer remember of myself? In what ways, in that time, did I sin? Was it that I cried for the breast? If I should now so cry, not indeed for the breast, but for food suitable to my condition, I should be most justly laughed at and rebuked. What I did then deserved rebuke, but since I could not understand those who rebuked me, neither custom nor common sense permitted me to be rebuked. As we grow, we root out and cast away from us such childish habits. Yet I have not seen any one who is wise who cast away the good when trying to purge the bad. Nor was it good, even in that time to strive to get by by crying what, if it had been given to me, would have been hurtful, or to be bitterly indignant at those who, because they were older, not slaves either but free, and wiser than I, would not indulge my capricious desires. Was it a good thing for me to try, by struggling as hard as I could, to harm them for not obeying me, even when it would have done me harm to have been obeyed? Thus, the infant's innocence lies in the weakness of his body, and not in the infant mind. I have myself observed a baby to be jealous, though it could not speak. It was livid as it watched another infant at the breast. Who is ignorant of this? Mothers and nurses tell us that they can cure these things by I know not what remedies. But is this innocence, when the fountain of milk is flowing fresh and abundant, that another who needs it should not be allowed to share it, even though he requires such nourishment to sustain his life? Yet we look leniently on such things, not because they are not faults, or even small faults, but because they will vanish as the years pass. For, although we allow for such things in an infant, the same things could not be tolerated patiently in an adult. Therefore, O Lord my God, Thou who gavest life to the infant, and a body which, as we see, Thou hast furnished with senses, shaped with limbs, beautiful with form, and endowed with all the vital energies for its well-being and health, Thou dost command me to praise Thee for these things, to give thanks unto the Lord, and to sing praise unto His name, O Most High. For Thou art God, omnipotent and good, even if Thou hast done no more than these things, which no other but Thou canst do. Thou alone, who madest all things fair, and didst order everything according to thy law. I am loath to dwell on this part of my life, of which, O oh Lord, I have no remembrance, about which I must trust the word of others, and what I can surmise from observing other infants, even if such guesses are trustworthy. For it lies in the deep murk of my forgetfulness, and thus is like the period which I passed in my mother's womb. But if I was conceived in iniquity, and in sin my mother nourished me in her womb, where I pray thee, O oh my God, where, O oh Lord, or when was I, thy servant, ever innocent? But see now, I pass over that period, 
for what have I to do with a time from which I can recall no memories? <laughs> Chapter 8 Did I not, then, as I grew out of infancy, come next to boyhood? Or rather, did it not come to me and succeed my infancy? My infancy did not go away, for where would it go? It was simply no longer present, and I was no longer an infant who could not speak, but now a chattering boy. I remember this and I have since observed how I learned to speak. My elders did not teach me words by rote, as they taught me my letters afterward. But I myself, when I was unable to communicate all I wished to say to whomever I wished by means of whimpering and grunts and various gestures of my limbs, which I used to reinforce my demands, I myself repeated the sounds already stored in my memory, by the mind which thou, O oh my God, hast given me. When they called something by name and pointed it out while they spoke, I saw it and realized that the thing they wished to indicate was called by the name they then uttered, and what they meant was made plain by the gestures of their bodies, by a kind of natural language common to all nations which expresses itself through changes of countenance, glances of the eye, gestures and intonations which indicate a disposition and attitude, either to seek or to possess, to reject or to avoid. So it was that, by frequently hearing words in different phrases, I gradually identified the objects which the words stood for, and, Having formed my mouth to repeat these signs, I was thereby able to express my will. Thus, I exchanged with those about me the verbal signs by which we express our wishes and advanced deeper into the stormy fellowship of human life, depending all the while upon the authority of my parents and the behest of my elders. <laughs> Chapter 9 Oh, my God! What miseries and mockeries did I then experience when it was impressed on me that obedience to my teachers was proper to my boyhood estate if I was to flourish in this world and distinguish myself in those tricks of speech which would gain honor for me among men and deceitful riches? To this end, I was sent to school to get learning, the value of which I knew not, wretch that I was. Yet if I was slow to learn, I was flogged, for this was deemed praiseworthy by our forefathers, and many had passed before us in the same course, and this had built up the precedent for the sorrowful road on which we too were compelled to travel. Multiplying labor and sorrow upon the sons of Adam. About this time, O Lord, I observed men praying to Thee, and I learned from them to conceive Thee. After my capacity for understanding, as it was then, to be some great being who, though not visible to our senses, was able to hear and help us. Thus, as a boy, I began to pray to Thee, my help, and my refuge, and in calling on thee, broke the bands of my tongue. Small as I was, I prayed with no slight earnestness that I might not be beaten at school. And when thou didst not heed me, for that would have been giving me over to my folly, my elders, and even my parents too, who wished me no ill, treated my stripes as a joke though they were then a great and grievous ill to me. Is there anyone, O Lord, with a spirit so great, who cleaves to thee with such steadfast affection, or is there even a kind of obtuseness that has the same effect? Is there any man who, 
by cleaving devoutly to thee, is endowed with so great a courage that he can regard indifferently those racks and hooks and other torture weapons from which men throughout the world pray so fervently to be spared. And can they scorn those who so greatly fear these torments, just as my parents were amused at the torments with which our teachers punished us boys? For we were no less afraid of our pains, nor did we beseech thee less to escape them. Yet, even so, we were sinning by writing or reading or studying less than our assigned lessons. For I did not, O Lord, lack memory or capacity, for by thy will I possessed enough for my age. However, my mind was absorbed only in play, and I was punished for this by those who were doing the same things themselves. But the idling of our elders is called business. The idling of boys, though quite like it, is punished by those same elders, and no one pities either the boys or the men. For will any common sense observer agree that I was rightly punished as a boy for playing ball? Just because this hindered me from learning more quickly those lessons by means of which, as a man, I could play at more shameful games? And did he by whom I was beaten do anything different? When he was worsted in some small controversy with a fellow teacher, he was more tormented by anger and envy than I was when beaten by a playmate in the ball game. Chapter 10 And yet I sinned, O Lord my God, Thou ruler and creator of all natural things, but of sins only the ruler. I sinned, O Lord my God, in acting against the precepts of my parents and of those teachers. For this learning, which they wished me to acquire, no matter what their motives were, I might have put to good account afterward. I disobeyed them, not because I had chosen a better way, but from a sheer love of play. I loved the vanity of victory, and I loved to have my ears tickled with lying fables, which made them itch even more ardently, and a similar curiosity glowed more and more in my eyes for the shows and sport of my elders. Yet those who put on such shows are held in such high repute that almost all desire the same for their children. They are therefore willing to have them beaten if their childhood games keep them from the studies by which their parents desire them to grow up to be able to give such shows. Look down on these things with mercy, O Lord, and deliver us who now call upon Thee. Deliver those also who do not call upon Thee, that they may call upon thee, and thou mayest deliver them. Chapter 11 Even as a boy, I had heard of eternal life promised to us through the humility of the Lord our God, who came down to visit us in our pride. And I was signed with the sign of his cross, and was seasoned with his salt even from the womb of my mother, who greatly trusted in thee. Thou didst see, O Lord, how once, while I was still a child, I was suddenly seized with stomach pains, and was at the point of death. Thou didst see, O my God, for even then thou wast my keeper. With what agitation, and with what faith I solicited from the piety of my mother, and from thy church, which is the mother of us all. The baptism of thy Christ, my Lord and my God. The mother of my flesh was much perplexed, for, with a heart pure in thy faith, 
she was always in deep travail for my eternal salvation. If I had not quickly recovered, she would have provided forthwith for my initiation and washing by thy life-giving sacraments, confessing thee, O Lord Jesus, for the forgiveness of sins. So my cleansing was deferred, as if it were inevitable that, if I should live, I would be further polluted, and further, because the guilt, contradicted by sin after baptism, would be greater and more perilous. Thus, at that time, I believed, along with my mother and the whole household, except my father, but he did not overcome the influence of my mother's piety in me, nor did he prevent my believing in Christ, although he had not yet believed in him, for it was her desire, O oh my God, that I should acknowledge thee as my father rather than him. In this thou didst aid her to overcome her husband, to whom, though his superior, she yielded obedience. In this way she also yielded obedience to thee, who dost so command. I ask thee, O oh my God, for I would gladly know, if it be thy will, to what good end my baptism was deferred at that time. Was it indeed for my good that the reins were slackened, as it were, to encourage me in sin? Or were they not slackened? If not, then why is it still dinned into our ears on all sides? Let him alone. Let him do as he pleases. For he is not yet baptized? In the matter of bodily health, no one says, Let him alone. Let him be worse wounded, for he is not yet cured. How much better, then, would it have been for me to have been cured at once? And if thereafter, through the diligent care of friends and myself, my soul's restored health had been kept safe in thy keeping, who gave it in the first place? This would have been far better in truth. But how many and great the waves of temptation which appeared to hang over me as I grew out of childhood! These were foreseen by my mother, and she preferred that the unformed clay should be risked to them, rather than the clay molded after Christ's image. Chapter 12 But in this time of childhood, which was far less dreaded for me than my adolescence, I had no love of learning and hated to be driven to it. Yet I was driven to it, just the same, and good was done for me, even though I did not do it well, for I would not have learned if I had not been forced to it. For no man does well against his will, even if what he does is a good thing. Neither did they who forced me do well, but the good that was done me came from thee, my God. For they did not care about the way in which I would use what they forced me to learn, and took it for granted that it was to satisfy the inordinate desires of a rich beggary and a shameful glory. But thou, Lord, by whom the hairs of our head are numbered, didst use for my good the error of all who pushed me on to study. But my error in not being willing to learn thou didst use for my punishment. And I, though so small a boy, yet so great a sinner, was not punished without warrant. Thus, by the instrumentality of those who did not do well, thou didst well for me. And by my own sin, thou didst justly punish me. For it is even as thou hast ordained, that every inordinate affection brings on its own punishment.
Chapter 13 But what were the causes for my strong dislike of Greek literature, which I studied from my boyhood? Even to this day, I have not fully understood them. For Latin, I loved exceedingly, not just the rudiments, but what the grammarians teach. For those beginners' lessons in reading, writing, and reckoning, I considered no less a burden and pain than Greek. Yet whence came this, unless from the sin and vanity of this life? For I was but flesh, a wind that passeth away and cometh not again. Those first lessons were better, assuredly, because they were more certain, and through them I acquired, and still retain, the power of reading what I find written, and of writing for myself what I will. In other subjects, however, I was compelled to learn about the wanderings of a certain Aeneas, oblivious of my own wanderings, and to weep for Dido dead, who slew herself for love. And all this while I bore with dry eyes my own wretched self dying to thee, O God, my life, in the midst of these things. For what can be more wretched than the wretch who has no pity upon himself, who sheds tears over Dido, dead for the love of Aeneas, but who sheds no tears for his own death in not loving thee, O God, light of my heart, and bread of the inner mouth of my soul, O power that links together my mind with my inmost thoughts. I did not love thee, and thus committed fornication against thee. Those around me, also sinning, thus cried out, Well done, well done. The friendship of this world is fornication against thee. And well done, well done, is cried, until one feels ashamed not to show himself a man in this way. For my own condition, I shed no tears, though I wept for Dido who sought death at the sword's point, while I myself was seeking the lowest rung of thy creation, having forsaken thee, earth sinking back to earth again. And, if I had been forbidden to read these poems, I would have grieved that I was not allowed to read what grieved me. This sort of madness is considered more honorable and more fruitful learning than the beginner's course in which I learned to read and write. But now, O oh my God, cry unto my soul, and let thy truth say to me, Not so, not so, that the first learning was far better. For, obviously, I would rather forget the wanderings of Aeneas and all such things than forget how to write and read. Still, over the entrance of the grammar school there hangs a veil. This is not so much the sign of a covering for a mystery as a curtain for error. Let them exclaim against me, those I no longer fear, while I confess to thee, my God, what my soul desires, and let me find some rest for in blaming my own evil ways I may come to love thy holy ways. Neither let those cry out against me who buy and sell the baubles of literature. For if I ask them if it is true, as the poet says, that Aeneas once came to Carthage, the unlearned will reply that they do not know, and the learned will deny that it's true. But if I ask with what letters the name Aeneas is written, all who have ever learned this will answer correctly, in accordance with the conventional understanding men have agreed upon as to these signs. Again, if I should ask which would cause the greatest inconvenience in our life, if it were forgotten, reading and writing, or these poetical fictions, who does not see what every one would answer who had not entirely lost his own memory? I erred, then, 
when as a boy I preferred those vain studies to these more profitable ones, or rather loved the one and hated the other. One and one are two, two and two are four. This was then a truly hateful song to me. But the wooden horse, full of its armed soldiers, and the holocaust of Troy, and the spectral image of Creusa, were all a most delightful and vain show. <laughs> Chapter 14 But why, then, did I dislike Greek learning, which was full of such tales? For Homer was skillful in inventing such poetic fictions, and is most sweetly wanton. Yet when I was a boy, he was most disagreeable to me. I believe that Virgil would have had the same effect on Greek boys as Homer did on me if they were forced to learn him. For the tedium of learning a foreign language mingled gall into the sweetness of those Grecian myths. For I did not understand a word of the language, and yet I was driven with threats and cruel punishments to learn it. There was also a time when, as an infant, I knew no Latin, but this I acquired without any fear or tormenting but merely by being alert to the blandishments of my nurses, the jests of those who smiled on me, and the sportiveness of those who toyed with me. I learned all this, indeed, without being urged by any pressure of punishment, for my own heart urged me to bring forth its own fashioning, which I could not do except by learning words, not from those who taught me, but those who talked to me, in whose ears I could pour forth whatever I could fashion. From this, it is sufficiently clear that a free curiosity is more effective in learning than a discipline based on fear. Yet, by thy ordinance, O God, discipline is given to restrain the excesses of freedom. This ranges from the ferrule of the schoolmaster, to the trials of the martyr, and has the effect of mingling for us a wholesome bitterness, which calls us back to thee from the poisonous pleasures that first drew us from thee. Chapter 15 Hear my prayer, O Lord, let not my soul faint under thy discipline, nor let me faint in confessing unto thee thy mercies, whereby thou hast saved me from all my most wicked ways, till thou shouldst become sweet to me beyond all the allurements that I used to follow. Let me come to love thee wholly, and grasp thy hand with my whole heart, that thou mayest deliver me from every temptation, even unto the last. And thus, O Lord, my King and my God, may all things useful that I learned as a boy now be offered in thy service. Let it be that for thy service I now speak and write and reckon. For when I was learning vain things, Thou didst impose thy discipline upon me, and thou hast forgiven me my sin of delighting in those vanities. In those studies I learned many a useful word, but these might have been learned in matters not so vain. And surely that is the safe way for youths to walk in. Chapter 16 But woe unto you, O torment of human custom! Who shall stay your course? When will you ever run dry? How long will you carry down the sons of Eve into that vast and hideous ocean, 
which even those who have the tree for an ark can scarcely pass over. Do I not read in you the stories of Jove the thunderer and the adulterer? How could he be both? But so it says, and the sham thunder served as a cloak for him to play at real adultery. Yet which of our gowned masters will give a tempered hearing to a man trained in their own schools, who cries out and says, These were Homer's fictions. He transfers things human to the gods. I could have wished that he would transfer divine things to us. But it would have been more true if he said, These are indeed his fictions. But he attributed divine attributes to sinful men, that crimes might not be accounted crimes, and that whoever committed such crimes might appear to imitate the celestial gods and not abandoned men. And yet, O torrent of hell, the sons of men still cast into you, and they pay fees for learning all these things. And much is made of it when this goes on in the forum under the auspices of laws, which give a salary over and above the fees. And you beat against your rocky shore and roar. Here, words may be learned. Here you can attain the eloquence which is so necessary to persuade people to your way of thinking, so helpful in unfolding your opinions. Verily, they seem to argue that we should never have understood these words, golden shower, bosom, intrigue, highest heavens, and other such words, if Terence had not introduced a good-for-nothing youth upon the stage, setting up a picture of Jove as his example of lewdness and telling the tale of Jove's descending in a golden shower into Dene's bosom with a woman to intrigue. See how he excites himself into lust, as if by a heavenly authority when he says, Great Jove, who shakes the highest heavens with his thunder, shall I, poor mortal man, not do the same? I've done it, and with all my heart I'm glad. These words are not learned one whit more easily because of this vileness, but through them the vileness is more boldly perpetrated. I do not blame the words, for they are, as it were, choice and precious vessels, but I do deplore the wine of error which was poured out to us by teachers already drunk. And unless we also drank, we were beaten, without liberty of appeal to a sober judge. And yet, O oh my God, in whose presence I can now with security recall this, I learned these things willingly and with delight, and for it I was called a boy of good promise. <laughs> Chapter 17 Bear with me, O oh my God, while I speak a little of those talents, thy gifts, and of the follies on which I wasted them. For a lesson was given me that sufficiently disturbed my soul, for in it there was both hope of praise and fear of shame or stripes. The assignment was that I should declaim the words of Juno, as she raged and sorrowed that she could not bar off Italy from all the approaches of the Teucrian king. I had learned that Juno had never uttered these words, yet we were compelled to stray in the footsteps of these poetic fictions, and to turn into prose what the poet had said in verse. In the declamation, the boy won most applause who most strikingly reproduced the passions of anger and sorrow according to the character of the persons presented, and who clothed it all in the most suitable language. 
What is it now to me, O my true life, my God, that my declaiming was applauded above that of many of my classmates and fellow students? Actually, was not all that smoke and wind? Besides, was there nothing else on which I could have exercised my wit and tongue? Thy praise, O Lord, thy praises might have propped up the tendrils of my heart by thy scriptures, and it would not have been dragged away by these empty trifles, a shameful prey to the spirits of the air. For there is more than one way in which men sacrifice to the fallen angels. Chapter 18 But it was no wonder that I was thus carried toward vanity, and was estranged from thee, O oh, my God, when men were held up as models to me who, when relating a deed of theirs, not in itself evil, were covered with confusion if found guilty of a barbarism or solecism. But who could tell of their own licentiousness and be applauded for it, so long as they did it in a full and ornate oration of well-chosen words? Thou seest all this, O Lord, and dost keep silence, long-suffering and plenteous in mercy and truth as thou art. Wilt thou keep silence forever? Even now. Thou drawest from that vast deep the soul that seeks thee, and thirsts after thy delight, whose heart said unto thee, I have sought thy face, thy face, Lord, will I seek. For I was far from thy face in the dark shadows of passion. For it is not by our feet, nor by change of place, that we either turn from thee or return to thee. That younger son did not charter horses, or chariots, or ships, or fly away on visible wings, or journey by walking, so that in the far country he might prodigally waste all that thou didst give him when he set out. A kind father when thou gavest, and kinder still when he returned destitute. To be wanton, that is to say, to be darkened in heart. This is to be far from thy face. Look down, O Lord God, and see patiently, as thou art wont to do, how diligently the sons of men observe the conventional rules of letters and syllables, taught them by those who learned their letters beforehand, while they neglect the eternal rules of everlasting salvation taught by thee. They carry it so far that if he who practices or teaches the established rules of pronunciation should speak, contrary to grammatical usage, without aspirating the first syllable of hominem, he will offend men more than if he, a human being, were to hate another human being contrary to thy commandments. It is as if he should feel that there is an enemy who could be more destructive to himself than that hatred which excites him against his fellow man, or that he could destroy him whom he hates more completely than he destroys his own soul by this same hatred. Now, obviously, there is no knowledge of letters more innate than the writing of conscience against doing unto another what one would not have done to himself. How mysterious thou art, who dwellest on high in silence! O thou, the only great God, who, by an unwearied law, hurlest down the penalty of blindness to unlawful desire, when a man, seeking the reputation of eloquence, stands before a human judge, while a thronging multitude surrounds him and inveighs against his enemy with the most fierce hatred. 
he takes most vigilant heed that his tongue does not slip in a grammatical error, for example, and say, interhominibus, instead of interhominus. But he takes no heed lest, in the fury of his spirit, he cut off a man from his fellow men. These were the customs in the midst of which I was cast, an unhappy boy. This was the wrestling arena in which I was more fearful of perpetrating a barbarism than, having done so, of envying those who had not. These things I declare and confess to thee, my God. I was applauded by those whom I then thought it was my whole duty to please, for I did not perceive the gulf of infamy wherein I was cast away from thy eyes. For in thy eyes, what was more infamous than I was already, since I displeased even my own kind and deceived with endless lies my tutor, my masters, and parents, all from a love of play, a craving for frivolous spectacles, a stage-struck restlessness to imitate what I saw in these shows. I pilfered from my parents' cellar and table, sometimes driven by gluttony, sometimes just to have something to give to other boys in exchange for their baubles, which they were prepared to sell, even though they liked them as well as I. Moreover, in this kind of play, I often sought dishonest victories, being myself conquered by the vain desire for preeminence. And what was I so unwilling to endure? And what was it that I censured so violently when I caught anyone, except the very things I did to others? And, when I was myself detected and censored, I preferred to quarrel rather than to yield. Is this the innocence of childhood? It is not, O oh Lord, it is not. I entreat thy mercy, O oh my God, for these same sins, as we grow older, are transferred from tutors and masters. They pass from nuts and balls and sparrows to magistrates and kings, to gold and lands and slaves, just as the rod is succeeded by more severe chastisements. It was, then, the fact of humility in childhood that thou, O oh, our king, didst approve as a symbol of humility when thou saidst, Of such is the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> Chapter 19 However, O Lord, to thee most excellent and most good, thou architect and governor of the universe, thanks would be due thee, O our God, even if thou hadst not willed that I should survive my boyhood. For I existed even then, I lived and felt and was solicitous about my own well-being, a trace of that most mysterious unity from whence I had my being. I kept watch by my inner sense over the integrity of my outer senses, and even in these trifles, and also in my thoughts about trifles, I learned to take pleasure in truth. I was averse to being deceived. I had a vigorous memory. I was gifted with the power of speech, was softened by friendship, shunned sorrow, meanness, ignorance. Is not such an animated creature as this wonderful and praiseworthy? But all these are gifts of my God. I did not give them to myself. Moreover, they are good, and they all together constitute myself. Good, then, is he that made me, and he is my God, and before him will I rejoice exceedingly for every good gift which, even as a boy, I had. 
but herein lay my sin, that it was not in him, but in his creatures, myself and the rest, that I sought for pleasures, honors, and truths. And I fell thereby into sorrows, troubles, and errors. Thanks be to thee, my joy, my pride, my confidence, my God. Thanks be to thee for thy gifts. But do thou preserve them in me? For thus wilt thou preserve me, and those things which thou hast given me shall be developed and perfected. And I myself shall be with thee, for from thee is my being. This audio recording is copyrighted 2007 Christian Classics Ethereal Library at Calvin College. All rights reserved. The Christian Classics Ethereal Library is a non-profit digital library of classic Christian literature. Please visit us at www.ccel.org. The cellist, Peter Plantinga, is currently a high school student. When he was young, he and his sister were the source of inspiration for the CCEL. You can read more about this online at ccel.org by clicking the About tab. From the Christian Classics Ethereal Library, on the web at www.ccel.org. Confessions of Augustine, newly translated and edited by Albert C. Outler. Ph.D. D.D. Book Two He concentrates here on his sixteenth year, a year of idleness, lust, and adolescent mischief. The memory of stealing some pears prompts a deep probing of the motives and aims of sinful acts. I became to myself a wasteland. <laughs> Chapter 1 I wish now to review in memory my past wickedness and the carnal corruptions of my soul, not because I still love them, but that I may love thee, O oh my God. For love of thy love I do this, recalling in the bitterness of self-examination my wicked ways, that thou mayest grow sweet to me, thou sweetness without deception, thou sweetness happy and assured. Thus thou mayest gather me up out of those fragments in which I was torn to pieces while I turned away from thee. O unity, and lost myself among the many, for as I became a youth, I longed to be satisfied with worldly things, and I dared to grow wild in a succession of various and shadowy loves. My form wasted away, and I became corrupt in thy eyes. Yet I was still pleasing to my own eyes, and eager to please the eyes of men. Chapter 2 But what was it that delighted me, save to love and to be loved? Still I did not keep the moderate way of the love of mind to mind, the bright path of friendship. Instead, the mists of passion steamed up out of the puddly concupiscence of the flesh, and the hot imagination of puberty, and they so obscured and overcast my heart that I was unable to distinguish pure affection from unholy desire. Both boiled confusedly within me, and dragged my unstable youth down over the cliffs of unchaste desires, and plunged me into a gulf of infamy. Thy anger had come upon me, and I knew it not. I had been deafened by the clanking of the chains of my mortality, the punishment for my soul's pride, and I wandered farther from thee, and thou didst permit me to do so. 
I was tossed to and fro, and wasted and poured out, and I boiled over in my fornications. And yet thou didst hold thy peace, O oh, my tardy joy, thou didst still hold thy peace, and I wandered still farther from thee into more and yet more barren fields of sorrow, in proud dejection and restless lassitude. If only there had been someone to regulate my disorder and turn to my profit the fleeting beauties of the things around me, and to fix a bound to their sweetness, so that the tides of my youth might have spent themselves among the shore of marriage, then they might have been tranquilized and satisfied with having children, as thy law prescribes, O Lord. O thou who dost form the offspring of our death, and art able also with a tender hand to blunt the thorns which are excluded from thy paradise. For thy omnipotence is not far from us, even when we are far from thee. Now, on the other hand, I might have given more vigilant heed to the voice from the clouds. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh, but I spare you, and... It is good for a man not to touch a woman. And he that is unmarried cares for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he that is married cares for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. I should have listened more attentively to these words, and thus, having been made a eunuch for the kingdom of heaven's sake, I would have with greater happiness expected thy embraces. But fool that I was, I foamed in my wickedness as the sea, and forsaking thee, followed the rushing of my own tide, and burst out of all thy bounds. But I did not escape thy scourges. For what mortal can do so? Thou wast always by me, mercifully angry, and favoring all my unlawful pleasures with bitter discontent, in order that I might seek pleasures free from discontent. But where could I find such pleasure save in Thee, O Lord, save in Thee, who dost teach us by sorrow, who woundest us to heal us, and dost kill us, that we may not die apart from Thee? Where was I, and how far was I exiled from the delights of thy house in that sixteenth year of the age of my flesh, when the madness of lust held full sway in me? That madness which grants indulgence to human shamelessness, even though it is forbidden by thy laws, and I gave myself entirely to it. Meanwhile, my family took no care to save me from ruin by marriage, for their sole care was that I should learn how to make a powerful speech and become a persuasive orator. Chapter 3 Now, in that year my studies were interrupted. I had come back from Madaura, a neighboring city where I had gone to study grammar and rhetoric, and the money for a further term at Carthage was being got together for me. This project was more a matter of my father's ambition than of his means, for he was only a poor citizen of Tagaste. To whom am I narrating all this? Not to thee, O oh, my God but to my own kind in thy presence, to that small part of the human race who may chance to come upon these writings. And to what end? That I and all who read them may understand what depths there are from which we are to cry unto thee. For what is more surely heard in thy ear than a confessing heart and a faithful life? Who did not extol and praise my father 
because he went quite beyond his means to supply his son with the necessary expenses for a far journey in the interest of his education. For many far richer citizens did not do so much for their children. Still, this same father troubled himself not at all as to how I was progressing toward thee, nor how chaste I was, just so long as I was skillful in speaking, no matter how barren I was to thy tillage, O God, who art the one true and good Lord of my heart, which is thy field. During that sixteenth year of my age, I lived with my parents, having a holiday from school for a time. This idleness imposed upon me by my parents' straitened finances. The thorn bushes of lust grew rank about my head, and there was no hand to root them out. Indeed, when my father saw me one day at the baths, and perceived that I was becoming a man, and was showing the signs of adolescence, he joyfully told my mother about it, as if already looking forward to grandchildren, rejoicing in that sort of inebriation in which the world so often forgets thee, its creator, and falls in love with thy creature instead of thee. The inebriation of that invisible wine, of a perverted will which turns and bows down to infamy, but in my mother's breast thou hadst already begun to build thy temple and the foundation of thy holy habitation. Whereas my father was only a catechumen, and that but recently. She was, therefore, startled with a holy fear and trembling. For though I had not yet been baptized, she feared those crooked ways in which they walk who turn their backs to thee and not their faces. Woe is to me! Do I dare affirm that thou didst hold thy peace, O oh, my God, while I wandered farther away from thee? Didst thou really then hold thy peace? Then whose words were they but thine, which by my mother, thy faithful handmaid, thou didst pour into my ears? None of them, however, sank into my heart to make me do anything. She deplored and, as I remember, warned me privately, with great solicitude, not to commit fornication, but above all things never to defile another man's wife. These appeared to me but womanish counsels, which I would have blushed to obey. Yet they were from thee, and I knew it not. I thought that thou wast silent, and that it was only she who spoke. Yet it was through her that thou didst not keep silence toward me, and in rejecting her counsel, I was rejecting thee, I, her son, the son of thy handmaid, thy servant. But I did not realize this, and rushed on headlong with such blindness that, among my friends, I was ashamed to be less shameless than they, when I heard them boasting of their disgraceful exploits, yes, and glorifying all the more the worse their baseness was. What is worse, I took pleasure in such exploits, not for the pleasure's sake only, but mostly for praise. What is worthy of vituperation except vice itself? Yet I made myself out worse than I was, in order that I might not go lacking for praise. And when in anything I had not sinned as the worst ones in the group, I would still say that I had done what I had not done, in order not to appear contemptible because I was more innocent than they, and not to drop in their esteem because I was more chaste. Behold with what companions I walked the streets of Babylon. I rolled in its mire and lolled about on it, as if on a bed of spices and precious ointments. And, drawing me more closely to the very center of that city, 
my invisible enemy trod me down and seduced me, for I was easy to seduce. My mother had already fled out of the midst of Babylon and was progressing, albeit slowly, toward its outskirts. For in counseling me to chastity, she did not bear in mind what her husband had told her about me, and although she knew that my passions were destructive even then and dangerous for the future, she did not think they should be restrained by the bonds of conjugal affection, if, indeed, they could not be cut away to the quick. She took no heed of this, for she was afraid lest a wife should prove a hindrance and a burden to my hopes. These were not her hopes of the world to come, which my mother had in thee, but the hope of learning, which both my parents were too anxious that I should acquire, my father, because he had little or no thought of thee, and only vain thoughts for me. My mother, because she thought that the usual course of study would not only be no hindrance, but actually a furtherance toward my eventual return to thee. This much I conjecture, recalling as well as I can the temperance of my parents. Meantime, the reins of discipline were slackened on me, so that without the restraint of due severity, I might play at whatsoever I fancied, even to the point of dissoluteness. And in all this, there was that mist which shut out from my sight the brightness of thy truth, O oh, my God, and my iniquity bulged out, as it were, with fatness. <laughs> Chapter 4 Theft is punished by thy law, O Lord, and by the law written in men's hearts, which not even ingrained wickedness can erase. For what thief will tolerate another thief stealing from him? Even a rich thief will not tolerate a poor thief who is driven to theft by want. Yet I had a desire to commit robbery, and did so, compelled to it by neither hunger nor poverty, but through a contempt for well-doing and a strong impulse to iniquity. For I pilfered something which I already had in sufficient measure, and of much better quality. I did not desire to enjoy what I stole, but only the theft and the sin itself. There was a pear tree close to our own vineyard, heavily laden with fruit, which was not tempting either for its color or for its flavor. Late, one night, having prolonged our games in the streets until then, as our bad habit was, a group of young scoundrels, and I among them, went to shake and rob this tree. We carried off a huge load of pears, not to eat ourselves, but to dump out to the hogs, after barely tasting some of them ourselves. Doing this pleased us all the more because it was forbidden. Such was my heart, O God, such was my heart, which thou didst pity, even in that bottomless pit. Behold, now let my heart confess to thee what it was seeking there, when I was being gratuitously wanton, having no inducement to evil, but the evil itself. It was foul, and I loved it. I loved my own undoing. I loved my error. Not that for which I erred, but the error itself. A depraved soul, falling away from the security in thee to destruction in itself seeking nothing from the shameful deed, but shame itself. Chapter 5 Now there is a comeliness in all beautiful bodies, and in gold, 
and silver and all things. The sense of touch has its own power to please, and the other senses find their proper objects in physical sensation. Worldly honor also has its own glory, and so do the powers to command and to overcome. And from these there springs up the desire for revenge. Yet, in seeking these pleasures, we must not depart from thee, O Lord, nor deviate from thy law. The life which we live here has its own peculiar attractiveness, because it has a certain measure of comeliness of its own and a harmony with all these inferior values. The bond of human friendship has a sweetness of its own, binding many souls together as one. Yet, because of these values, sin is committed, because we have an inordinate preference for these goods of a lower order and neglect the better and higher good, neglecting Thee, O oh, our Lord God, and Thy truth and Thy law. For these inferior values have their delights, but not at all equal to my God, who hath made them all. For in him do the righteous delight, and he is the sweetness of the upright in heart. When, therefore, we inquire why a crime was committed, we do not accept the explanation unless it appears that there was the desire to obtain some of those values, which we designate inferior, or else a fear of losing them. For truly, they are beautiful and comely, though in comparison with the superior and celestial goods, they are abject and contemptible. A man has murdered another man, what was his motive? Either he desired his wife, or his property, or else he would steal to support himself, or else he was afraid of losing something to him, or else, having been injured, he was burning to be revenged. Would a man commit murder without a motive, taking delight simply in the act of murder? Who would believe such a thing, even for that savage and brutal man, of whom it was said that he was gratuitously wicked and cruel? There is still a motive assigned to his deeds. Lest through idleness, he says, hand or heart should grow inactive. And to what purpose? Why, even this, that, Having once got possession of the city through his practice of his wicked ways, he might gain honors, empire, and wealth, and thus be exempt from the fear of the laws and from financial difficulties in supplying the needs of his family, and from the consciousness of his own wickedness. So it seems that even Catline himself loved not his own villainies, but something else, and it was this that gave him the motive for his crimes. Chapter 6 What was it in you, O theft of mine, that I, poor wretch, doted on you, you deed of darkness, in that sixteenth year of my age. Beautiful you were not, for you were a theft. But are you anything at all, so that I could analyze the case with you? Those pears that we stole were fair to the sight, because they were thy creation, O beauty beyond compare, O creator of all. O thou good God, God the highest good and my true good, those pears were truly pleasant to the sight, but it was not for them that my miserable soul lusted, for I had an abundance of better pears. I stole those simply that I might steal, for, 
Having stolen them, I threw them away. My sole gratification in them was my own sin, which I was pleased to enjoy. For if any one of these pears entered my mouth, the only good flavor it had was my sin in eating it. And now, O Lord my God, I ask what it was in that theft of mine that caused me such delight. For behold, it had no beauty of its own, certainly not the sort of beauty that exists in justice and wisdom, nor such as is in the mind, memory senses, and the animal life of man, nor yet the kind that is the glory and beauty of the stars in their courses, nor the beauty of the earth or the sea, teeming with spawning life, replacing in birth that which dies and decays. Indeed, it did not have that false and shadowy beauty which attends the deceptions of vice. For thus we see pride wearing the mask of high-spiritedness, although only thou, O God, art high above all. Ambition seeks honor and glory, whereas only thou shouldst be honored above all and glorified forever. The powerful man seeks to be feared because of his cruelty, but who ought really to be feared but God only? What can be forced away or withdrawn out of his power, when or where or whither or by whom? The enticements of the wanton claim the name of love, and yet nothing is more enticing than thy love, nor is anything loved more healthfully than thy truth, bright and beautiful above all. Curiosity prompts a desire for knowledge, whereas it is only thou who knowest all things supremely. Indeed, ignorance and foolishness themselves go masked under the names of simplicity and innocence. Yet there is no being that has true simplicity like thine, and none is innocent as thou art. Thus it is that by a sinner's own deeds he is himself harmed. Human sloth pretends to long for rest, but what sure rest is there save in the Lord? Luxury would fain be called plenty and abundance, but thou art the fullness and unfailing abundance of unfading joy. Prodigality presents a show of liberality, but thou art the most lavish giver of all good things. Covetousness desires to possess much, but thou art already the possessor of all things. Envy contends that its aim is for excellence, but what is so excellent as thou? Anger seeks revenge, but who avenges more justly than thou? Fear recoils at the unfamiliar and the sudden changes which threaten things beloved, and is wary for its own security. But what can happen that is unfamiliar or sudden to thee? Who can deprive thee of what thou lovest? Where, really, is there unshaken security save with thee? Grief languishes for things lost in which desire had taken delight, because it wills to have nothing taken from it, just as nothing can be taken from thee. Thus the soul commits fornication when she is turned from thee, and seeks apart from thee what she cannot find pure and untainted till she returns to thee. All things thus imitate thee, but pervertedly, when they separate themselves far from thee and raise themselves up against thee. But even in this act of perverse imitation, they acknowledge thee, to be the creator of all nature, and recognize that there is no place whither they can altogether separate themselves from thee. What was it, then, that I loved in that theft? 
and wherein was I imitating my Lord? Even in a corrupted and perverted way. Did I wish, if only by gesture, to rebel against thy law, even though I had no power to do so actually, so that, even as a captive, I might produce a sort of counterfeit liberty, by doing so with impunity, deeds that were forbidden in a deluded sense of omnipotence? Behold, this servant of thine, fleeing from his lord and following a shadow, O oh, rottenness, O oh, monstrousness of life and abyss of death, could I find pleasure only in what was unlawful, and only because it was unlawful. Chapter 7 What shall I render unto the Lord, for the fact that while my memory recalls these things, my soul no longer fears them. I will love thee, O Lord, and thank thee, and confess to thy name, because thou hast put away from me such wicked and evil deeds. To thy grace I attribute it, and to thy mercy that thou hast melted away my sin as if it were ice. To thy grace also, I attribute whatsoever of evil I did not commit. For what might I not have done, loving sin as I did, just for the sake of sinning? Yea, all the sins that I confess now to have been forgiven me, both those which I committed willfully and those which, by thy providence, I did not commit. What man is there who, when reflecting upon his own infirmity, dares to ascribe his chastity and innocence to his own powers, so that he should love thee less, as if he were in less need of thy mercy, in which thou forgivest the transgressions of those that return to thee? As for that man who, when called by thee, obeyed thy voice, and shunned those things which he here reads of me as I recall, and confess them of myself. Let him not despise me, for I, who was sick, have been healed by the same physician by whose aid it was that he did not fall sick. For I, who was sick, have been healed by the same physician by whose aid it was that he did not fall sick, or rather was less sick than I. And for this, let him love thee just as much, indeed all the more, since he sees me restored from such a great weakness of sin by the self-same Savior, by whom he sees himself preserved from such a weakness. Chapter 8 What profit did I, a wretched one, receive from those things which, when I remember them now, cause me shame, above all, from that theft which I loved only for the theft's sake? And as the theft itself was nothing, I was all the more wretched in that I loved it so. Yet by myself alone I would not have done it, I still recall how I felt about this then. I could not have done it alone. I loved it then because of the companionship of my accomplices with whom I did it. I did not, therefore, love the theft alone. Yet, indeed, it was only the theft that I loved, for the companionship was nothing. What is this paradox? Who is it that can explain it to me but God? who illuminates my heart and searches out the dark corners thereof. What is it that has prompted my mind to inquire about it, to discuss and to reflect upon all this? For had I at that time loved the pears that I stole and wished to enjoy them, I might have done so alone, if I could have been satisfied with the mere act of theft 
by which my pleasure was served. Nor did I need to have that itching of my own passions, inflamed by the encouragement of my accomplices. But since the pleasure I got was not from the pears, it was in the crime itself, enhanced by the companionship of my fellow sinners. <laughs> Chapter 9 By what passion, then, was I animated? It was undoubtedly depraved and a great misfortune for me to feel it. But still, what was it? Who can understand his errors? We laughed because our hearts were tickled at the thought of deceiving the owners, who had no idea of what we were doing, and would have strenuously objected. Yet again, why did I find such delight in doing this, which I would not have done alone? Is it that no one readily laughs alone? No one does so readily, but still sometimes, when men are by themselves and no one else is about, a fit of laughter will overcome them when something very droll presents itself to their sense or mind. Yet alone, I would not have done it. Alone, I could not have done it at all. Behold, my God, the lively review of my soul's career is laid bare before thee. I would not have committed that theft alone. My pleasure in it was not what I stole, but rather the act of stealing. Nor would I have enjoyed doing it alone. Indeed, I would not have done it. O oh, friendship, all unfriendly, you strange seducer of the soul, who hungers for mischief from impulses of mirth and wantonness, who craves another's loss without any desire for one's own profit or revenge, so that when they say, Let's go, let's do it, we are ashamed not to be shameless. Chapter 10 Who can unravel such a twisted and tangled naughtiness? It is unclean. I hate to reflect upon it. I hate to look on it. But I do long for thee. O oh, righteousness and innocence, so beautiful and comely to all the virtuous eyes. I long for thee with an insatiable satiety. With thee is perfect rest and life unchanging. He who enters into thee enters into the joy of his Lord and shall have no fear and shall achieve excellence in the excellent. I fell away from thee, O oh my God, and in my youth I wandered too far from thee, my true support, and I became to myself a wasteland. This audio recording is copyrighted 2007 Christian Classics Ethereal Library at Calvin College. All rights reserved. The Christian Classics Ethereal Library is a non-profit digital library of classic Christian literature. Please visit us at www.ccel.org. The cellist, Peter Plantinga, is currently a high school student. When he was young, he and his sister were the source of inspiration for the CCEL. You can read more about this online at ccel.org by clicking the About tab. From the Christian Classics Ethereal Library, on the web at www.ccel.org. Confessions of Augustine, newly translated and edited by 
Albert C. Outlook, Ph.D., D.D. Book Three The Story of His Student Days in Carthage His Discovery of Cicero's Hortensius The Enkindling of His Philosophical Interest His Infatuation with the Manichaean Heresy and His Mother's Dream which foretold his eventual return to the true faith and to God. Chapter 1 I came to Carthage, where a cauldron of unholy loves was seething and bubbling all around me. I was not in love as yet, but I was in love with love, and... From a hidden hunger, I hated myself for not feeling more intensely a sense of hunger. I was looking for something to love, for I was in love with loving, and I hated security and a smooth way, free from snares. Within me, I had a dearth of that inner food which is thyself, my God. Although that dearth caused me no hunger, and I remained without any appetite for incorruptible food, not because I was already filled with it, but because the emptier I became, the more I loathed it. Because of this, my soul was unhealthy and full of sores. It exuded itself forth, itching to be scratched by scraping on the things of the senses. Yet, had these things no soul they would certainly not inspire our love. To love and to be loved was sweet to me, and all the more when I gained the enjoyment of the body of the person I loved. Thus I polluted the spring of friendship with the filth of concupiscence, and I dimmed its luster with the slime of lust. Yet foul and unclean as I was, I still craved in excessive vanity, to be thought elegant and urbane. And I did fall precipitately into the love I was longing for. My God, my mercy, with how much bitterness didst thou, out of thy infinite goodness, flavor that sweetness for me. For I was not only beloved, but also I secretly reached the climax of enjoyment, and yet I was joyfully bound with troublesome ticks, so that I could be scourged with the burning iron rods of jealousy, suspicion, fear, anger, and strife. Chapter 2 Stage plays also captivated me, with their sights full of the images of my own miseries, fuel for my own fire. Now, why does a man like to be made sad by viewing doleful and tragic scenes, which he himself could not by any means endure? Yet, as a spectator, he wishes to experience from them a sense of grief, and in this very sense of grief his pleasure consists. What is this but wretched madness? For a man is more affected by these actions the more he is spuriously involved in these affections. Now, if he should suffer them in his own person, it is the custom to call this misery. But when he suffers with another, then it is called compassion. But what kind of compassion is it that arises from viewing fictitious and unreal sufferings? The spectator is not expected to aid the sufferer, but merely to grieve for him. And the more he grieves, the more he applauds the actor of these fictions. If the misfortunes of the characters, whether historical or entirely imaginary, are represented so as not to touch the feelings of the spectator, he goes away disgusted and complaining. But if his feelings are deeply touched, he sits it out attentively and sheds tears of joy. 
tears and sorrow, then, are loved. Surely every man desires to be joyful, and though no one is willingly miserable, one may, nevertheless, be pleased to be merciful, so that we love their sorrows, because without them we should have nothing to pity. This also springs from that same vein of friendship. But whither does it go? Whither does it flow? Why does it run into that torrent of pitch, which seeds forth those huge tides of loathsome lusts in which it is changed and altered past recognition, being diverted and corrupted from its celestial purity by its own will? Shall then compassion be repudiated? By no means. Let us. However, love the sorrows of others. But let us beware of uncleanness. O、oh, my soul, under the protection of my God, the God of our fathers, who is to be praised and exalted, let us beware of uncleanness. I have not yet ceased to have compassion, but in those days in the theaters. I sympathized with lovers when they sinfully enjoyed one another, although this was done fictitiously in the play. And when they lost one another, I grieved with them, as if pitying them, and yet had delight in both grief and pity. Nowadays, I feel much more pity for one who delights in his wickedness, than for one who counts himself unfortunate because he fails to obtain some harmful pleasure. Or suffers the loss of some miserable felicity. This surely is the truer compassion. But the sorrow I feel in it has no delight for me, for although he that grieves with the unhappy should be commended for his work of love, yet he who has the power of real compassion would still prefer that there be nothing for him to grieve about. For if good will were to be ill will, which it cannot be, only then could he who is truly and sincerely compassionate wish that there were some unhappy people, so that he might commiserate them. Some grief may then be justified, but none of it loved. Thus, it is that thou dost act. O Lord God, for Thou lovest souls far more purely than we do, and art more incorruptibly compassionate, although Thou art never wounded by any sorrow. Now who is sufficient for these things? But at that time, in my wretchedness, I loved to grieve, and I sought for things to grieve about. In another man's misery. Even though it was feigned and impersonated on the stage, that performance of the actor pleased me best and attracted me most powerfully, which moved me to tears. What marvel then was it that an unhappy sheep, straying from thy flock, and impatient of thy care, I became infected with a foul disease? This is the reason for my love of griefs. That they would not probe into me too deeply, for I did not love to suffer in myself such things as I love to look at, and they were the sort of grief which came from hearing those fictions, which affected only the surface of my emotion. Still, just as if they had been poisoned fingernails, their scratching was followed by inflammation, swelling. Putrefaction and corruption. Such was my life. But was it life? Oh, my God! Chapter three. And still thy faithful mercy hovered over me from afar. In what unseemly iniquities did I wear myself out? Following a sacrilegious curiosity, which, having deserted thee, then began to drag me down into the treacherous abyss, 
into the beguiling obedience of devils, to whom I made offerings of my wicked deeds. And still, in all this, thou didst not fail to scourge me. I dared, even while thy solemn rites were being celebrated inside the walls of thy church, to desire and to plan a project which merited death as its fruit. For this thou didst chastise me with grievous punishments, but nothing in comparison with my fault. O thou my greatest mercy, my God, my refuge from those terrible dangers in which I wandered with stiff neck, receding farther from thee, loving my own ways and not thine, loving a vagrant liberty. Those studies I was then pursuing, generally accounted as respectable, were aimed at distinction in the courts of law, to excel in which, the more crafty I was, the more I should be praised. Such is the blindness of men, that they even glory in their blindness. And by this time I had become a master in the school of rhetoric, and I rejoiced proudly in this honor, and became inflated with arrogance. Still, I was relatively sedate, O Lord, as thou knowest, and had no share in the wreckings of the wreckers, for this stupid and diabolical name was regarded as the very badge of gallantry, among whom I lived with a sort of ashamed embarrassment that I was not even as they were. But I lived with them, and at times I was delighted with their friendship, even when I abhorred their acts, that is, their wrecking, in which they insolently attacked the modesty of strangers, tormenting them by uncalled-for jeers, gratifying their mischievous mirth. Nothing could more nearly resemble the actions of devils than these fellows. By what name, therefore, could they be more aptly called than wreckers, being themselves wrecked first, and altogether turned upside down. They were secretly mocked at and seduced by the deceiving spirits in the very acts by which they amused themselves in jeering and horseplay at the expense of others. <laughs> Chapter 4 Among such as these, in that unstable period of my life, I studied the books of eloquence, for it was in eloquence that I was eager to be eminent, though from a reprehensible and vainglorious motive, and a delight in human vanity. In the ordinary course of study, I came upon a certain book of Cicero's, whose language almost all admire, though not his heart. This particular book of his contains an exhortation to philosophy, and was called Hortensius. Now it was this book which quite definitely changed my whole attitude and turned my prayers toward Thee, O Lord, and gave me new hope and new desires. Suddenly, Every vain hope became worthless to me, and with an incredible warmth of heart I yearned for an immortality of wisdom, and began now to arise that I might return to thee. It was not to sharpen my tongue further that I made use of that book. I was now nineteen. My father had been dead two years, and my mother was providing the money for my study of rhetoric. What won me in it? was not its style, but its substance. How ardent was I then, my God! How ardent to fly from earthly things to Thee! Nor did I know how Thou wast even then dealing with me. For with Thee is wisdom. In Greek, the love of wisdom is called philosophy. And it was with this love that that book inflamed me. There are some who seduce through philosophy, under a great, alluring, and honorable name, using it to color and adorn their own errors. And almost all who did this 
in Cicero's own time and earlier, are censored and pointed out in his book. In it, there is also manifest that most salutary admonition of thy spirit, spoken by thy good and pious servant. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him all the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily. Since at that time, as thou knowest, O light of my heart, the words of the apostle were unknown to me. I was delighted with Cicero's exhortation, at least enough so that I was stimulated by it, and enkindled and inflamed to love, to seek, to obtain, to hold, and to embrace, not this or that sect, but wisdom itself, wherever it might be. Only this checked my ardor, that the name of Christ was not in it. For this name, by thy mercy, O Lord, this name of my Savior, thy Son, my tender heart has piously drunk in, deeply treasured even with my mother's milk, and whatsoever was lacking that name, no matter how erudite, polished, and truthful, did not quite take complete hold of me. Chapter 5 I resolved, therefore, to direct my mind to the Holy Scriptures, that I might see what they were. And behold, I saw something not comprehended by the proud, not disclosed to children, something lowly in the hearing, but sublime in the doing, and veiled in mysteries. Yet I was not of the number of those who could enter into it, or bend my neck to follow its steps. For then... It was quite different from what I now feel. When I turned toward the scriptures, they appeared to me to be quite unworthy to be compared with the dignity of Thule, for my inflated pride was repelled by their style, nor could the sharpness of my wit penetrate their inner meaning. Truly, they were of a sort to aid the growth of little ones, but I scorned to be a little one, and swollen with pride, I looked upon myself as fully grown. Chapter 6 Thus I fell among men, delirious in their pride, carnal and voluble, whose mouths were the snares of the devil, a trap made out of a mixture of the syllables of thy name, and the names of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the Paraclete. These names were never out of their mouths, but only a sound and the clatter of tongues, for their heart was empty of truth. Still they cried, Truth, Truth, and were forever speaking the word to me. But the thing itself was not in them. Indeed, they spoke falsely, not only of thee, who truly art the truth, but also about the basic elements of this world, thy creation. And indeed, I should have passed by the philosophers themselves, even when they were speaking truth concerning thy creatures, for the sake of thy love, O highest good, and my Father, O beauty of all things beautiful. O truth, truth, how inwardly even then did the marrow of my soul sigh for thee when, frequently and in manifold ways, in numerous and vast books, sounded out thy name, though it was only a sound. And in these dishes, while I starved for thee, they served up to me, in thy stead, the sun and moon thy beauteous works. But still... Only thy works and not thyself. Indeed, not even thy first work. 
for thy spiritual works came before these material creations, celestial and shining though they are. But I was hungering and thirsting, not even after those first works of thine, but after thyself, the truth, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Yet they still served me glowing fantasies in those dishes, and truly, it would have been better to have loved this very sun, which at least is true to our sight, than those illusions of theirs which deceive the mind through the eye. And yet, because I supposed the illusions to be from thee, I fed on them, not with avidity, for thou didst not taste in my mouth as thou art, and thou wast not these empty fictions. Neither was I nourished by them, but was instead exhausted. Food in dreams appears like our food awake, yet the sleepers are not nourished by it, for they are asleep. But the fantasies of the Manichaeans were not in any way like thee as thou hast spoken to me now. They were simply fantastic and false. In comparison to them, the actual bodies which we see with our fleshly sight, both celestial and terrestrial, are far more certain. These true bodies, even the beasts and birds perceive as well as we do, and they are more certain than the images we form about them. And again, we do with more certainty form our conceptions about them than from them. We go on by means of them to imagine of other greater and infinite bodies which have no existence. With such empty husks was I then fed, and yet was not fed. But thou, my love, for whom I longed in order that I might be strong, neither art those bodies that we see in heaven, nor art thou those which we do not see there. For thou hast created them all, and yet thou reckonest them not among thy greatest works. How far, then, Art thou from those fantasies of mine, fantasies of bodies which have no real being at all? The images of those bodies which actually exist are far more certain than these fantasies. The bodies themselves are more certain than the images. Yet even these thou art not. Thou art not even the soul, which is the life of bodies, and clearly... The life of the body is better than the body itself. But thou art the life of souls, life of lives, having life in thyself and never changing, O life of my soul. Where then wast thou, and how far from me? Far, indeed, was I wandering away from thee, being barred even from the husks of those swine whom I fed with husks. For how much better were the fables of the grammarians and poets than these snares of the Manichaeans? For verses and poems and the flying Medea are still more profitable, truly, than these men's five elements, with their various colors, answering to the five caves of darkness, none of which exist, and yet in which they slay the one who believes in them. For verses... In poems I can turn into food for the mind. For though I sang about the flying Medea, I never believed it. But those other things, the fantasies of the Manichaeans, I did believe. Woe, woe, by what steps I was dragged down to the depths of hell, toiling and fuming because of my lack of the truth, even when I was seeking after thee, my God. To thee I now confess it, for thou didst have mercy on me when I had not yet confessed it. I sought after thee, but not according to the understanding of the mind, by means of which thou hast willed that I should excel the beasts, but only after the guidance of my physical senses. Thou wast more inward to me than the most inward part of me, 
and higher than my highest reach. I came upon that brazen woman, devoid of prudence, who, in Solomon's obscure parable, sits at the door of the house on a seat and says, Stolen waters are sweet, and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. This woman seduced me, because she found my soul outside its own door, dwelling on the sensations of my flesh, and ruminating on such food as I had swallowed through these physical senses. <laughs> Chapter 7 For I was ignorant of that other reality, true being. And so it was that I subtly persuaded to agree with these foolish deceivers when they put their questions to me. Whence comes evil, and is God limited by a bodily shape, and has he hairs and nails? And are those patriarchs to be esteemed righteous who had many wives at one time, and who killed men and who sacrificed living creatures? In my ignorance, I was much disturbed over these things, and though I was retreating from the truth, I appeared to myself to be going toward it, because I did not yet know that evil was nothing but a privation of good, that indeed it has no being. And how should I have seen this, when the sight of my eyes went no farther than physical objects, and the sight of my mind reached no farther than to phantasms. And I did not know that God is a spirit who has no parts extended in length and breadth, whose being has no mass, for every mass is less in a part than in a whole. And if it be an infinite mass... It must be less in such parts as are limited by a certain space than in its infinity. It cannot, therefore, be wholly everywhere as spirit is, as God is. And I was entirely ignorant as to what is that principle within us by which we are like God, and which is rightly said in Scripture to be made after God's image. Nor did I know that true inner righteousness, which does not judge according to custom, but by the measure of the most perfect law of God Almighty, by which the mores of various places and times were adapted to those places and times, though the law itself is the same always and everywhere, not one thing in one place and another in another. By this inner righteousness, Abraham and Isaac, and Jacob and Moses and David, and all those commended by the mouth of God were righteous, and were judged unrighteous only by foolish men who were judging by human judgment, and gauging their judgment of the mores of the whole human race by the narrow norms of their own mores. It is as if a man in an armory, not knowing what peace goes on what part of the body, should put a greave on his head and a helmet on his shin, and then complain because they did not fit. Or, as if, on some holiday, when afternoon business was forbidden, one were to grumble at not being allowed to go on selling, as it had been lawful for him to do in the forenoon. Or, again, as if, in a house, he sees a servant handle something that the butler is not permitted to touch, or when something is done behind a stable that would be prohibited in a dining room, and then a person should be indignant that in one house and one family the same things are not allowed to every member of the household. Such is the case with those who cannot endure to hear that something was lawful for righteous men in former times that is not now so or that God, for certain temporal reasons, commanded then one thing to them and another now to these. Yet both would be serving the same righteous will. These people should see that in one man, one day, and one house, different things are fit for different members. And a thing that was formerly lawful may become, after a time, unlawful 
and something allowed or commanded in one place that is justly prohibited, and punished in another. Is justice, then, variable and changeable? No, but the times over which she presides are not all alike, because they are different times. But men, whose days upon the earth are few, cannot by their own perception harmonize the causes of former ages and other nations, of which they had no experience, and compare them with these of which they do have experience, although in one and the same body or day or family, they can readily see that what is suitable for each member, season, part, and person may differ. To the one they take exception, to the other they submit. These things I did not know then, nor had I observed their import. They met my eyes on every side, and I did not see. I composed poems, in which I was not free to place each foot just anywhere, but in one meter one way, and in another meter another way. Nor even in any one verse was the same foot allowed in all places. Yet the art by which I composed did not have different principles for each of these different cases, but the same law throughout. Still, I did not see how, by that righteousness to which good and holy men submitted, all those things that God had commanded were gathered, in a far more excellent and sublime way, into one moral order. And it did not vary in any essential respect, though it did not in varying times prescribe all things at once, but rather distributed and prescribed what was proper for each. And being blind, I blamed those pious fathers, not only for making use of present things as God had commanded and inspired them to do, but also for foreshadowing things to come, as God revealed it to them. Chapter 8 Can it ever, at any time or place, be unrighteous for a man to love God with all his heart, with all his soul, and with all his mind, and his neighbor as himself? Similarly, offenses against nature are everywhere, and at all times to be held in detestation, and should be punished. Such offenses, for example, were those of the Sodomites, and even if all nations should commit them, they would all be judged guilty of the same crime by the divine law, which has not made men so that they should ever abuse one another in that way. For the fellowship that should be between God and us is violated whenever that nature of which he is the author is polluted by perverted lust. But these offenses against customary morality, are to be avoided according to the variety of such customs. Thus, what is agreed upon by convention, and confirmed by custom, or the law of any city or nation, may not be violated at the lawless pleasure of any, whether citizen or stranger. For any part that is not consistent with its whole is unseemly. Nevertheless, when God commands anything contrary to the customs or compacts of any nation, even though it were never done by them before, it is to be done. And if it has been interrupted, it is to be restored. And if it has never been established, it is to be established. For it is lawful for a king, in the state over which he reigns, to command that which neither he himself nor any one before him had commanded. And if it cannot be held to be inimical to the public interest to obey him, and, in truth, it would be inimical if he were not obeyed, since obedience to princes is a general compact of human society, how much more, then, ought we unhesitantly to obey God, the governor of all his creatures? For... Just as among the authorities in human society 
the greater authority is obeyed before the lesser, so also must God be above all. This applies as well to deeds of violence, where there is a real desire to harm another, either by humiliating treatment or by injury. Either of these may be done for reasons of revenge, as one enemy against another, or in order to obtain some advantage over another, as in the case of the highwayman and the traveler. Else, they may be done in order to avoid some other evil, as in the case of one who fears another, or through envy, as, for example, an unfortunate man harming a happy one just because he is happy. Or, they may be done by a prosperous man against someone whom he fears will become equal to himself, or whose equality he resents. They may even be done for the mere pleasure in another man's pain, as the spectators of gladiatorial shows, or the people who deride and mock at others. These are the major forms of iniquity that spring out of the lust of the flesh, and of the eye, and of power. Sometimes there is just one, sometimes two together, sometimes all of them at once. Thus we live, offending against the three and the seven, that harp of ten strings, thy decalogue, O God most high and most sweet. But now, how can offenses of vileness harm thee, who canst not be defiled? Or how can deeds of violence harm thee, who canst not be harmed? Still, thou dost punish these sins which men commit against themselves, because, even when they sin against thee, they are also committing impiety against their own souls. Iniquity gives itself the lie, either by corrupting or by perverting that nature which thou hast made and ordained. And they do this by an immoderate use of lawful things, or by lustful desire for things forbidden as against nature, or when they are guilty of sin by raging with heart and voice against thee, rebelling against thee, kicking against the pricks, or when they cast aside respect for human society and take audacious delight in conspiracies and feuds according to their private likes and dislikes. This is what happens whenever thou art forsaken, O fountain of life, who art the one and true creator and ruler of the universe. This is what happens when through self-willed pride a part is loved under the false assumption that it is the whole. Therefore, we must return to thee in humble piety, and let thee purge us from our evil ways, and be merciful to those who confess their sins to thee, and hear the groanings of the prisoners, and loosen us from those fetters which we have forged for ourselves. This thou wilt do, provided we do not raise up against thee the arrogance of a false freedom. For thus we lose all through craving more, by loving our own good more than thee, the common good of all. Chapter 9 But among all these vices and crimes and manifold iniquities, there are also the sins that are committed by men who are, on the whole, making progress toward the good. When these are judged rightly and after the rule of perfection, the sins are censored, but the men are to be commended because they show the hope of bearing fruit, like the green shoot of the growing corn. And there are some deeds that resemble vice and crime, and yet are not sin, because they offend neither thee, our Lord God, nor social custom. For example, when suitable reserves for hard times are provided, we cannot judge that this is done merely from a hoarding impulse. Or, again, when acts are punished by constituted authority for the sake of correction, 
we cannot judge that they are done merely out of a desire to inflict pain. Thus, many a deed which is disapproved in man's sight may be approved by thy testimony, and many a man who is praised by men is condemned, as thou art witness, because frequently the deed itself, the mind of the doer, and the hidden exigency of the situation all vary among themselves. But when, contrary to human expectation, thou commandest something unusual or unthought of, indeed something thou mayest formerly have forbidden, about which thou mayest conceal the reason for thy command at that particular time, and even though it may be contrary to the ordinance of some society of men, who doubts but that it should be done because only that society of men is righteous, which obeys thee. But blessed are they who know what thou dost command. For all things done by those who obey thee either exhibit something necessary at that particular time, or they foreshow things to come. <laughs> Chapter 10 But I was ignorant of all this, and so I mocked these holy servants and prophets of thine. Yet what did I gain by mocking them, save to be mocked in turn by thee? Insensibly, and little by little, I was led on to such follies as to believe that a fig tree wept when it was plucked, and that the sap of the mother tree was tears. Notwithstanding this, if a fig tree was plucked, not by his own, but another man's wickedness, some Manichaean saint might eat it, digest it in his stomach, and breathe it out again in the form of angels. Indeed, in his prayers he would assuredly groan and sigh forth particles of God, although these particles of the Most High and True God would have remained bound in that fig unless they had been set free by the teeth and belly of some elect saint. And wretch that I was, I believed that more mercy was to be shown to the fruits of the earth than unto men for whom these fruits were created. For if a hungry man, who was not a Manichaean, should beg for any food, the morsel that we gave to him would seem condemned, as it were, to capital punishment. <laughs> Chapter 11 And now thou didst stretch forth thy hand from above, and didst draw up my soul out of that profound darkness, because my mother, thy faithful one, wept to thee on my behalf more than mothers are accustomed to weep for the bodily deaths of their children. For by the light of the faith and spirit which she received from me, she saw that I was dead. And thou didst hear her, O Lord, thou didst hear her, and despised not her tears when, pouring down, they watered the earth under her eyes in every place where she prayed. Thou didst truly hear her. What other source was there for that dream by which thou didst console her, so that she permitted me to live with her, to have my meals in the same house at the table which she had begun to avoid, even while she hated and detested the blasphemies of my error. In her dream, she saw herself standing on a sort of wooden rule and saw a bright youth approaching her, joyous and smiling at her, while she was grieving and bowed down with sorrow. But when he inquired of her the cause of her sorrow and daily weeping, not to learn from her, but to teach her, as is customary in visions, and when she answered that it wasn't my soul's doom she was lamenting, he bade her rest content, and told her to look and see that where she was there I was also. And when she looked, she saw me standing near her, on the same rule. Whence came this vision, unless it was that thy ears were inclined toward her heart? O thou, omnipotent good, 
Thou carest for every one of us as if thou didst care for him only, and so for all as if they were but one. And what was the reason for this also, that when she told me of this vision, and I tried to put this construction on it, that she should not despair of being some day what I was, she replied immediately, without hesitation. No, for it was not told me that where he is, there you shall be, but where you are, there he will be. I confess my remembrance of this to thee, O Lord, as far as I can recall it, and I have often mentioned it. Thy answer, given through my watchful mother, in the fact that she was not disturbed by the plausibility of my false interpretation, but saw immediately what should have been seen, and which I certainly had not seen until she spoke. This answer moved me more deeply than the dream itself. Still, by that dream, the joy that was to come to that pious woman so long after was predicted long before, as a consolation for her present anguish. Nearly nine years passed in which I wallowed in the mud of that deep pit, and in the darkness of falsehood, striving often to rise, but being all the more heavily dashed down. But all that time this chaste, pious, and sober widow, such as thou dost love, was now more buoyed up with hope, though no less zealous in her weeping and mourning, and she did not cease to bewail my case before thee, in all the hours of her supplication. Her prayers entered thy presence, and yet thou didst allow me still to tumble and toss around in that darkness. <laughs> Chapter 12 Meanwhile, thou gavest her yet another answer, as I remember, for I pass over many things, hastening on to those things which more strongly impel me to confess to thee, and many things I have simply forgotten. But thou gavest her then another answer by a priest of thine, a certain bishop reared in thy church, and well versed in thy books. When that woman had begged him to agree to have some discussion with me, to refute my errors, to help me to unlearn evil and to learn the good, for it was his habit to do this when he found people ready to receive it, he refused, very prudently, as I afterward realized. For he answered that I was still unteachable, being inflated with the novelty of that heresy and that I had already perplexed divers, inexperienced persons with vexatious questions, as she herself had told him. But let him alone for a time, he said. Only pray God for him. He will, of his own accord, by reading, come to discover what an error it is, and how great its impiety is. He went on to tell her at the same time how he himself, as a boy, had been given over to the Manichaeans by his misguided mother, and not only had read, but had even copied out almost all their books. Yet he had come to see, without external argument or proof from anyone else, how much that sect was to be shunned, and had shunned it. When he had said this, she was not satisfied, but repeated more earnestly her entreaties, and shed copious tears, still beseeching him to see and talk with me. Finally the bishop, a little vexed at her importunity, exclaimed, Go your way. As you live, it cannot be that the son of these tears should perish. As she often told me afterward, she accepted this answer as though it were a voice from heaven. This audio recording is copyrighted 2007 Christian Classics Ethereal Library at Calvin College. 
all rights reserved. The Christian Classics Ethereal Library is a non-profit digital library of classic Christian literature. Please visit us at www.ccel.org. The cellist, Peter Plantinga, is currently a high school student. When he was young, he and his sister were the source of inspiration for the CCEL. You can read more about this online at ccel.org by clicking the About tab. From the Christian Classics Ethereal Library, on the web at www.ccel.org. Confessions of Augustine, newly translated and edited by Albert C. Outler, Ph.D., D.D. Book 4 This is the story of his years among the Manichaeans. It includes the account of his teaching at Tagaste, his taking a mistress, the attractions of astrology, the poignant loss of a friend which leads to a searching analysis of grief and transience. He reports on his first book, De Pocoro et Apto, and his introduction to Aristotle's categories and other books of philosophy and theology which he mastered with great ease and little profit. Chapter 1 During this period of nine years, from my nineteenth year to my twenty-eighth, I went astray and led others astray. I was deceived and deceived others in varied lustful projects, sometimes publicly, by the teaching of what men style the liberal arts, sometimes secretly, under the false guise of religion. In the one, I was proud of myself, in the other, superstitious, in all, vain. In my public life, I was striving after the emptiness of popular fame, going so far as to seek theatrical applause entering poetic contests, striving for the straw garlands and the vanity of theatricals and intemperate desires. In my private life, I was seeking to be purged from these corruptions of ours by carrying food to those who were called elect and holy, which, in the laboratory of their stomachs, they should make into angels and gods for us, and by them we might be set free. These projects I followed out and practiced with my friends, who were both deceived with me and by me. Let the proud laugh at me, and those who have not yet been savingly cast down and stricken by thee, O oh my God. Nevertheless, I would confess to thee my shame to thy glory. Bear with me, I beseech thee, and give me the grace to retrace in my present memory the devious ways of my past errors, and thus be able to offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving. For what am I to myself without thee but a guide to my own downfall? Or what am I, even at the best, but one suckled on thy milk and feeding on thee, O food that never perishes? What indeed is any man, seeing that he is but a man? Therefore, let the strong and the mighty laugh at us, but let us who are poor and needy confess to thee. Chapter 2 During those years I taught the art of rhetoric. Conquered by the desire for gain, I offered for sale speaking skills with which to conquer others. And yet... O oh Lord, Thou knowest that I really preferred to have honest scholars, or what were esteemed as such, and, without tricks of speech, I taught the scholars the tricks of speech, not to be used against the life of the innocent, but sometimes to save the life of a guilty man. And Thou, O oh God, didst see me from afar, stumbling on that slippery path, 
and sending out some flashes of fidelity amid much smoke, guiding those who loved vanity and sought after lying, being myself their companion. In those years I had a mistress, to whom I was not joined in lawful marriage. She was a woman I had discovered in my wayward passion, void as it was of understanding, yet she was the only one. And I remained faithful to her, and with her I discovered, by my own experience, what a great difference there is between the restraint of marriage bond contracted with a view to having children, and the compact of a lustful love, where children are born against the parent's will, although once they are born, they compel our love. I remember, too, that when I decided to compete for a theatrical prize, some magician, I do not remember him now, asked me what I would give him to be certain to win. But I detested and abominated such filthy mysteries, and answered, that even if the garland was of imperishable gold, I would still not permit a fly to be killed to win it for me. For he would have slain certain living creatures in his sacrifices, and by those honors would have invited the devils to help me. This evil thing I refused, but not out of a pure love of thee, O God of my heart, for I knew not how to love thee, because I knew not how to conceive of anything beyond corporeal splendors. And does not a soul, sighing after such idle fictions, commit fornication against thee, trust in false things, and feed on the winds? But still, I would not have sacrifices offered to devils on my behalf though I was myself still offering them sacrifices of a sort by my own superstition. For what else is it to feed on the winds, but to feed on the devils, that is, in our wanderings to become their sport and mockery? <laughs> Chapter 3 And yet... Without scruple, I consulted those other impostors, whom they call astrologers, because they used no sacrifices and invoked the aid of no spirit for their divinations. Still, true Christian piety must necessarily reject and condemn their art. It is good to confess to thee and say, Have mercy on me, heal my soul, for I have sinned against thee not to abuse thy goodness as a license to sin, but to remember the words of the Lord. Behold, you are made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing befall you. All of this wholesome advice, labor to destroy when they say, the cause of your sin is inevitably fixed in the heavens, and this is the doing of Venus, or of Saturn, or of Mars, all this in order that a man, who is only flesh and blood and proud corruption, may regard himself as blameless, while the Creator and Ordainer of heaven and the stars must bear the blame of our ills and misfortunes. But who is this Creator but Thou, our God, the sweetness and wellspring of righteousness, who renderest to every man according to his works, and despisest not a broken and contrite heart. There was at that time a wise man, very skillful and quite famous in medicine. He was a proconsul then, and with his own hand he placed on my distempered head the crown I had won in a rhetorical contest. He did not do this as a physician, however, and for this distemper, only thou canst heal who resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. But didst thou fail me in that old man, or forbear from healing my soul? Actually, when I became better acquainted with him, I used to listen, rapt and eager, to his words. For though he spoke in simple language, his conversation was replete with vivacity, life, 
and earnestness. He recognized from my own talk that I was given to books of the horoscope casters, but he, in a kind and fatherly way, advised me to throw them away and not to spend idly on these vanities, care and labor that might otherwise go into useful things. He said that he himself, in his earlier years, had studied the astrologer's art with a view to gaining his living by it as a profession. Since he had already understood Hippocrates, he was fully qualified to understand this, too. Yet he had given it up and followed medicine for the simple reason that he had discovered astrology to be utterly false. And as a man of honest character, he was unwilling to gain his living by beguiling people. But you, he said, have the profession of rhetoric to support yourself by, so that you are following this delusion in free will and not necessity. All the more. Therefore you ought to believe me, since I worked at it to learn the art perfectly because I wished to gain my living by it. When I asked him to account for the fact that many true things are foretold by astrology, he answered me, reasonably enough, that the force of chance, diffused through the whole order of nature, brought these things about. For when a man, by accident, opens the leaves of some poet, who sang and intended something far different, a verse oftentimes turns out to be wondrously apposite to the reader's present business. It is not to be wondered at, he continued, if out of the human mind, by some higher instinct, which does not know what goes on within itself, an answer should be arrived at, by chance and not art, which would fit both the business and the action of the inquirer. And thus truly, either by him or through him, thou wast looking after me, and thou didst fix all this in my memory so that afterward I might search it out for myself. But at that time, neither the pro council nor my most dear Nebridius, a splendid youth and most circumspect, who scoffed at the whole business of divination, could persuade me to give it up, for the authority of the astrological authors influenced me more than they did. And, thus far, I had come upon no certain proof, such as I thought, by which it could be shown without a doubt that what had been truly foretold by those consulted came from accident or chance, and not from the art of stargazers. <laughs> Chapter 4 In those years, when I first began to teach rhetoric in my native town, I had gained a very dear friend, about my own age, who was associated with me in the same studies. Like myself, he was just rising up into the flower of youth. He had grown up with me from childhood, and we had both been schoolfellows and playmates. But he was not then my friend nor indeed ever became my friend, in the true sense of the term. For there is no true friendship, save between those thou dost bind together, and who cleave to thee by that love which is shed abroad in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who is given to us. Still, it was a sweet friendship, being ripened by the zeal of common studies. Moreover, I had turned him away from the true faith, which he had not soundly and thoroughly mastered as a youth, and turned him toward those superstitions and harmful fables which my mother mourned in me. With me, this man went wandering off in error, and my soul could not exist without him. But behold, thou wast close behind thy fugitives, at once a god of vengeance and a fountain of mercies, who dost turn us to thyself by ways that make us marvel. Thus, thou didst take that man out of this life when he had scarcely completed one whole year of friendship with me, sweeter to me than all the sweetness of my life thus far. 
Who can show forth all thy praise for that which he has experienced in himself alone? What was it that thou didst do at that time, O oh, my God? How unsearchable are the depths of thy judgments! For when, sore sick of a fever, he lay long unconscious in a death sweat, and every one despaired of his recovery, he was baptized without his knowledge. And I myself cared little, at the time, presuming that his soul would retain what it had taken from me, rather than what was done to his unconscious body. It turned out, however, far differently, for he was revived and restored immediately, as soon as I could talk to him, and I did this as soon as he was able, for I never left him, and we hung on each other over much. I tried to jest with him, supposing that he would also jest in return about that baptism which he had received when his mind and senses were inactive, but which he had since learned that he had received. But he recoiled from me, as if I were his enemy, and, with a remarkable and unexpected freedom, he admonished me that, if I desired to continue as his friend, I must cease to say such things. Confounded and confused, I concealed my feelings till he should get well, and his health recover enough to allow me to deal with him as I wished. But he was snatched away from my madness, that with thee he might be preserved for my consolation. A few days later, during my absence, the fever returned, and he died. My heart was utterly darkened by this sorrow, and everywhere I looked I saw death. My native place was a torture room to me, and my father's house a strange unhappiness. And all the things I had done with him, now that he was gone, became a frightful torment. My eyes sought him everywhere, but they did not see him, and I hated all places because he was not in them, because they could not say to me, Look, he is coming as they did when he was alive and absent. I became a hard riddle to myself, and I asked my soul why she was so downcast, and why this disquieted me so sorely. But she did not know how to answer me. And if I said, Hope thou in God, she very properly disobeyed me, because that dearest friend she had lost was an actual man, both truer and better than the imagined deity she was ordered to put her hope in. Nothing but tears were sweet to me, and they took my friend's place in my heart's desire. Chapter 5 But now, O Lord, these things are past, and time has healed my wound. Let me learn from thee, who art truth, and put the ear of my heart to thy mouth, that thou mayest tell me why weeping should be so sweet to the unhappy. Hast thou, though omnipresent, dismissed our miseries from thy concern? Thou abidest in thyself while we are disquieted with trial after trial. Yet unless we wept in thy ears there would be no hope for us remaining. How does it happen that such sweet fruit is plucked from the bitterness of life, from groans, tears, sighs, and lamentations? Is it the hope that thou wilt hear us that sweetens it? This is true in the case of prayer. For in a prayer there is a desire to approach thee. But is it also the case in grief for a lost love? and in the kind of sorrow that has then overwhelmed me? For I had neither a hope of his coming back to life, nor in all my tears did I seek this. I simply grieved and wept, for I was miserable and had lost my joy. Or is weeping a bitter thing that gives us pleasure because of our aversion to the things we once enjoyed? And this 
only as long as we loathe them. Chapter 6 But why do I speak of these things? Now is not the time to ask such questions, but rather to confess to thee. I was wretched, and every soul is wretched that is fettered in the friendship of mortal things. It is torn to pieces when it loses them, and then realizes the misery which it had, even before it lost them. Thus, it was at that time with me. I wept most bitterly, and found a rest in bitterness. I was wretched, and yet that wretched life I still held dearer than my friend. For though I would willingly have changed it, I was still more unwilling to lose it than to have lost him. Indeed, I doubt whether I was willing to lose it, even for him, as they tell, unless it be fiction, of the friendship of Orestes and Pylades. They would have gladly died for one another, or both together, because not to love together was worse than death to them. But a strange kind of feeling had come over me, quite different from this, for now it was wearisome to live, and a fearful thing to die. I suppose that the more I loved him, the more I hated and feared, as the most cruel enemy, that death which had robbed me of him. I even imagined that it would suddenly annihilate all men, since it had had such a power over him. This is the way I remember it was with me. Look into my heart, O God. Behold and look deep within me, for I remember it well. O my hope, who cleanest me from the uncleanness of such affections, directing my eyes toward thee, and plucking my feet out of the snare. And I marveled that other mortals went on living since he, whom I had loved as if he would never die, was now dead. And I marveled all the more that I, who had been a second self to him, could go on living when he was dead. Someone spoke rightly of his friend as being his soul's other half. For I felt that my soul and his soul were but one soul in two bodies. Consequently, my life was now a horror to me, because I did not want to live as a half-self. But it may have been that I was afraid to die, lest he should then die wholly whom I had so greatly loved. <laughs> Chapter 7 O oh, madness that knows not how to love men as they should be loved! O oh, foolish man that I was then, enduring with so much rebellion the lot of every man! Thus I fretted, sighed, wept, tormented myself, and took neither rest nor counsel, for I was dragging around my torn and bloody soul. It was impatient of my dragging it around, and yet I could not find a place to lay it down, not in pleasant groves, nor in sport or song, nor in fragrant bowers, nor in magnificent banquetings, nor in the pleasures of the bed or the couch. Not even in books or poetry did it find rest. All things looked gloomy, even the very light itself. Whatsoever was not what he was, was now repulsive and hateful, except my groans and tears, for in those alone I found a little rest. But when my soul left off weeping, a heavy burden of misery weighed me down. It should have been raised up to thee, O Lord, for thee to lighten and to lift. This I knew, but I was neither willing nor able to do, especially since, in my thoughts of thee, thou wast not thyself, but only an empty phantasm. 
Thus my error was my God. If I tried to cast off my burden on this phantasm, that it might find rest there, it sank through the vacuum and came rushing down again upon me. Thus I remained to myself an unhappy lodging where I could neither stay nor leave. For where could my heart fly from my heart? Where could I fly from my own self? Where would I not follow myself? And yet I did flee from my native place so that my eyes would look for him less in a place where they were not accustomed to see him. Thus I left the town of Tagaste and returned to Carthage. <laughs> Chapter 8 Time never lapses, nor does it glide at leisure through our sense perceptions. It does strange things in the mind. Lo, time came and went from day to day, and by coming and going it brought to my mind other ideas and remembrances, and little by little they patched me up again with earlier kinds of pleasure and my sorrow yielded a bit to them. But yet there followed after this sorrow, not other sorrows just like it, but the causes of other sorrows. For why had that first sorrow so easily penetrated to the quick, except that I had poured out my soul onto the dust? By loving a man as if he would never die, who nevertheless had to die, what revived and refreshed me, more than anything else, was the consolation of other friends, with whom I went on loving the things I loved instead of thee. This was a monstrous fable, and a tedious lie, which was corrupting my soul with its itching ears by its adulterous rubbing. And that fable would not die to me as often as one of my friends died, and there were other things in our companionship that took strong hold of my mind, to discourse and jest with him, to indulge in courteous exchanges, to read pleasant books together, to trifle together, to be earnest together, to differ at times without ill humor, as a man might do with himself, and even through these infrequent dissensions to find zest in our more frequent agreements, sometimes teaching, sometimes being taught, longing for someone absent with impatience, and welcoming the homecomer with joy. These, and similar tokens of friendship, which spring spontaneously from the hearts of those who love, and are loved in return, in countenance, tongue, eyes, and a thousand ingratiating gestures were all so much fuel to melt our souls together, and out of the many made us one. Chapter 9 This is what we love in our friends, and we love it so much that a man's conscience accuses itself if he does not love one who loves him, or respond in love to love, seeking nothing from the other but the evidences of his love. This is the source of our moaning when one dies, the gloom of sorrow, the steeping of the heart in tears, all sweetness turned to bitterness, and the feeling of death in the living because of the loss of the life of the dying. Blessed is he who loves thee, and who loves his friend in thee, and his enemy also for thy sake, for he alone loses none dear to him, if all are dear in him who cannot be lost. And who is this but our God, the God that created heaven and earth, and filled them because he created them by filling them up? None loses thee, but he who leaves thee. And he who leaves thee, where does he go? 
or where can he flee but from thee well pleased to thee offended? For where does he not find thy law fulfilled in his own punishment? Thy law is the truth, and thou art truth. Chapter 10 Turn us again, O Lord God of hosts. Cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. For wherever the soul of man turns itself, unless toward thee, it is enmeshed in sorrows, even though it is surrounded by beautiful things outside thee and outside itself. For lovely things would simply not be unless they were from thee. They come to be, and they pass away, and by coming they begin to be, and they grow toward perfection. Then, when perfect, they begin to wax old and perish. And if all do not wax old, still all perish. Therefore, when they rise and grow toward being, the more rapidly they grow to maturity, also the more rapidly they hasten back toward non-being. This is the way of things. This is the lot thou hast given them, because they are part of things which do not all exist at the same time, but by passing away and succeeding each other, they all make up the universe, of which they are all parts. For example, our speech is accomplished by sounds which signify meanings, but a meaning is not complete unless one word passes away, when it has sounded its part, so that the next may follow after it. Let my soul praise Thee in all things, O God, the Creator of all. But let not my soul be stuck to these things by the glue of love, through the senses of the body. For they go where they were meant to go, that they may exist no longer, and they rend the soul with pestilent desires because she longs to be, and yet loves to rest secure in the created things she loves. But in these things there is no resting place to be found. They do not abide. They flee away. And who is he who can follow them with his physical senses? Or who can grasp them, even when they are present? For our physical sense is slow, because it is a physical sense, and bears its own limitations in itself. The physical sense is quite sufficient for what it was made to do, but it is not sufficient to stay things from running their courses from the beginning appointed to the end appointed. For in thy word, by which they were created, they hear their appointed bound, from there to here. Chapter 11 Be not foolish, O my soul, and do not let the tumult of your vanity deafen the ear of your heart. Be attentive. The word itself calls you to return, and with him is a place of unperturbed rest, where love is not forsaken unless it first forsakes. Behold, these things pass away that others may come to be in their place. Thus even this lowest level of unity may be complete in all its parts. But do I ever pass away? asks the word of God. Fix your habitation in him. O oh, my soul, commit whatsoever you have to him. For at long last you are now becoming tired of deceit. Commit to truth whatever you have received from the truth, and you will lose nothing. What is decayed will flourish again. Your diseases will be healed. Your perishable parts shall be reshaped and renovated, and made whole again in you. 
and these perishable things will not carry you with them down to where they go when they perish, but shall stand and abide, and you with them before God who abides and continues forever. Why then, my perverse soul, do you go on following your flesh? Instead, let it be converted so as to follow you. Whatever you feel through it is but partial. You do not know the whole of which sensations are but parts, and yet the parts delight in you. But if my physical senses had been able to comprehend the whole, and had not as part of their punishment received only a portion of the whole as their own province, you would then desire that whatever exists in the present time should also pass away, so that the whole might please you more. For what we speak, you also hear through physical sensation, and yet you would not wish that the syllables should remain. Instead, you wish them to fly past so that others may follow them, and the whole be heard. Thus, it is always that when any single thing is composed of many parts which do not coexist simultaneously, the whole gives more delight than the parts could ever do perceived separately. But far better than all this is He who made it all. He is our God, and He does not pass away, for there is nothing to take His place. <laughs> Chapter 12 If physical objects please you, praise God for them, but turn back your love to their Creator, lest, in those things which please you, you displease Him. If souls please you, let them be loved in God, for in themselves they are mutable, but in Him firmly established. Without Him they would simply cease to exist. In Him, then, let them be loved, and bring along to him with yourself as many souls as you can, and say to them, Let us love him. For he himself created all these, and he is not far away from them. For he did not create them and then go away. They are of him and in him. Behold, there he is, wherever truth is known. He is within the inmost heart, yet the heart has wandered away from him. Return to your heart, O you transgressors, and hold fast to him who made you. Stand with him, and you shall stand fast. Rest in him, and you shall be at rest. Where do you go along these rugged paths? Where are you going? The good that you love is from him. And in so far as it is also for him, it is both good and pleasant. But it will rightly be turned to bitterness if whatever comes from him is not rightly loved, and if he is deserted for the love of the creature. Why then will you wander farther and farther in these difficult and toilsome ways? There is no rest where you seek it. Seek what you seek, but remember that it is not where you seek it. You seek for a blessed life in the land of death. It is not there. For how can there be a blessed life where life itself is not? But our very life came down to earth and bore our death, and slew it with the very abundance of his own life. And thundering, he called us to return to him into that secret place from which he came forth to us, coming first into the virginal womb, where the human creature, our mortal flesh, was joined to him that it might not be forever mortal, and came as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, rejoicing as a strong man to run a race. For he did not delay, but ran through the world, crying out by words, Deeds, death, life, descent, ascension, crying aloud to us to return to him. 
and he departed from our sight, that we might return to our hearts and find him there. For he left us, and behold, he is here. He could not be with us long, yet he did not leave us. He went back to the place that he had never left, for the world was made by him. In this world he was, and into this world he came to save sinners. To him my soul confesses, and he heals it, because it had sinned against him. O sons of men, how long will you be so slow of heart? Even now, after life itself has come down to you, will you not ascend and live? But where will you climb if you are already on a pinnacle and have set your mouth against the heavens? First come down, that you may climb up, climb up to God. For you have fallen by trying to climb against him. Tell this to the souls you love, that they may weep in the valley of tears. And so bring them along with you to God, because it is by his spirit that you speak thus to them. If, as you speak, you burn with the fire of love. Chapter 13 These things I did not understand at that time, and I loved those inferior beauties, and I was sinking down to the very depths. And I said to my friends, Do we love anything but the beautiful? What then is the beautiful? And what is beauty? What is it that allures and unites us to the things we love? For unless there were a grace and a beauty in them, they could not possibly attract us to them. And I reflected on this, and saw that in the objects themselves, there is a kind of beauty which comes from their forming a whole, and another kind of beauty that comes from mutual fitness, as the harmony of one part of the body with its whole, or a shoe with a foot, and so on. And this idea sprang up in my mind and out of my inmost heart, and I wrote some books, two or three, I think, on the beautiful and the fitting. Thou knowest them, O Lord. They have escaped my memory. I no longer have them. Somehow they have been mislaid. Chapter 14 What was it, O Lord my God, that prompted me to dedicate these books to Hierius, an orator of Rome, a man I did not know by sight, but whom I loved for his reputation of learning, in which he was famous? and also for some words of his that I heard which had pleased me. But he pleased me more because he pleased others, who gave him high praise and expressed amazement that a Syrian, who had first studied Greek eloquence, should thereafter become so wonderful a Latin orator and also so well versed in philosophy. Thus, a man we have never seen is commended and loved. Does a love like this come into the heart of the hearer from the mouth of him who sings the other's praise? Not so. Instead, one catches the spark of love from one who loves. This is why we love one who is praised when the eulogist is believed to give his praise from an unfeigned heart. That is, when he who loves him praises him. Thus it was that I loved men on the basis of other men's judgment, and not thine, O oh my God, in whom no man is deceived. But why is it that the feeling I had for such men was not like my feeling toward the renowned charioteer or the great gladiatorial hunter, famed far and wide and popular with the mob? Actually, I admired the orator in a different and more serious fashion, as I would myself desire to be admired, for I did not want them to praise and love me as actors were praised and loved, 
although I myself praise and love them too. I would prefer being unknown than known in that way, or even being hated than loved that way. How are these various influences and diverse sorts of loves distributed within one soul? What is it that I am in love with in another which, if I did not hate, I should neither detest nor repel for myself, seeing that we are equally men? For it does not follow that because the good horse is admired by a man who would not be that horse, even if he could, the same kind of admiration should be given to an actor who shares our nature. Do I then love that in a man, which I also, a man, would hate to be? Man is himself a great deep. Thou dost number his very hairs, O Lord, and they do not fall to the ground without thee, and yet the hairs of his head are more readily numbered than are his affections and the movements of his heart. But that orator, whom I admired so much, was the kind of man I wished myself to be. Thus I erred through a swelling pride, and was carried about with every wind. But through it all I was being piloted by thee, though most secretly. And how is it that I know, whence comes my confident confession to thee, that I loved him more? because of the love of those who praised him than for the things they praised in him. Because if he had gone unpraised, and these same people had criticized him, and spoke the same things of him in a tone of scorn and disapproval, I should never have been kindled and provoked to love him. And yet his qualities would not have been different, nor would he have been different himself only the appraisals of the spectators. See where the helpless soul lies prostrate that is not yet sustained by the stability of truth? Just as the breezes of speech blow from the breast of the opinionated, so also the soul is tossed this way and that, driven forward and backward, and the light is obscured to it, and the truth is not seen. And yet... There it is in front of us. And to me, it was a greater matter that both my literary work and my zest for learning should be known by that man. For if he approved them, I would be even more fond of him. But if he disapproved, this vain heart of mine, devoid of thy steadfastness, would have been offended. And so I meditated on the problem of the beautiful and the fitting, and dedicated my essay on it to him. I regarded it admiringly, though no one else joined me in doing so. Chapter 15 But I had not seen how the main point in these great issues concerning the nature of beauty lay really in thy craftsmanship, O omnipotent one, who alone dost great wonders. And so my mind ranged through the corporeal forms, and I defined and distinguished as beautiful that which is so in itself, and as fit that which is beautiful in relation to some other thing. This argument I supported by corporeal examples, and I turned my attention to the nature of the mind, but the false opinions which I held concerning spiritual things prevented me from seeing the truth. Still, the very power of truth forced itself on my gaze, and I turned my throbbing soul away from incorporeal substance to qualities of line and color and shape, and because I could not perceive these with my mind, I concluded that I could not perceive my mind and since I loved the peace, which is in virtue, and hated the discord, which is in vice, I distinguished between the unity there is in virtue and the discord there is in vice. I conceived that unity consisted of the rational soul and the nature of truth and the highest good. 
But I imagined that in the disunity there was some kind of substance of irrational life and some kind of entity in the supreme evil. This evil, I thought, was not only a substance, but real life as well. And yet I believed that it did not come from thee, O oh my God, from whom are all things. And the first I called a monad, as if it were a soul without sex. The other I called a dyad, which showed itself in anger in deeds of violence, in deeds of passion and lust. But I did not know what I was talking about, for I had not understood nor had I been taught that evil is not a substance at all, and that our soul is not that supreme and unchangeable good. For just as in violent acts, if the emotion of the soul from whence the violent impulse springs is depraved, and asserts itself insolently and mutinously, and just as in the acts of passion, if the affection of the soul which gives rise to carnal desires is unrestrained, so also, in the same way, errors and false opinions contaminate life if the rational soul itself is depraved. Thus, it was then with me, for I was ignorant that my soul had to be enlightened by another light, if it was to be partaker of the truth, since it is not itself the essence of truth. For thou wilt light my lamp, the Lord my God will lighten my darkness, and of his fullness have we all received. For that was the true light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. For in thee there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. But I pushed on toward thee, and was pressed back by thee, that I might know the taste of death. For thou resistest, the proud. And what greater pride could there be for me than, with a marvelous madness, to assert myself to be that nature which thou art? I was mutable. This much was clear enough to me, because my very longing to become wise arouse out of a wish to change from worse to better. Yet I chose rather to think thee mutable than to think that I was not as thou art. For this reason I was thrust back. Thou didst resist my fickle pride. Thus I went on imagining corporeal forms, and since I was flesh, I accused the flesh, and since I was a wind that passes away, I did not return to thee, but went wandering and wandering on toward those things that have no being, neither in thee, nor in me, nor in the body. These fancies were not created for me by thy truth, but conceived by my own vain conceit out of sensory notions. And I used to ask thy faithful children, my own fellow citizens, from whom I stood unconsciously exiled. I used flippantly and foolishly to ask them, When, then, does the soul which God created err? But I would not allow anyone to ask me, why, then, does God err? I preferred to contend that thy immutable substance was involved in error through necessity, rather than admit my own mutable substance had gone astray of its own free will, and had fallen into error as its punishment. I was about twenty-six or twenty-seven when I wrote those books, analyzing and reflecting upon those sensory images which clamored in the ears of my heart. I was straining those ears to hear thy inward melody, O oh sweet truth, pondering on the beautiful and the fitting, and longing to stay and hear thee, and to rejoice greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Yet I could not, for by the clamor of my own errors I was hurried outside myself, and by the weight of my own pride I was sinking ever lower. You did not make me to hear joy and gladness nor did the bones rejoice which were not yet humbled. And what did it profit me that, when I was scarcely twenty years old, a book of Aristotle's entitled The Ten Categories 
fell into my hands. On the very title of this, I hung as on something great and divine, since my rhetoric master at Carthage and others who had reputations for learning were always referring to it with such swelling pride. I read it by myself and understood it. And what did it mean that when I discussed it with others, they said that even with the assistance of tutors, who not only explained it orally, but drew many diagrams in the sand, they scarcely understood it, and could tell me no more about it than I had acquired in the reading of it by myself alone. For the book appeared to me to speak plainly enough about substances, such as a man, and of their qualities, such as the shape of a man, his kind, his stature, how many feet high, and his family relationship, his status, when born, whether he is sitting or standing, is shod or armed, is doing something or having something done to him, and all the innumerable things that are classified under these nine categories, of which I have given some examples, or under the chief category of substance. What did all this profit me, since it actually hindered me when I imagined that whatever existed was comprehended within those ten categories? I tried to interpret them, O oh my God, so that even thy wonderful and unchangeable unity could be understood as subjected to thy own magnitude or beauty, as if they existed in thee as their subject, as they do in corporeal bodies, whereas thou art thyself thy own magnitude and beauty. A body is not great or fair because it is a body, because if it were less great or less beautiful, it would still be a body. But my conception of thee was falsity, not truth. It was a figment of my own misery, not the stable ground of thy blessedness. For thou hast commanded, and it was carried out in me, that the earth should bring forth briars and thorns for me, and that with heavy labor I should gain my bread. And what did it profit me that I could read and understand for myself all the books I could get in the so-called liberal arts, when I was actually a worthless slave of wicked lust? I took delight in them, not knowing the real source of what it was in them that was true and certain. For I had my back toward the light, and my face toward the things on which the light falls, so that my face which looked toward the illuminated things, was not itself illuminated. Whatever was written in any of the fields of rhetoric or logic, geometry, music, or arithmetic, I could understand without any great difficulty, and without the instruction of another man. All this thou knowest, O Lord my God, because both quickness in understanding and acuteness in insight are thy gifts. Yet for such gifts I made no thank-offering to thee. Therefore my abilities served not my profit, but rather my loss, since I went about trying to bring so large a part of my substance into my own power. And I did not store up my strength for thee, but went away from thee into the far country to prostitute my gifts in disordered appetite. And what did these abilities profit me, if I did not put them to good use. I did not realize that those arts were understood with great difficulty, even by the studious and the intelligent, until I tried to explain them to others, and discovered that even the most proficient in them followed my explanations all too slowly. And yet what did this profit me, since I still supposed that thou, O Lord God, the truth, were a bright and vast body, and that I was a particle of that body. O oh, perversity gone too far! But so it was with me, and I do not blush, O oh my God, to confess thy mercies to me in thy presence, or to call upon thee 
any more than I did not blush when I openly avowed my blasphemies before men, and bayed, hound-like, against thee. What good was it for me that my nimble wit could run through those studies, and disentangle all those naughty volumes without help from a human teacher, since all the while I was erring so hatefully? and with such sacrilege as far as the right substance of pious faith was concerned. And what kind of burden was it for thy little ones to have a far slower wit, since they did not use it to depart from thee, and since they remained in the nest of thy church to become safely fledged, and to nourish the wings of love by the food of a sound faith? O Lord our God, under the shadow of thy wings let us hope, defend us and support us. Thou wilt bear us up when we are little, and even down to our gray hairs thou wilt carry us. For our stability, when it is in thee, is stability indeed. But when it is in ourselves, then it is all unstable. Our good lives forever with thee, and when we turn from thee with aversion, we fall into our own perversion. Let us now, O Lord, return that we be not overturned, because with thee our good lives without blemish. For our good is thee thyself, and we need not fear that we shall find no place to return to, because we fell away from it. For, in our absence, our home, which is thy eternity, does not fall away. This audio recording is copyrighted 2007 Christian Classics Ethereal Library at Calvin College. All rights reserved. The Christian Classics Ethereal Library is a non-profit digital library of classic Christian literature. Please visit us at www.ccel.org. The cellist, Peter Plantinga, is currently a high school student. When he was young, he and his sister were the source of inspiration for the CCEL. You can read more about this online at ccel.org by clicking the About tab. From the Christian Classics Ethereal Library, on the web at www.ccel.org. Confessions of Augustine, newly translated and edited by Albert C. Outlook, Ph.D., D.D. Book 5 A Year of Decision Faustus comes to Carthage, and Augustine is disenchanted in his hope for solid demonstration of the truth of Manichaean doctrine. He decides to flee from his known troubles at Carthage to troubles yet unknown at Rome. His experiences at Rome prove disappointing, and he applies for a teaching post at Milan. Here he meets Ambrose, who confronts him as an impressive witness for Catholic Christianity and opens out the possibilities of the allegorical interpretation of Scripture. Augustine decides to become a Christian catechumen. Chapter 1 Accept this sacrifice of my confessions from the hand of my tongue. Thou didst form it, and hast prompted it, to praise thy name. Heal all my bones, and let them say, O Lord, who is like unto thee? It is not that one who confesses to thee instructs thee as to what goes on within him. For the closed heart does not bar thy sight into it, nor does the hardness of our heart hold back thy hands. For thou canst soften it at will, either by mercy or in vengeance. And there is no one who can hide himself from thy heat. But let my soul praise thee, that it may love thee, and let it confess thy mercies to thee, that it may praise thee. 
Thy whole creation praises Thee without ceasing. The Spirit of man, by his own lips, by his own voice, lifted up to Thee. Animals and lifeless matter by the mouths of those who meditate upon them. Thus, our souls may climb out of their weariness and toward Thee, and lean on those things which Thou hast created, and pass through them to Thee, who didst create them in a marvelous way. With Thee there is refreshment and true strength. <laughs> Chapter 2 Let the restless and the unrighteous depart, and flee away from thee. Even so, thou seest them, and thy eye pierces through the shadows in which they run. For, lo, they live in a world of beauty, and are yet themselves most foul. And how have they harmed thee? Or in what way have they discredited thy power? which is just and perfect in its rule even to the last item in creation. Indeed, where would they fly when they fled from thy presence? Wouldst thou be unable to find them? But they fled that they might not see thee who sawest them, that they might be blinded and stumble into thee. But thou forsakest nothing that thou hast made, the unrighteous stumble against thee, that they may be justly plagued, fleeing from thy gentleness and colliding with thy justice, and falling on their own rough paths. For in truth they do not know that thou art everywhere, that no place contains thee, and that only thou art near even to those who go farthest from thee. Let them, therefore, Turn back and seek thee, because even if they have abandoned thee, their creator, thou hast not abandoned thy creatures. Let them turn back and seek thee, and lo, thou art there in their hearts, there in the hearts of those who confess to thee. Let them cast themselves upon thee, and weep on thy bosom after all their weary wanderings and thou wilt gently wipe away their tears. And they weep the more, and rejoice in their weeping, since thou, O Lord, art not a man of flesh and blood. Thou art the Lord, who canst remake what thou didst make, and canst comfort them. And where was I when I was seeking thee? There thou wast, before me, but I had gone away, even for myself, and I could not find myself, much less thee. Chapter 3 Let me now lay bare in the sight of God the twenty-ninth year of my age. There had just come to Carthage a certain bishop of the Manichaeans, Faustus by name, a great snare of the devil, and many were entangled by him through the charm of his eloquence. Now, even though I found this eloquence admirable, I was beginning to distinguish the charm of words from the truth of things, which I was eager to learn. Nor did I consider the dish as much as I did the kind of meat that their famous Faustus served up to me in it. His fame had run before him as one very skilled in an honorable learning, and preeminently skilled in the liberal arts. And as I had already read and stored up in memory many of the injunctions of the philosophers, I began to compare some of their doctrines with the tedious fables of the Manichaeans, and it struck me that the probability was on the side of the philosophers— whose power reached far enough to enable them to form a fair judgment of the world, even though they had not discovered the sovereign Lord of it all. For thou art great, O Lord, and thou hast respect unto the lowly, but the proud thou knowest afar off. Thou drawest near to none 
but the contrite in heart, and canst not be found by the proud, even if in their inquisitive skill they may number the stars and the sands, and map out the constellations and trace the courses of the planets. For it is by the mind and the intelligence which thou gavest them that they investigate these things. They have discovered much, and foretold many years in advance the day, the hour, and the extent of the eclipses of those luminaries, the sun and the moon. Their calculations did not fail, and it came to pass as they predicted, and they wrote down the rules they had discovered, so that to this day they may be read, and from them may be calculated in what year and month and day and hour of the day, and at what quarter of its light, either the moon or the sun will be eclipsed, and it will come to pass just as predicted. And men who are ignorant of these matters marvel and are amazed, and those who understand them exult and are exalted, both by an impious pride, withdraw from thee, and forsake thy light. They foretell an eclipse of the sun before it happens, but they do not see their own eclipse which is even now occurring. For they do not ask, as religious men should, what is the source of the intelligence by which they investigate these matters. Moreover, when they discover that thou didst make them, they do not give themselves up to thee that thou mightest preserve what thou hast made, nor do they offer, as sacrifice to thee, what they have made of themselves. For they do not slaughter their own pride, as they do the sacrificial fowls, nor their own curiosities by which, like the fishes of the sea, they wander through the unknown paths of the deep nor do they curb their own extravagances as they do those of the beasts of the field, so that thou, O Lord, a consuming fire, mayest burn up their mortal cares and renew them unto immortality. They do not know the way which is thy word, by which thou didst create all the things that are, and also the men who measure them and the senses by which they perceive what they measure, and the intelligence whereby they discern the patterns of measure. Thus they know not that thy wisdom is not a matter of measure. But the only begotten hath been made unto us wisdom, and righteousness, and sanctification, and hath been numbered among us, and paid tribute to Caesar. And they do not know this way by which they could descend from themselves to him, in order to ascend through him to him. They did not know this way, and so they fancied themselves exalted to the stars and the shining heavens, and lo, they fell upon the earth, and their foolish heart was darkened. They saw many true things about the creature, but they do not seek with true piety for the truth, the architect of creation. And hence they do not find him, or if they do find him, and know that he is God, they do not glorify him as God. Neither are they thankful, but become vain in their imagination, and say that they themselves are wise, and attribute to themselves what is thine. At the same time, with the most perverse blindness, they wish to attribute to thee their own quality, so that they load their lies on thee who art the truth, changing the glory of the incorruptible God for an image of corruptible man and birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. They exchanged thy truth for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator. Yet I remembered many a true saying of the philosophers about the creation, and I saw the confirmation of their calculations in the orderly sequence of seasons and in the visible evidence of the stars. And I compared this with the doctrines of Manny, who in his voluminous folly wrote many books on these subjects, 
but I could not discover there any account of either the solstices or the equinoxes or the eclipses of the sun and moon or anything of the sort that I had learned in the books of secular philosophy. But still I was ordered to believe, even where the ideas did not correspond with, even when they contradicted, the rational theories established by mathematics in my own eyes, but were very different. Chapter 4 Yet, O Lord God of truth, is any man pleasing to thee because he knows these things? No, for surely that man is unhappy who knows these things and does not know thee, and that man is happy who knows thee, even though he does not know these things. He who knows both thee and these things is not the more blessed for his learning. For thou only art his blessing, if knowing thee as God he glorifies thee, and gives thanks, and does not become vain in his thoughts. For just as that man who knows how to possess a tree, and give thanks to thee for the use of it, although he may not know how many feet high it is, or how wide it spreads, is better than the man who can measure it, and count all its branches, but neither owns it nor knows or loves its creator. Just so is a faithful man who possesses the world's wealth as though he had nothing, and possesses all things through his union through thee, whom all things serve, even though he does not know the circlings of the great bear. Just so it is foolish to doubt that this faithful man may truly be better than the one who can measure the heavens and number the stars and weigh the elements, but who is forgetful of thee, who has set in order all things in number, weight, and measure. <laughs> Chapter 5 And who ordered this Manny to write about these things, knowledge of which is not necessary to piety? For thou hast said to man, Behold, godliness is wisdom. And of this he might have been ignorant, however perfectly he may have known these other things. Yet, since he did not know even these other things, and most impudently dared to teach them, it is clear that he had no knowledge of piety. For even when we had a knowledge of this worldly lore, it is folly to make a profession of it, when piety comes from confession to thee. From piety, therefore, Manny had gone astray, and all his show of learning only enabled the truly learned to perceive from his ignorance of what they knew, how little he was to be trusted to make plain these more really difficult matters. For he did not aim to be lightly esteemed, but went around trying to persuade men that the Holy Spirit, the comforter and enricher of thy faithful ones, was personally resident in him with full authority, and therefore, when he was detected in manifest errors about the sky, the stars, the movements of the sun and moon, even though these things do not relate to religious doctrine, the impious presumption of the man became clearly evident. For he not only taught things about which he was ignorant, but also perverted them, and this with pride so foolish and mad that he sought to claim that his own utterances were as if they had been those of a divine person. When I hear of a Christian brother ignorant of these things, or in error concerning them, I can tolerate his uniformed opinion, and I do not see that any lack of knowledge as to the form or nature of this material creation can do him much harm, as long as he does not hold a belief in anything which is unworthy of thee, O Lord, the Creator of all. 
But if he thinks that his secular knowledge pertains to the essence of the doctrine of piety, or ventures to assert dogmatic opinions in matters in which he is ignorant, there lies the injury. And yet even a weakness such as this in the infancy of our faith is tolerated by our mother charity until the new man can grow up unto a perfect man and not be carried away with every wind of doctrine. But Manny had presumed to be at once the teacher, author, guide, and leader of all whom he could persuade to believe this, so that all who followed him believed that they were following not an ordinary man, but thy Holy Spirit. And who would not judge that such great madness, when it once stood convicted of false teaching, should then be abhorred and utterly rejected? But I had not yet clearly decided whether the alternation of day and night, and of longer and shorter days and nights, and the eclipses of sun and moon, and whatever else I had read about in other books, could be explained consistently with his theories. If they could have been so explained, there would still have remained a doubt in my mind whether the theories were right or wrong. Yet I was prepared, on the strength of his reputed godliness, to rest my faith on his authority. <laughs> Chapter 6 For almost the whole of the nine years that I listened with unsettled mind to the Manichaean teaching, I had been looking forward with unbounded eagerness to the arrival of this Faustus. For all the other members of the sect that I happened to meet, when they were unable to answer the questions I raised, always referred me to his coming. They promised that, in the discussion with him, these, and even greater difficulties, if I had them, would be quite easily and amply cleared away. When at last he did come, I found him to be a man of pleasant speech, who spoke of the very same things they themselves did, although more fluently, and in a more agreeable style. But what profit was there to me in the elegance of my cupbearer? since he could not offer me the more precious drought for which I thirsted. My ears had already had their fill of such stuff, and now it did not seem any better because it was better expressed, nor more true because it was dressed up in rhetoric. Nor could I think the man's soul necessarily wise because his face was comely and his language eloquent. But they who extolled him to me were not competent judges. They thought him able and wise because his eloquence delighted them. At the same time, I realized that there is another kind of man who is suspicious even of truth itself, if it is expressed in smooth and flowing language. But thou, O oh my God, hadst already taught me in wonderful and marvelous ways, and therefore I believed, because it is true, that thou didst teach me and that beside thee there is no other teacher of truth, wherever truth shines forth. Already I had learned from thee that because a thing is eloquently expressed, it should not be taken to be as necessarily true, nor because it is uttered with stammering lips should it be supposed false, nor again is it necessarily true because rudely uttered, nor untrue, because the language is brilliant. Wisdom and folly both are like meats that are wholesome and unwholesome, and courtly or simple words are like town-made or rustic vessels. Both kinds of food may be served in either kind of dish. The eagerness, therefore, with which I had so long awaited this man, was in truth delighted with his action and feeling in a disputation, and with the fluent and apt words with which he clothed his ideas. I was delighted, therefore, and I joined with others, and even exceeded them in exalting and praising him. 
yet it was a source of annoyance to me that, in his lecture room, I was not allowed to introduce and raise any of those questions that troubled me in a familiar exchange of discussion with him. As soon as I found an opportunity for this, and gained his ear at a time when it was not inconvenient for him to enter into a discussion with me and my friends, I laid before him some of my doubts. I discovered at once that he knew nothing of the liberal arts except grammar, and that only in an ordinary way. He had, however, read some of Tully's orations, a very few books of Seneca, and some of the poets, and such few books of his own sect as were written in good Latin. With this meager learning and his daily practice in speaking, he had acquired a sort of eloquence which proved the more delightful and enticing, because it was under the direction of a ready wit, and a sort of native grace. Was this not even, as I now recall it, O Lord my God, judge of my conscience? My heart and my memory are laid open before thee, who wast even then guiding me by the secret impulse of thy providence, and wast setting my shameful errors before my face, so that I might see and hate them. Chapter 7 For as soon as it became plain to me that Faustus was ignorant in those arts in which I had believed him eminent, I began to despair of his being able to clarify and explain all these perplexities that had troubled me, though I realized that such ignorance need not have affected the authenticity of his piety if he had not been a Manichaean. For their books are full of long fables about the sky and the stars, the sun and the moon. And I had ceased to believe him able to show me in any satisfactory fashion what I so ardently desired. Whether the explanations contained the Manichaean books were better, or at least as good as the mathematical explanations I had read elsewhere. But when I proposed that these subjects should be considered and discussed, he quite modestly did not dare to undertake the task, for he was aware that he had no knowledge of these things, and was not ashamed to confess it. For he was not one of those talkative people, from whom I had endured so much, who undertook to teach me what I wanted to know, and then said nothing. Faustus had a heart which, if not right toward thee, was at least not altogether false toward himself, for he was not ignorant of his own ignorance, and he did not choose to be entangled in a controversy from which he could not draw back or retire gracefully. For this I liked him all the more, for the modesty of an ingenious mind is a finer thing than the acquisition of that knowledge I desired. And I found this to be his attitude toward all abstruse and difficult questions. Thus, the zeal with which I had plunged into the Manichaean system was checked, and I despaired even more of their other teachers, because Faustus, who was so famous among them, had turned out so poorly in the various matters that puzzled me. And so I began to occupy myself with him in the study of his own favorite pursuit, that of literature, in which I was already teaching a class as a professor of rhetoric among the young Carthaginian students. With Faustus, then, I read whatever he himself wished to read, or I judged suitable to his bent of mind. But all my endeavors to make further progress in Manichaeism came completely to an end through my acquaintance with that man. I did not wholly separate myself from them, but as one who had not yet found anything better, I decided to contend myself for the time being with what I had stumbled upon one way or another until by chance something more desirable should present itself. Thus that Faustus who had entrapped so many to their death, though neither willing nor witting it, 
now began to loosen the snare in which I had been caught. For thy hands, O oh my God, in the hidden design of thy province, did not desert my soul. And out of the blood of my mother's heart, through the tears that she poured out by day and by night, there was a sacrifice offered to thee for me, and by marvelous ways thou didst deal with me. For it was thou, O oh my God, who didst it. For the steps of a man are ordered by the Lord, and he shall choose his way. How shall we attain salvation without thy hand remaking what it had already made? Chapter 8 Thou didst so deal with me, therefore, that I was persuaded to go to Rome, and teach there what I had been teaching at Carthage. And how I was persuaded to do this I will not omit to confess to thee. For in this also the profoundest workings of thy wisdom and thy constant mercy toward us must be pondered and acknowledged. I did not wish to go to Rome because of the richer fees and the higher dignity which my friends promised me there, though these considerations did affect my decision. My principal and almost sole motive was that I had been informed that the students there studied more quietly and were better kept under the control of stern discipline, so that they did not capriciously and impudently rush into the classroom of a teacher not their own. Indeed, they were not admitted at all without the permission of the teacher. At Carthage, on the contrary, there was a shameful and intemperate license among the students. They burst in rudely and with furious gestures, would disrupt the discipline which the teacher had established for the good of his pupils. Many outrages they perpetrated with astounding effrontery things that would be punishable by law if they were not sustained by custom. Thus, custom makes plain that such behavior is all the more worthless, because it allows men to do what thy eternal law never will allow. They think that they act thus with impunity, though the very blindness with which they act is their punishment, and they suffer far greater harm than they inflict. The manners that I would not adopt as a student I was compelled as a teacher to endure in others, and so I was glad to go where all who knew the situation assured me that such conduct was not allowed. But thou, O oh my refuge and my portion in the land of the living, didst goad me thus at Carthage, so that I might thereby be pulled away from it and change my worldly habitation for the preservation of my soul. At the same time, thou didst offer me at Rome an enticement, through the agency of men enchanted with this death in life, by their insane conduct in the one place, and their empty promises in the other. To correct my wandering footsteps, thou didst secretly employ their perversity and my own, for those who disturbed my tranquillity were blinded by shameful madness, and also those who allured me elsewhere had nothing better than the earth's cunning. And I, who hated actual misery in the one place, sought fictitious happiness in the other. Thou knewest the cause of my going from one country to the other, O God, but thou didst not disclose it either to me or to my mother who grieved deeply over my departure, and followed me down to the sea. She clasped me tight in her embrace, willing either to keep me back or to go with me. But I deceived her, pretending that I had a friend whom I could not leave until he had a favorable wind to set sail. Thus I lied to my mother, and such a mother, and escaped. For this, too, thou didst mercifully pardon me, fool that I was, and didst preserve me from the waters of the sea, for the waters of thy grace, so that, when I was purified by that, the fountain of my mother's eyes, 
from which she had daily watered the ground for me as she prayed to thee, should be dried. And since she refused to return without me, I persuaded her, with some difficulty, to remain that night in a place quite close to our ship, where there was a shrine in memory of the blessed Cyperian. That night I slipped away secretly, and she remained to pray and weep. And what was it, O Lord, that she was asking of thee in such a flood of tears, but that thou wouldst not allow me to sail? But thou, taking thy own secret counsel, and noting the real point to her desire, didst not grant what she was then asking, in order to grant to her the thing that she had always been asking. The wind blew and filled our sails, and the shore dropped out of sight. Wild with grief, she was there the next morning, and filled thy ears with complaints and groans which thou didst disregard, although, at the very same time, thou wast using my longings as a means and wast hastening me on to the fulfillment of all longing. Thus, the earthly part of her love to me was justly purged by the scourge of sorrow. Still, like all mothers, though even more than others, she loved to have me with her, and did not know what joy thou wast preparing for her through my going away. Not knowing this secret end, she wept and mourned, and saw in her agony the inheritance of Eve, seeking in sorrow what she had brought forth in sorrow. And yet, after accusing me of perfidy and cruelty, she still continued her intercessions for me to thee. She returned to her own home, and I went on to Rome. <laughs> Chapter 9 And lo, I was received in Rome by the scourge of bodily sickness, and I was very near to falling into hell, burdened with all the many and grievous sins I had committed against thee, myself, and others, all over and above that fetter of original sin whereby we all die in Adam. For thou hast forgiven me none of these things in Christ, Neither had he abolished by his cross the enmity that I had incurred from thee through my sins. For how could he do so by the crucifixion of a phantom, which was all I supposed him to be? The death of my soul was as real then as the death of his flesh appeared to me unreal, and the life of my soul was as false, because it was as unreal as the death of his flesh was real though I believed it not. My fever increased, and I was on the verge of passing away and perishing, for if I had passed away then, where should I have gone but into the fiery torment which my misdeeds deserved, measured by the truth of thy rule? My mother knew nothing of this, yet far away she went on praying for me, and thou present everywhere, didst hear her where she was, and had pity on me where I was, so that I regained my bodily health, although I was still disordered in my sacrilegious heart. For that peril of death did not make me wish to be baptized. I was even better when, as a lad, I entreated baptism of my mother's devotion, as I have already related and confessed." But now I had since increased in dishonor, and I madly scoffed at all the purposes of thy medicine, which would not have allowed me, though a sinner such as I was, to die a double death. Had my mother's heart been pierced with this wound, it never could have been cured, for I cannot adequately tell of the love she had for me, or how she still travailed for me in the spirit, with a far keener anguish than when she bore me in the flesh. I cannot conceive, therefore, 
how she could have been healed if my death, still in my sins, had pierced her inmost love. Where, then, would have been all her earnest, frequent, and ceaseless prayers to thee? Nowhere but with thee. But couldst thou, O merciful God, despise the contrite and humble heart of that pure and prudent widow, who was so constant in her alms, so gracious and attentive to thy saints, never missing a visit to church twice a day, morning and evening, and this not for vain gossiping, nor old wives' fables, but in order that she might listen to thee in thy sermons, and thou to her in her prayers. Couldst thou, by whose gifts she was so inspired, despise and disregard the tears of such a one without coming to her aid, those tears by which she entreated thee, not for gold or silver, and not for any changing or fleeting good, but for the salvation of the soul of her son, by no means, O Lord. It is certain that thou wast near, and wast hearing, and wast carrying out the plan by which thou hadst predetermined it should be done. Far be it from thee that thou shouldst have deluded her in those visions, and the answers she had received from thee, some of which I have mentioned, and others not, which she kept in her faithful heart, and, forever beseeching, urged them on thee, as if they had thy own signature. For thou, because thy mercy endureth forever, hast so condescended to those whose debts thou hast pardoned, that thou likewise dost become a debtor by thy promises. <laughs> Chapter 10 Thou didst restore me then from that illness, and didst heal the son of thy handmaid in his body, that he might live for thee, and that thou mightest endow him with a better and more certain health. After this, at Rome, I again joined those deluding and deluded saints, and not their hearers only, such as the man was in whose house I had fallen sick but also with those whom they called the elect. For it still seemed to me that it is not we who sin, but some other nature sinned in us, and it gratified my pride to be beyond blame. And when I did anything wrong not to have to confess that I had done wrong, that thou mightest heal my soul because it had sinned against thee. And I love to excuse my soul, and to accuse something else inside me, I knew not what, but which was not I. But assuredly, it was I, and it was my impiety that had divided me against myself, that sin then was all the more incurable because I did not deem myself a sinner. It was an execrable iniquity, O oh God, omnipotent, that I would have preferred to have thee defeated in me, to my destruction, than to be defeated by thee to my salvation. Not yet, therefore, hadst thou set a watch upon my mouth, and a door around my lips, that my heart might not incline to evil speech, to make excuse for sin with men that work iniquity. And therefore, I continued still in the company of their elect. But now, Hopeless of gaining any profit from that false doctrine, I began to hold more loosely and negligently even to those points which I had decided to rest content with, if I could find nothing better. I was now half inclined to believe that those philosophers whom they call the academics were wiser than the rest in holding that we ought to doubt everything— and in maintaining that man does not have the power of comprehending any certain truth. For, although I had not yet understood their meaning, I was fully persuaded that they thought just as they are commonly reputed to do. And I did not fail openly to dissuade my host from his confidence, which I observed that he had in those fictions of which the works of Manny are full. 
I did not indeed defend it with my former ardor, but my familiarity with that group, and there were many of them concealed in Rome at that time, made me slower to seek any other way. This was particularly easy since I had no hope of finding in thy church the truth from which they had turned me aside, O Lord of heaven and earth, creator of all things visible and invisible. And it still seemed to me most unseemly to believe that thou couldst have the form of human flesh and be bounded by the bodily shape of our limbs. And when I desired to meditate on my God, I did not know what to think of, but a huge extended body. For what did not have bodily extension did not seem to me to exist. And this was the greatest and almost the sole cause of my unavoidable errors. And thus I also believed that evil was a similar kind of substance, and that it had its own hideous and deformed extended body either in a dense form, which they called the earth, or in a thin and subtle form as, for example, the substance of the air, which they imagined as some malignant spirit penetrating that earth. And because my piety, such as it was, still compelled me to believe that the good God never created any evil substance, I formed the idea of two masses, one opposed to the other, both infinite, but with the evil more contracted and the good more expansive. And from this diseased beginning, the other sacrileges followed after. For when my mind tried to turn back to the Catholic faith, I was cast down, since the Catholic faith was not what I judged it to be. And it seemed to me a greater piety to regard thee, my God, to whom I make confession of thy mercies, as infinite in all respects save that one, where the extended mass of evil stood opposed to thee, where I was compelled to confess that thou art finite, then if I should think that thou couldst be confined by the form of a human body on every side. And it seemed better to me to believe that no evil had been created by thee, for in my ignorance evil appeared not only to be some kind of substance, but a corporeal one at that. This was because I had, thus far, no conception of mind, except as a subtle body diffused throughout local spaces. This seemed better than to believe that anything could emanate from thee, which had the character that I considered evil to be in its nature. And I believed that our Savior himself also, thy only begotten, had been brought forth, as it were, for our salvation out of the mass of thy bright shining substance, so that I could believe nothing about him except what I was able to harmonize with these vain imaginations. I thought, therefore, that such a nature could not be born of the Virgin Mary without being mingled with the flesh and I could not see how the divine substance, as I had conceived it, could be mingled thus without being contaminated. I was afraid, therefore, to believe that he had been born in the flesh, lest I should also be compelled to believe that he had been contaminated by the flesh. Now will thy spiritual ones smile blandly and lovingly at me if they read these confessions. Yet such was I. Chapter 11 Furthermore, the things they censored in thy scriptures I thought impossible to be defended, and yet, occasionally, I desired to confer on various matters with someone well learned in those books, to test what he thought of them. For already the words of one Elpidius, who spoke and disputed face to face against these same Manichaeans, had begun to impress me, even when I was at Carthage, because he brought forth things out of the scriptures that were not easily withstood, 
to which their answers appeared to me feeble. One of the answers they did not give forth publicly, but only to us in private, when they said that the writings of the New Testament had been tampered with by unknown persons who desired to engraft the Jewish law into the Christian faith. But they themselves never brought forward any uncorrupted copies. Still, thinking in corporeal categories, and very much ensnared, and to some extent stifled, I was borne down by those conceptions of bodily substance. I panted under this load for the air of thy truth, but I was not able to breathe it pure and undefiled. <laughs> Chapter 12 I set about diligently to practice what I came to Rome to do, the teaching of rhetoric. The first task was to bring together in my home a few people to whom and through whom I had begun to be known, and lo, I then began to learn that other offenses were committed in Rome which I had not had to bear in Africa. Just as I had been told, those riotous disruptions by young blackguards were not practiced here. Yet now, my friends told me, many of the Roman students, breakers of faith, who for the love of money, set a small value on justice, would conspire together and suddenly transfer to another teacher to evade paying their master's fees. My heart hated such people, though not with a perfect hatred. For doubtless I hated them more because I was to suffer from them than on account of their own illicit acts. Still, such people are base indeed. They fornicate against thee, for they love the transitory mockeries of temporal things, and the filthy gain which begrimes the hand that grabs it. They embrace the fleeting world and scorn thee, who abidest and invitest us to return to thee, and who pardonest the prostituted human soul when it does not return to thee. Now I hate such crooked and perverse men, although I love them if they will be corrected, and come to prefer the learning they obtain to money, and above all, to prefer thee to such learning, O God, the truth and fullness of our positive good, and our most pure peace. But then the wish was stronger in me for my own sake not to suffer evil from them than was my desire that they should become good for thy sake. Chapter 13 When, therefore, the officials of Milan sent to Rome, to the prefect of the city, to ask that he provide them with a teacher of rhetoric for their city, and to send him at the public expense, I applied for the job through those same persons, drunk with the Manichaean vanities, to be freed from whom I was going away, though neither they nor I were aware of it at that time. They recommended that Symmachus, who was then prefect, after he had proved me by audition, should appoint me. And to Milan I came, to Ambrose the bishop, famed through the whole world as one of the best of men, thy devoted servant. His eloquent discourse in those times abundantly provided thy people with the flower of thy wheat, the gladness of thy oil, and the sober intoxication of thy wine. To him I was led by thee without my knowledge, that by him I might be led to thee in full knowledge. That man of God received me as a father would, and welcomed my coming as a good bishop should. And I began to love him, of course, not at the first as a teacher of the truth, for I had entirely despaired of finding that in thy church, but as a friendly man. And I studiously listened to him, though not with the right motive, as he preached to the people. I was trying to discover whether his eloquence came up to his reputation, and whether it flowed fuller or thinner than others said it did. And thus I hung on his words intently, but as to his subject matter, I was only a careless and contemptuous listener. 
I was delighted with the charm of his speech, which was more erudite, though less cheerful and soothing than Faustus's style. As for subject matter, however, there could be no comparison, for the latter was wandering around in Manichaean deceptions, while the former was teaching salvation most soundly. But salvation is far from the wicked, such as I was then when I stood before him. Yet I was drawing nearer, gradually and unconsciously. Chapter 14 For although I took no trouble to learn what he said, but only to hear how he said it, for this empty concern remained foremost with me as long as I despaired of finding a clear path from man to thee. Yet along with the eloquence I prized, there also came into my mind the ideas which I ignored, for I could not separate them. And while I opened my heart to acknowledge how skillfully he spoke, there also came an awareness of how truly he spoke, but only gradually. First of all, his ideas had already begun to appear to me defensible, and the Catholic faith, for which I supposed that nothing could be said against the onslaught of the Manichaeans, I now realized could be maintained without presumption. This was especially clear after I heard one or two parts of the Old Testament explained allegorically, whereas before this, when I had interpreted them literally, they had killed me spiritually. However, when many of these passages in those books were expounded to me thus, I came to blame my own despair for having believed that no reply could be given to those who hated and scoffed at the law and the prophets. Yet I did not see that this was reason enough to follow the Catholic way, just because it had learned advocates who could answer objections adequately and without absurdity. Nor could I see that what I had held to heretofore should now be condemned, because both sides were equally defensible. For that way did not appear to me yet vanquished, but neither did it seem yet victorious. But now I earnestly bent my mind to require if there was possible any way to prove the Manichaeans guilty of falsehood. If I could have conceived of a spiritual substance, all their strongholds would have collapsed and been cast out of my mind but I could not. Still, concerning the body of this world, nature as a whole, now that I was able to consider and compare such things more and more, I now decided that the majority of the philosophers held the more probable views. So, in what I thought was the method of the academics, doubting everything and fluctuating between all the options, I came to the conclusion that the Manichaeans were to be abandoned, for I judged, even in that period of doubt, that I could not remain in a sect to which I preferred some of the philosophers. But I refused to commit the cure of my fainting soul to the philosophers, because they were without the saving name of Christ. I resolved, therefore, to become a catechumen in the Catholic Church which my parents had so much urged upon me, until something certain shone forth by which I might guide my course. This audio recording is copyrighted 2007 Christian Classics Ethereal Library at Calvin College. All rights reserved. The Christian Classics Ethereal Library is a non-profit digital library of classic Christian literature. Please visit us at www.ccel.org. The cellist, Peter Plantinga, is currently a high school student. When he was young, he and his sister were the source of inspiration for the CCEL. You can read more about this online at ccel.org by clicking the About tab. From the Christian Classics Ethereal Library, on the web at www.ccel.org. Confessions of Augustine 
Newly translated and edited by Albert C. Outlet, Ph.D., D.D. Book 6 Turmoil in the Twenties Monica follows Augustin to Milan and finds him a catechumen in the Catholic Church. Both admire Ambrose, but Augustin gets no help from him on his personal problems. Ambition spurs, and Alpius and Nebridius join him in a confused quest for the happy life. Augustin becomes engaged, dismisses his first mistress, takes another, and continues his fruitless search for truth. <laughs> Chapter 1 O oh, hope from my youth, where wast thou to me, and where hast thou gone away? For hadst thou not created me, and differentiated me from the beasts of the field and the birds of the air, making me wiser than they? And yet I was wandering about in a dark and slippery way, seeking thee outside myself, and thus not finding the God of my heart. I had gone down into the depths of the sea and had lost faith, and had despaired of ever finding the truth. By this time my mother had come to me, having mustered the courage of piety, following over sea and land, secure in thee through all the perils of the journey. For in the dangers of the voyage she comforted the sailors, to whom the inexperienced voyagers, when alarmed, were accustomed to go for comfort and assured them of a safe arrival, because she had been so assured by thee in a vision. She found me in deadly peril through my despair of ever finding the truth. But when I told her that I was now no longer a Manichaean, though not yet a Catholic Christian, she did not leap for joy as if this were unexpected, for she had already been reassured about that part of my misery for which she had mourned me as one dead but also as one who would be raised to thee. She had carried me out in the bier of her thoughts, that thou mightest say to the widow's son, Young man, I say unto you, Arise. And then he would revive and begin to speak, and thou wouldst deliver him to his mother. Therefore her heart was not agitated with any violent exultation when she heard that so great a part of what she daily entreated thee to do had actually already been done, that though I had not yet grasped the truth, I was rescued from falsehood. Instead, she was fully confident that thou who hadst promised the whole would give her the rest, and thus most calmly, and with a fully confident heart, she replied to me that she believed in Christ, that before she died she would see me a faithful Catholic. And she said no more than this to me, but to thee, O fountain of mercy, she poured out still more frequent prayers and tears, that thou wouldst hasten thy aid and enlighten my darkness. And she hurried all the more zealously to the church, and hung upon the words of Ambrose, praying for the fountain of water that springs up into everlasting life. For she loved that man as an angel of God, since she knew that it was by him that I had been brought thus far to that wavering state of agitation I was now in, through which she was fully persuaded I should pass from sickness to health, even though it would be after a still sharper convulsion, which physicians call the crisis. <laughs> Chapter 2 so also my mother brought to certain oratories, erected in the memory of the saints, offerings of porridge, bread, and wine, as had been her custom in Africa, and she was forbidden to do so by the doorkeeper. And as soon as she learned that it was the bishop who had forbidden it, she acquiesced so devoutly and obediently that I myself marveled how readily she could bring herself to turn critic of her own customs rather than question his prohibition. For wine-bibbing had not taken possession of her spirit, nor did the love of wine stimulate her to hate the truth, 
as it does to many, both male and female, who turn as sick at a hymn to sobriety as drunkards do at a drought of water. When she had brought her basket with the festive gifts, which she would taste first herself and give the rest away, she would never allow herself more than one little cup of wine, diluted according to her own temperate palate, which she would taste out of courtesy. And, if there were many oratories of departed saints that ought to be honored in the same way, she still carried around with her the same little cup, to be used everywhere. This became not only very much watered, but also quite tepid with carrying it about. She would distribute it by small sips to those around, for she sought to stimulate their devotion, not pleasure. But as soon as she found this custom was forbidden by that famous preacher and most pious prelate, even to those who would use it in moderation, lest thereby it might be an occasion of gluttony for those who were already drunken, and also because these funeral memorials were very much like some of the superstitious practices of the pagans, she most willingly abstained from it. And, in a place of a basket filled with fruits of the earth, she had learned to bring to the oratories of the martyrs a heart full of pure petitions, and to give all that she could to the poor, so that the communion of the Lord's body might be rightly celebrated in those places where, after the example of his passion, the martyrs had been sacrificed and crowned. But yet it seemed to me, O Lord my God, and my heart thinks of it this way in thy sight, that my mother would probably not have given way so easily to the rejection of this custom if it had been forbidden by another whom she did not love as she did Ambrose. For, out of her concern for my salvation, she loved him most dearly, and he loved her truly, on account of her faithful religious life, in which she frequented the church with good works, fervent in spirit. Thus he would, when he saw me, often burst forth into praise of her, congratulating me that I had such a mother, little knowing what a son she had in me, who was still a skeptic in all these matters, and who could not conceive that the way of life could be found out. Chapter 3 Nor had I come yet to groan in my prayers, that thou wouldst help me. My mind was wholly intent on knowledge and eager for disputation. Ambrose himself I esteemed a happy man, as the world counted happiness, because great personages held him in honor. Only his celibacy appeared to me a painful burden. But what hope he cherished, what struggles he had against the temptations that beset his high station, what solace in adversity, and what savory joys thy bread possessed for the hidden mouth of his heart when feeding on it, I could neither conjecture nor experience." Nor did he know my own frustrations, nor the pit of my danger, for I could not request of him what I wanted as I wanted it, because I was debarred from hearing and speaking to him by crowds of busy people to whose infirmities he devoted himself. And when he was not engaged with them, which was never for long at a time, he was either refreshing his body with necessary food or his mind with reading. Now, as he read... His eyes glanced over the pages, and his heart searched out the sense, but his voice and tongue were silent. Often when we came to his room, for no one was forbidden to enter, nor was it his custom that the arrival of visitors should be announced to him, we would see him thus reading to himself. After we had sat for a long time in silence, for who would dare interrupt one so intent, we would then depart realizing that he was unwilling to be distracted in the little time he could gain for the recruiting of his mind, free from the clamor of other men's business. Perhaps he was fearful lest, if the author he was studying should express himself vaguely, some doubtful and attentive hearer would ask him to expound it, or discuss some of the more abstruse questions. 
so that he could not get over as much material as he wished, if his time was occupied with others. And even a truer reason for his reading to himself might have been to care for preserving his voice, which was very easily weakened. Whatever his motive was in doing so, it was doubtless, in such a man, a good one. But actually I could find no opportunity of putting the questions I desired to that holy oracle of thine in his heart, unless it was a matter which could be dealt with briefly. However, those surgings in me required that he should give me his full leisure, so that I might pour them out to him. But I never found him so. I heard him, indeed, every Lord's day, rightly dividing the word of truth among the people. And I became all the more convinced that all those knots of crafty calumnies, which those deceivers of ours had knit together against the divine books, could be unraveled. I soon understood that the statement that man was made after the image of him that created him was not understood by thy spiritual sons, whom thou hast regenerated through the Catholic mother through grace, as if they believed and imagined that thou wert bounded by a human form, although what was the nature of spiritual substance I had not the faintest or vaguest notion. Still rejoicing, I blushed that for so many years I had bade, not against the Catholic faith, but against the fables of fleshly imagination. For I had been both impious and rash in this, that I had condemned by pronouncement what I ought to have learned by inquiry. For thou, O most high, and most near, most secret, yet most present, who does not have limbs, some of which are larger, and some smaller, but who art wholly everywhere, and nowhere in space, and art not shaped by some corporeal form, Thou didst create man after thy own image, and see, he dwells in space, both head and feet. <laughs> Chapter 4 Since I could not then understand how this image of thine could subsist, I should have knocked on the door and propounded the doubt as to how it was to be believed, and not having insultingly opposed it, as if it were actually believed. Therefore, my anxiety as to what I could retain as certain gnawed all the more sharply into my soul, and I felt quite ashamed, because during the long time I had been deluded and deceived by the Manichaean promises of certainties, I had, with childish petulance, prated of so many uncertainties as if they were certain, that they were falsehoods became apparent to me only afterward. However, I was certain that they were uncertain, and since I had held them as certainly uncertain, I had accused thy Catholic Church with a blind contentiousness. I had not yet discovered that it taught the truth, but I now knew that it did not teach what I had so vehemently accused it of, in this respect, at least, I was confounded and converted, and I rejoiced, O oh my God, that the one church, the body of thy only Son, in which the name of Christ had been sealed upon me as an infant, did not relish these childish trifles, and did not maintain in its sound doctrine any tenet that would involve pressing thee, the Creator of all into space which, however extended and immense, would still be bounded on all sides, like the shape of a human body. I was also glad that the old scriptures of the law and the prophets were laid before me to be read, not now with an eye to what had seemed absurd in them when formerly I censured thy holy ones for thinking thus, when they actually did not think in that way. And I listened with delight to Ambrose, in his sermons to the people, often recommending this text most diligently as a rule, the letter kills, but the spirit gives life, while at the same time he drew aside the mystic veil and opened to view the spiritual meaning of what seemed to teach perverse doctrine if it were taken according to the letter. I found nothing in his teachings that offended me, though I could not yet know for certain whether what he taught was true. For all this time I restrained my heart from assenting to anything, 
fearing to fall headlong into error. Instead, by this hanging in suspense, I was being strangled. For my desire was to be as certain of invisible things as I was that seven and three are ten. I was not so deranged as to believe that this could not be comprehended, but my desire was to have other things as clear as this, whether they were physical objects, which were not present to my senses, or spiritual objects, which I did not know how to conceive of except in physical terms. If I could have believed, I might have been cured, and with the sight of my soul cleared up, it might in some way have been directed toward thy truth, which always abides and fails in nothing. But, just as it happens that a man who has tried a bad physician fears to trust himself with a good one, so it was with the health of my soul, which could not be healed except by believing. But lest it should believe falsehoods, it refused to be cured, resisting thy hand, who hast prepared for us the medicines of faith, and applied them to the maladies of the whole world, and endowed them with such great efficacy. Chapter 5 Still, from this time forward, I began to prefer the Catholic doctrine. I felt that it was with moderation and honesty that it commanded things to be believed that were not demonstrated, whether they could be demonstrated, but not to everyone, or whether they could not be demonstrated at all. This was far better than the method of the Manichaeans, in which our credulity was mocked by an audacious promise of knowledge, and then many fabulous and absurd things were forced upon believers because they were incapable of demonstration. After that, O oh Lord, little by little, with a gentle and most merciful hand, drawing and calming my heart, thou didst persuade me that, if I took into account the multitude of things I had never seen, nor been present when they were enacted, such as many of the events of secular history, and the numerous reports of places and cities which I had not seen, or such as my relations with many friends or physicians or with these men and those, that unless we should believe, we should do nothing at all in this life. Finally, I was impressed with what an unalterable assurance I believed which two people were my parents, though this was impossible for me to know otherwise than by hearsay. By bringing all this into my consideration, thou didst persuade me that it was not the ones who believed thy books, which thou with so great authority thou hast established among nearly all nations, but those who did not believe them who were to be blamed. Moreover, those men were not to be listened to who would say to me, How do you know that those scriptures were imparted to mankind by the Spirit of the One and Most True God? For this was the point that was most of all to be believed, since no wranglings of blasphemous questions such as I had read in the book of the self-contradicting philosophers could once snatch from me the belief that thou dost exist, although what thou art I did not know and that to thee belongs the governance of human affairs. This much I believed, sometimes more strongly than other times, but I always believed both that thou art and that thou hast a care for us, although I was ignorant both as to what should be thought about thy substance, and as to which way led or led back to thee. Thus, since we are too weak by unaided reason to find out truth, and since, because of this, we need the authority of the holy writings, I had now begun to believe that thou wouldst not, under any circumstances, have given such eminent authority to those scriptures throughout all lands if it had not been that through them thy will may be believed in, and that thou mightest be sought. For, as to those passages in the scripture, which had heretofore appeared incongruous and offensive to me, now that I had heard several of them expounded reasonably, I could see that they were to be resolved by the mysteries of spiritual interpretation. 
The authority of Scripture seemed to me all the more revered and worthy of devout belief because, although it was visible for all to read, it reserved the full majesty of its secret wisdom within its spiritual profundity, while it stooped to all the great plainness of its language and simplicity of style. It yet required the closest attention of the most serious-minded, so that it might receive all into its common bosom, and direct some few through its narrow passages toward thee. Yet many more than would have been the case had there not been in it such a lofty authority, which nevertheless allured multitudes to its bosom by its holy humility. I continued to reflect upon these things, and thou wast with me. I sighed and thou didst hear me. I vacillated, and thou guidest me. I roamed the broad way of the world, and thou didst not desert me. Chapter 6 I was still eagerly aspiring to honors, money, and matrimony, and thou didst mock me. In pursuit of these ambitions, I endured the most bitter hardships, in which thou wast being the more gracious, the less thou wouldst allow anything that was not thee to grow sweet to me. Look into my heart, O Lord, whose prompting it is that I should recall all this and confess it to thee. Now let my soul cleave to thee, now that thou hast freed her from that fast-sticking glue of death. How wretched she was! And thou didst irritate her sore wound so that she might forsake all else and turn to thee, who art above all and without whom all things would be nothing at all, so that she should be converted and healed. How wretched I was at that time! And how thou didst deal with me so as to make me aware of my wretchedness! I recall from the incident of the day on which I was preparing to recite a panegyric on the Emperor. In it, I was to deliver many a lie, and the lying was to be applauded by those who knew I was lying. My heart was agitated with this sense of guilt, and it seethed with the fever of my uneasiness. For while walking along one of the streets of Milan, I saw a poor beggar, with what I believed was a full belly, joking and hilarious and I sighed and spoke to the friends around me of the many sorrows that flowed from our madness, because in spite of all our exertions, such as those I was then laboring in, dragging the burden of my unhappiness under the spur of ambition, and by dragging it, increasing it at the same time, still, and all we aimed only to attain that very happiness which this beggar had reached before us, and there was a grim chance that we should never attain it, for what he had obtained through a few coins, got by his begging, I was still scheming for by many a wretched and torturous turning, namely, the joy of passing felicity. He had not indeed gained true joy, but at the same time, with all my ambitions, I was seeking one still more untrue. Anyhow, he was now joyous, and I was anxious. He was free from care, and I was full of alarms. Now, if any one should inquire of me whether I should prefer to be merry or anxious, I would reply, Merry. Again, if I had been asked whether I should prefer to be as he was, or as I myself then was, I would have chosen to be myself, though I was beset with cares and alarms. But would not this have been a false choice? Was the contrast valid? Actually, I ought not to prefer myself to him, because I happened to be more learned than he was, for I got no great pleasure from my learning, but sought rather to please men by its exhibition. And this is not to instruct, but only to please. Thus thou didst break my bones with the rod of thy correction. Let my soul take its leave of those who say, It makes a difference as to the object from which a man derives his joy. The beggar rejoices in drunkenness. You long to rejoice in glory. What glory, O Lord? The kind that is not in thee, 
for just as his was no true joy, so was mine no true glory. But it turned my head all the more. He would get over his drunkenness that same night. But I had slept with mine many a night, and risen again with it, and was to sleep again, and rise again with it. I know not how many times. It does indeed make a difference as to the object from which a man's joy is gained. I know this is so, and I know that the joy of faithful hope is incomparably beyond such vanity. Yet at the same time, this beggar was beyond me, for he truly was the happier man, not only because he was thoroughly steeped in his mirth while I was torn to pieces with my cares, but because he had gotten his wine by giving good wishes to the passers-by, while I was following after the ambition of my pride by lying. Much to this effect I said to my good companions, and I saw how readily they reacted pretty much as I did. Thus I found that it went ill with me, and I fretted, and doubled that very ill. And if any prosperity smiled upon me, I loathed to seize it, for almost before I could grasp it, it would fly away. Chapter 7 Those of us who were living like friends together used to bemoan our lot in our common talk, but I discussed it with Alpius and Nebridius, more especially, and in familiar terms. Alpius had been born in the same town as I. His parents were of the highest rank there, but he was a bit younger than I. He had studied under me when I first taught in our town, and then afterward at Carthage. He esteemed me highly because I appeared to him good and learned, and I esteemed him for his inborn love of virtue, which was uncommonly marked in a man so young. But in the whirlpool of Carthaginian fashion, where frivolous spectacles are hotly followed, he had been inveigled into the madness of the gladiatorial games. While he was miserably tossed about in this fad, I was teaching rhetoric there in a public school. At that time he was not attending my classes because of some ill feeling that had arisen between me and his father. I then came to discover how fatally he doted upon the circus, and I was deeply grieved, for he seemed likely to cast away his very great promise, if, indeed, he had not already done so. Yet I had no means of advising him, or any way of reclaiming him through restraint, either by the kindness of a friend, or by the authority of a teacher. For I imagined that his feelings toward me were the same as his father's. But this turned out not to be the case. Indeed, disregarding his father's will in the matter, he began to be friendly, and to visit my lecture room to listen for a while and then depart. But it slipped my memory to try to deal with his problem, to prevent him from ruining his excellent mind in his blind and headstrong passion for frivolous sport. But thou, O Lord, who holdest the helm of all that thou hast created, thou hast not forgotten him who was one day to be numbered among thy sons, a chief minister of thy sacrament. And in order that his amendment might be plainly attributed to thee, Thou broughtest it about, through me, while I knew nothing of it. One day, when I was sitting in my accustomed place with scholars before me, he came in, greeted me, sat himself down, and fixed his attention on the subject I was then discussing. It so happened that I had a passage in hand, and while I was interpreting it, a simile occurred to me, taken from the gladiatorial games. It struck me as relevant to make more pleasant and plain the point I wanted to convey by adding a biting jab at those whom that that madness had enthralled. Thou knowest, O oh our God, that I had no thought at that time of curing Alpius of that plague. But he took it to himself, and thought that I would not have said it but for his sake, and what any other man would have taken as an occasion of offense against me. This worthy young man took as a reason for being offended at himself, and for loving me the more fervently. Thou hast said it long ago, and written in thy book, Rebuke a wise man, and he will love you. 
Now I had not rebuked him. But thou who canst make use of everything, both witting and unwitting, and in the order which thou thyself knowest to be best, and that order is right, thou madest my heart and tongue into burning coals, with which thou mightest cauterize and cure the hopeful mind thus languishing. Let him be silent in thy praise, who does not meditate on thy mercy, which rises up in my inmost parts to confess to thee. After that speech, Alpheus rushed up out of that deep pit into which he had willfully plunged, and in which he had been blinded by its miserable pleasures. And he roused his mind with a resolve to moderation. When he had done this, all the filth of the gladiatorial pleasures dropped away from him, and he went to them no more. Then he also prevailed upon his reluctant father to let him be my pupil, and, at the son's urging, the father at last consented. Thus Alpheus began again to hear my lectures and became involved with me in the same superstition, loving in the Manichaeans that outward display of ascetic discipline which he believed was true and unfeigned. It was, however, a senseless and seducing continence, which ensnared precious souls who were not able as yet to reach the height of true virtue, and who were easily beguiled with the veneer of what was only a shadowy and feigned virtue. Chapter 8 He had gone on to Rome before me to study law which was the worldly way which his parents were forever urging him to pursue. And there he was carried away again with an incredible passion for the gladiatorial shows. For although he had been utterly opposed to such spectacles, and he tested them, one day he met by chance a company of his acquaintances and fellow students returning from dinner. And with a friendly violence, they drew him, resisting and objecting vehemently into the amphitheater, on a day of those cruel and murderous shows. He protested to them, Though you drag my body to that place and set me down there, you cannot force me to give my mind or lend mine eyes to these shows. Thus I will be absent while present, and so overcome both you and them. When they heard this, they dragged him on in, probably interested to see whether he could do as he said. When they got to the arena and had taken what seats they could get, the whole place became a tumult of inhuman frenzy. But Alpheus kept his eyes closed, and forbade his mind to roam abroad after such wickedness. Would that he had shut his ears also! For when one of the combatants fell in the fight, a mighty cry from the whole audience stirred him so strongly that, overcome by curiosity, and still prepared, as he thought, to despise and rise superior to it, no matter what it was, he opened his eyes, and was struck with a deeper wound in his soul than the victim who he desired to see had been in his body. Thus he fell more miserably than the one whose fall had raised that mighty clamor which had entered through his ears, and unlocked his eyes to make way for the wounding and beating down of his soul which was more audacious than truly valiant. Also, it was weaker, because it presumed on its own strength when it ought to have depended on thee. For as soon as he saw the blood, he drank in with it a savage temper, and he did not turn away, but fixed his eyes on the bloody pastime, unwittingly drinking in the madness, delighted with the wicked contest and drunk with blood-lust. He was now no longer the same man who came in, but was one of the mob he came into, a true companion of those who had brought him thither. Why need I say more? He looked, he shouted, he was excited, and he took away with him the madness that would stimulate him to come again. Not only with those who first enticed him, but even without them, indeed, dragging in others besides. And yet from all this, with a most powerful and most merciful hand, thou didst pluck him, and taught him not to rest his confidence in himself, but in thee. 
but not till long after. Chapter 9 But this was all being stored up in his memory as medicine for the future. So also was that other incident when he was still studying under me at Carthage, and was meditating at noonday in the marketplace on what he had to recite, as scholars usually have to do for practice. And thou didst allow him to be arrested by the police officers in the marketplace as a thief. I believe, O oh my God, that thou didst allow for this for no other reason than that this man, who was in the future to prove so great, should now begin to learn that, in making just decisions, a man should not readily be condemned by other men with reckless credulity. For as he was walking up and down alone before the judgment seat with his tablets and pen, lo, a young man, another one of the scholars, who was the real thief, secretly brought a hatchet, and without Alpius seeing him, he got in as far as the leaden bars which protected the silversmith shop, and began to hack away at the lead gratings. But when the noise of the hatchet was heard, the silversmiths below began to call to each other in whispers, and sent men to arrest whomsoever they should find. The thief heard their voices and ran away, leaving his hatchet because he was afraid to be caught with it. Now Alpius, who had not seen him come in, got a glimpse of him as he went out, and noticed that he went off in great haste. Being curious to know the reasons, he went up to the place where he found the hatchet, and stood wondering and pondering, when, behold, those that were sent caught him alone, holding the hatchet which had made the noise which had startled them and brought them there. They seized him and dragged him away, gathering the tenants of the marketplace about them, and boasting that they had caught a notorious thief. Thereupon he was led away to peer before the judge. But this is as far as his lesson was to go. For immediately, O Lord, thou didst come to the rescue of his innocence of which thou wast the sole witness. As he was being led off to prison or punishment, they were met by the master builder who had charge of the public buildings. The captors were especially glad to meet him, because he had more than once suspected them of stealing the goods that had been lost out of the marketplace. Now, at last, they thought they could convince him who it was that had committed the thefts. But the custodian had often met Alpius at the house of a certain senator, whose receptions he used to attend. He recognized him at once, and taking his hand, led him apart from the throng, inquired the cause of all the trouble, and learned what had occurred. He then commanded all the rabble still around, and very uproariously, and full of threatenings they were, to come along with him and they came to the house of the young man who had committed the deed. There, before the door, was a slave boy so young that he was not yet restrained from telling the whole story by fear of harming his master. And he had followed his master to the marketplace. Alpius recognized him, and whispered to the architect, who showed the boy the hatchet, and asked whose it was. Ours, he answered directly and, being further questioned, he disclosed the whole affair. Thus the guilt was shifted to that household, and the rabble, who had begun to triumph over Alpius, were shamed. And so he went away home, this man who was to be the future steward of thy word, and judge of so many causes in thy church, a wiser and more experienced man. <laughs> Chapter 10 I found him at Rome, and he was bound to me with the strongest possible ties, and he went with me to Milan, in order that he might not be separated from me, and also that he might obtain some law practice, for which he had qualified with a view to pleasing his parents more than himself. He had already sat three times as assessor, 
showing an integrity that seemed strange to many others, though he thought them strange who could prefer gold to integrity. His character had also been tested, not only by the bait of covetousness, but by the spur of fear. At Rome, he was assessor to the secretary of the Italian treasury. There was at that time a very powerful senator to whose favors many were indebted, and of whom many stood in fear. In his usual high-handed way, he demanded to have a favor granted to him that was forbidden by the laws. This Alpius resisted. A bribe was promised, but he scorned it with all his heart. Threats were employed, but he trampled them underfoot, so that all men marveled at so rare a spirit, which neither coveted the friendship nor feared the enmity of a man at once so powerful and so widely known for his great resources of helping his friends and doing harm to his enemies. Even the official whose counselor Alpius was, although he was unwilling that the favor should be granted, would not openly refuse the request, but pass the responsibility on to Alpius, alleging that he would not permit him to give his assent. And the truth was that even if the judge had agreed, Alpius would have simply left the court. There was one matter, however, which appealed to his love of learning, in which he was very nearly led astray. He found out that he might have books copied for himself at praetorian rates, i.e. at public expense. But his sense of justice prevailed, and he changed his mind for the better, thinking that the rule that forbade him was still more profitable than the privilege that his office would have allowed him. These are little things, but he that is faithful in a little matter is faithful also in a great one. Nor can that possibly be void which was uttered by the mouth of thy truth. If, therefore, you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? If, therefore, you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? Such a man was Alpius who clung to me at that time, and who wavered in his purpose, just as I did, as to what course of life to follow. Nebridius also had come to Milan for no other reason than that he might live with me in a most ardent search after truth and wisdom. He had left his native place near Carthage, and Carthage itself, where he usually lived, leaving behind his fine family estate, his house, and his mother, who would not follow him. Like me, he sighed. Like me, he wavered. An ardent seeker after the true life, and a most acute analyst of the most abstruse questions. So there were three begging mouths, sighing out their wants to one another, and waiting upon thee, that thou mightest give them their meat in due season. And in all the vexations with which thy mercy followed our worldly pursuits, we sought for the reason why we suffered so, and all was darkness. We turned away, groaning and exclaiming, How long shall these things be? And this we often asked. Yet for all our asking, we did not relinquish them, for as yet we had not discovered anything certain which, when we gave those others up, we might grasp in their stead. <laughs> Chapter 11 And I especially puzzled and wondered when I remembered how long a time had passed since my nineteenth year, in which I had first fallen in love with wisdom, and had determined as soon as I could find her to abandon the empty hopes and mad delusions of vain desires. Behold, I was now getting close to thirty, still stuck fast in the same mire, still greedy of enjoying present goods which fly away and distract me. And I was still saying, Tomorrow I shall discover it. Behold, it will become plain, and I shall see it. Behold, Faustus will come and explain everything. Or I would say, Oh, you mighty academics, 
Is there no certainty that man can grasp for the guidance of his life? No. Let us search the more diligently, and let us not despair. See, the things in the church's books that appeared so absurd to us before do not appear so now, and may be otherwise, and honestly interpreted. I will set my feet upon that step where, as a child, my parents placed me, until the clear truth is discovered. But where and when shall it be sought? Ambrose has no leisure. We have no leisure to read. Where are we to find the books? How or where could I get hold of them? From whom could I borrow them? Let me set a schedule for my days, and set apart certain hours for the health of the soul. A great hope has risen up in us, because the Catholic faith does not teach what we thought it did, and vainly accused it of. Its teachers hold it as an abomination to believe that God is limited by the form of a human body. And do I doubt that I should knock in order for the rest also to be opened unto me? My pupils take up the morning hours. What am I doing with the rest of the day? Why not do this? But then, when am I to visit my influential friends, whose favors I need? When am I to prepare the orations that I sell to the class? When would I get some recreation and relax my mind from the strain of work? Perish everything, and let us dismiss these idle triflings. Let me devote myself solely to the search for truth. This life is unhappy, death uncertain. If it comes upon me suddenly, in what state shall I go hence? And where shall I learn what here I have neglected? Should I not indeed suffer the punishment of my negligence here? But suppose death cuts off and finishes all care and feeling. This, too, is a question that calls for inquiry. God forbid that it should be so. It is not without reason. It is not in vain that the stately authority of the Christian faith has spread over the entire world. And God would never have done such great things for us if the life of the soul perished with the death of the body. Why, therefore, do I delay in abandoning my hopes of this world and giving myself wholly to seek after God and the blessed life? But wait a moment. This life also is pleasant, and it has a sweetness of its own, not at all negligible. But we must not abandon it lightly, for it would be shameful to lapse back into it again. See now? It is important to gain some post of honor. And what more should I desire? I have crowds of influential friends, if nothing else. And if I push my claims, a governorship may be offered me, and a wife with some money, so that she would not be an added expense. This would be the height of my desire. Many men, who are great and worthy of imitation, have combined the pursuit of wisdom with a marriage life. While well, I talked about these things, and the winds of opinions veered about and tossed my heart hither and thither, time was slipping away. I delayed my conversion to the Lord. I postponed from day to day the life in thee. But I could not postpone the daily death in myself. I was enamored of a happy life. But I still feared to seek it in its own abode, and so I fled from it while I sought it. I thought I should be miserable if I were deprived of the embraces of a woman, and I never gave a thought to the medicine that thy mercy has provided for the healing of that infirmity, for I had never tried it. As for continence, I imagined that it depended on one's own strength, though I found no such strength in myself, for in my folly I knew not what is written. None can be continent unless thou dost grant it. Certainly thou wouldst have given it, if I had beseeched thy ears with heartfelt groaning, and if I had cast my care upon thee with firm faith. Chapter 12 Actually, it was Alpius who prevented me from marrying, urging that if I did so, 
it would not be possible for us to live together and to have as much undistracted leisure in the love of wisdom as we had long desired. For he himself was so chaste that it was wonderful, all the more because in his early youth he had entered upon the path of promiscuity, but had not continued in it. Instead, feeling sorrow and disgust at it, he had lived from that time down to the present most continently. I quoted against him the examples of men who had been married, and still lovers of wisdom, who had pleased God and had been loyal and affectionate to their friends. I fell far short of them in greatness of soul, and enthralled with the disease of my carnality and its deadly sweetness, I dragged my chain along, fearing to be loosed of it. Thus I rejected the words of him who counseled me wisely, as if the hand that would have loosed the chain only hurt my wound. Moreover, the serpent spoke to Alpius himself by me, weaving and lying in his path, by my tongue to catch him with pleasant snares in which his honorable and free feet might be entangled. For he wondered that I, for whom he had such great esteem, should be stuck so fast in the glue-pot of pleasure as to maintain, wherever we discuss the subject, that I could not possibly live a celibate life. And when I urged in my defense against his accusing questions that the hasty and stolen delight, which he had tasted and now hardly remembered, and therefore too easily disparaged, was not to be compared with a settled acquaintance with it, and that, if to this stable acquaintance we added the honorable name of marriage, he would not then be astonished at my inability to give it up. When I spoke thus, then he also began to wish to be married, not because he was overcome by the lust for such pleasures, but out of curiosity. For he said he longed to know what that could be, without which my life, which he thought was so happy, seemed to me to be no life at all, but a punishment. For he who wore no chain was amazed at my slavery, and his amazement awoke the desire for experience, and from that he would have gone on to the experiment itself, and then perhaps he would have fallen into the very slavery that amazed him in me, since he was ready to enter into a covenant with death. For he that loves danger shall fall into it. Now, the question of conjugal honor in the ordering of a good married life and the bringing up of children interested us but slightly. What afflicted me most, and what had made me already a slave to it, was the habit of satisfying an insatiable lust. But Alpius was about to be enslaved by a merely curious wonder. But Alpius was about to be enslaved by a merely curious wonder. This is the state we were in until thou, O Most High, who never forsakest our lowliness, didst take pity on our misery, and didst come to our rescue in wonderful and secret ways. <laughs> Chapter 13 Active efforts were made to get me a wife. I wooed, I was engaged, and my mother took the greatest pains in the matter, for her hope was that, when I was once married, I might be washed in clean, health-giving baptism, for which I was being daily prepared, as she joyfully saw, taking note that her desires and promises were being fulfilled in my faith. Yet when, at my request and her own impulse, she called upon thee daily with strong, heartfelt cries that thou wouldst, by a vision, disclose unto her a leading about my future marriage. Thou wouldst not. She did, indeed, see certain vain and fantastic things, such as are conjured up by the strong preoccupation of the human spirit. And these, she supposed, had some reference to me. And she told me about them but not with the confidence she usually had when thou hadst shown her anything, for she always said that she could distinguish, by a certain feeling impossible to describe, between thy revelations and the dreams of her own soul. Yet the matter was pressed forward, 
and proposals were made for a girl who was as yet some two years too young to marry. And because she pleased me, I agreed to wait for her. Chapter 14 Many in my band of friends, consulting about and abhorring the turbulent vexations of human life, had considered and were now almost determined to undertake a peaceful life, away from the turmoil of men. This we thought could be obtained by bringing together what we severally owned, and thus making of it a common household, so that in the sincerity of our friendship nothing should belong more to one than to the other. But all were to have one purse, and the whole was to belong to each and to all. We thought that this group might consist of ten persons, some of whom were very rich, especially Romanianus, my fellow townsman, an intimate friend from childhood days. He had been brought up to the court on grave business matters, and he was the most earnest of us all about the project, and his voice was of great weight in commending it, because his estate was far more ample than that of the others. We had resolved also that each year two of us should be managers, and provide all that was needful, while the rest were left undisturbed. But when we began to reflect whether this would be permitted by our wives, which some of us had already, and others hoped to have, the whole plan, so excellently framed, collapsed in our hands, and was utterly wrecked and cast aside. From this we fell again into sighs and groans, and our steps followed the broad and beaten ways of the world. For many thoughts were in our hearts, but thy counsel standeth fast forever. In thy counsel thou didst mock ours, and didst prepare thy own plan, for it was thy purpose to give us meat in due season, to open thy hand, and to fill our souls with blessing. Chapter 15 Meanwhile, my sins were being multiplied. My mistress was torn from my side as an impediment to my marriage, and my heart which clung to her was torn and wounded till it bled. And she went back to Africa, vowing to thee never to know any other man, and leaving with me my natural son by her. But I, unhappy as I was, and weaker than a woman, could not bear the delay of the two years that should elapse before I could obtain the bride I sought. And so, since I was not a lover of wedlock so much as a slave of lust, I procured another mistress, not a wife, of course. Thus in bondage to a lasting habit, the disease of my soul might be nursed up, and kept in its vigor, or even increased until it reached the realm of matrimony. Nor indeed was the wound healed that had been caused by cutting away my former mistress, only it ceased to burn and throb, and began to fester, and was more dangerous because it was less painful. Chapter 16 Thine be the praise, unto thee be the glory, O fountain of mercies. I became more wretched, and thou didst come nearer. Thy right hand was ever ready to pluck me out of the mire, and to cleanse me, but I did not know it. Nor did anything call me back from a still deeper plunge into carnal pleasure except the fear of death and of thy future judgment, which, amid all the waverings of my opinions, never faded from my breast. And I discussed with my friends Alpius and Nebridius the nature of good and evil, maintaining that, in my judgment, Epicurus would have carried off the palm if I had not believed what Epicurus would not believe, that after death there remains a life for the soul, and places of recompense. And I demanded of them, Suppose we are immortal, and live in the enjoyment of perpetual bodily pleasure, and that without any fear of losing it, why, then, should we not be happy? Or why should we search for anything else? I did not know that this was in fact the root of my misery, that I was so fallen and blinded that I could not discern the light of virtue and of beauty, which must be embraced for its own sake, which the eye of flesh cannot see, 
and only the inner vision can see. Nor did I, alas, consider the reason why I found delight in discussing these very perplexities, shameful as they were, with my friends. For I could not be happy without friends, even according to the notions of happiness I had then, and no matter how rich the store of my carnal pleasures might be. Yet of a truth I loved my friends for their own sakes, and felt that they in turn loved me for my own sake. Oh, crooked ways! Woe to the audacious soul which hoped that by forsaking thee it would find some better thing! It tossed and turned upon back and side and belly, but the bed is hard, and thou alone givest it rest. And lo, thou art near, and thou deliverest us from our wretched wanderings, and established us in thy way, and thou comfortest us, and sayest, Run, I will carry you, yea, I will lead you home, and then I will set you free. <laughs> This audio recording is copyrighted 2007 Christian Classics Ethereal Library at Calvin College. All rights reserved. The Christian Classics Ethereal Library is a non-profit digital library of classic Christian literature. Please visit us at www.ccel.org. The cellist, Peter Plantinga, is currently a high school student. When he was young, he and his sister were the source of inspiration for the CCEL. You can read more about this online at ccel.org by clicking the About tab. From the Christian Classics Ethereal Library, on the web at www.ccel.org. Confessions of Augustine, newly translated and edited by Albert C. Outlet. Ph.D. D.D. Book 7 The Conversion to Neoplatonism Augustine traces his growing disenchantment with the Manichaean conceptions of God and evil and the dawning understanding of God's incorruptibility. But his thought is still bound by his materialistic notions of reality. He rejects astrology and turns to the study of Neoplatonism, there follows an analysis of the differences between Platonism and Christianity, and a remarkable account of his appropriation of Platinian wisdom and his experience of a Platinian ecstasy. From this, he comes finally to the diligent study of the Bible, especially the writings of the Apostle Paul. His pilgrimage is drawing towards its goal as he begins to know Jesus Christ and to be drawn to him in hesitant faith. Chapter 1 Dead now was that evil and shameful youth of mine, and I was passing into full manhood. As I increased in years, the worse was my vanity, for I could not conceive of any substance but the sort I could see with my own eyes. I no longer thought of thee, O God, by the analogy of a human body. Ever since I inclined my ear to philosophy, I had avoided this error. And the truth on this point I rejoice to find in the faith of our spiritual mother, thy Catholic Church. Yet I could not see how else to conceive thee, and I, a man, and such a man, sought to conceive thee, the sovereign and only true God. In my inmost heart, I believed that thou art incorruptible and inviolable and unchangeable because, though I knew not how or why, I could still see plainly and without doubt that the corruptible is inferior to the incorruptible, that the inviolable obviously superior to its opposite, and the unchangeable better than the changeable. My heart cried out violently against all phantasms, and with this, one clear certainty, I endeavored to brush away the swarm of unclean flies that swarmed around the eyes of my mind. But behold, 
they were scarcely scattered before they gathered again, buzzed against my face, and beclouded my vision. I no longer thought of God in the analogy of a human body, yet I was constrained to conceive thee to be some kind of a body in space, either infused into the world, or infinitely diffused beyond the world. And this was the incorruptible, inviolable, unchangeable substance, which I thought was better than the corruptible, the violable, and the changeable. For whatever I conceived to be deprived of the dimensions of space appeared to me to be nothing, absolutely nothing, not even a void. For if a body is taken out of space, or if space is emptied of all its contents, of earth, water, air, or heaven, yet it remains an empty space, a spacious nothing, as it were. Being thus gross-hearted, and not clear even to myself, I then held that whatever had neither length, nor breadth, nor density, nor solidity, and did not or could not receive such dimensions, was absolutely nothing. For at that time my mind dwelt only with ideas which resembled the forms with which my eyes are still familiar, nor could I see that the act of thought by which I formed those ideas was itself immaterial. And yet it could not have formed them if it were not itself a measurable entity. So I also thought about thee, O life of my life, as stretched out through infinite space, interpenetrating the whole mass of the world, reaching out beyond in all directions to immensity without end, so that the earth should have thee, the heaven have thee, all things have thee, and all of them be limited in thee, while thou art placed nowhere at all. As the body of the air above the earth does not bar the passage of the light of the sun, so that the light penetrates it, not by bursting nor dividing, but filling it entirely. So I imagined that the body of heaven and air and sea, and even of the earth, was all open to thee, and in all its greatest parts, as well as the smallest, was ready to receive thy presence by a secret inspiration which, from within or without all, orders all things thou hast created. This was my conjecture, because I was unable to think of anything else. Yet it was untrue, for in this way a greater part of the earth would contain a greater part of thee, a smaller part, a smaller fraction of thee. All things would be full of thee in such a sense that there would be more of thee in an elephant than in a sparrow, because one is larger than the other and fills a larger space. And this would make the portions of thyself present in the several portions of the world in fragments, great to the great, small to the small. But thou art not such a one, but as yet thou hast not enlightened my darkness. <laughs> Chapter 2 But it was not sufficient for me, O Lord, to be able to oppose those deceived deceivers and those dumb orators, dumb because thy word did not sound forth from them, to oppose them with the answer which, in the old Carthaginian days, Nebridius used to propound, shaking all of us who heard it. What could this imaginary people of darkness which the Manichaeans usually set up as an army opposed to thee, have done to thee if thou hadst declined the combat. If they replied that it could have hurt thee, they would have then have made thee violable and corruptible. If, on the other hand, the dark could have done thee no harm, then there was no cause for any battle at all. There was less cause for a battle in which a part of thee, one of thy members, a child of thy own substance, should be mixed up with opposing powers not of thy creation, and should be corrupted and deteriorated and changed by them from happiness into misery, so that it could not be delivered and cleansed without thy help. This offspring of thy substance was supposed to be the human soul to which thy word, free, pure, and entire, could bring help 
when it was being enslaved, contaminated, and corrupted. But on their hypothesis that word was itself corruptible because it is one and the same substance as the soul. And therefore, if they admitted that thy nature, whatsoever thou art, is incorruptible, then all these assertions of theirs are false and should be rejected with horror. But if thy substance is corruptible, then this is self-evidently false and should be abhorred at first utterance. This line of argument, then, was enough against those deceivers who ought to be cast forth from a surfeited stomach, for out of this dilemma they could find no way of escape without dreadful sacrilege of mind and tongue, when they think and speak such things about thee. <laughs> Chapter 3 But as yet, although I said, and was firmly persuaded that thou our Lord, the true God, who mates not only our souls, but our bodies as well, and not only our souls and bodies, but all creatures and all things, wast free from stain and alteration and in no way mutable, yet I could not readily and clearly understand what was the cause of evil. Whatever it was, I realized, that the question must be so analyzed as to not constrain me by any answer to believe that the immutable God was mutable, lest I should myself become the thing that I was seeking out. And so I pursued the search with a quiet mind, now in a confident feeling, that what had been said by the Manichaeans, and I shrank from them with my whole heart, could not be true. I now realized that when they asked what was the origin of evil, their answer was dictated by a wicked pride, which would rather affirm that thy nature is capable of suffering evil than that their own nature is capable of doing it. And I directed my attention to understand what I now was told, that free will is the cause of our doing evil, and that thy just judgment is the cause of our having to suffer from its consequences. But I could not see this clearly. So then, trying to draw the eye of my mind up out of that pit, I was plunged back into it again, and trying often just as often plunged back down. But one thing lifted me up toward thy light. It was that I had come to know that I had a will, as certainly as I knew that I had a life. When, therefore, I willed or was unwilling to do something, I was utterly certain that it was none but myself who willed or was unwilling, and immediately I realized that there was the cause of my sin. I could see that what I did against my will I suffered rather than did. And I did not regard such actions as faults, but rather as punishments in which I might quickly confess that I was not unjustly punished, since I believed thee to be most just. Who was it that put this in me, and implanted in me the root of bitterness, in spite of the fact that I was altogether the handiwork of my most sweet God? If the devil is to blame, who made the devil himself? And if he was a good angel who, by his own wicked will, became the devil, how did there happen to be in him that wicked will by which he became a devil? since a good creator made him wholly a good angel. By these reflections was I again cast down and stultified. Yet I was not plunged into that hell of error, where no man confesses to thee, where I thought that thou didst suffer evil rather than that men do it. Chapter 4 for in my struggle to solve the rest of my difficulties, I now assumed henceforth a settled truth that the incorruptible must be superior to the corruptible, and I did acknowledge that thou, whatever thou art, art incorruptible. For there never yet was, nor will be, a soul able to conceive of anything better than thee, who art the highest and best good. And since most truly and certainly the incorruptible is to be placed above the corruptible, as I now admit it. It followed that I could rise in my thoughts to something better than my God, 
if thou wert not incorruptible. When, therefore, I saw that the incorruptible was to be preferred to the corruptible, I saw then where I ought to seek thee, and where I should look for the source of evil, that is, the corruption by which thy substance can in no way be profaned. For it is obvious that corruption in no way injures our God, by no inclination, by no necessity, by no unforeseen chance, because he is our God, and what he wills is good, and he himself is that good. But to be corrupted is not good, nor art thou compelled to do anything against thy will, since thy will is not greater than thy power. But it would have to be greater if thou thyself wert greater than thyself, for the will and power of God are God himself. And what can take thee by surprise, since thou knowest all? And there is no sort of nature, but thou knowest it. And what more should we say about why that substance which God is cannot be corrupted? Because if this were so, it could not be God. <laughs> Chapter 5 And I kept seeking for an answer to the question, Whence is evil? And I sought it in an evil way, and I did not see the evil in my very search. I marshaled before the sight of my spirit all creation, all that we see of earth and sea and air and stars and trees and animals, and all that we do not see the firmament of the sky above, and all the angels and all the spiritual things, for my imagination arranged these also, as if they were bodies, in this place or that. And I pictured to myself thy creation as one vast mass, composed of various kinds of bodies, some of which were actually bodies, some of those which I imagined spirits were like. I pictured this mass as vast, of course, not in its full dimensions, for these I could not know, but as large as I could possibly think, still only finite on every side. But thou, O oh Lord, I imagined as environing the mass on every side and penetrating it, still infinite in every direction, as if there were a sea everywhere, and everywhere through measureless space nothing but an infinite sea, and it contained within itself some sort of sponge, huge but still finite, so that the sponge would in all its parts be filled from the immeasurable sea. Thus I conceived thy creation itself to be finite, and filled by thee, the infinite. And I said, Behold God, and behold what God hath created. God is good, yea, most mightily and incomparably better than all his works. But yet, he who is good has created them good. Behold how he encircles and fills them. Where, then, is evil? And whence does it come, and how has it crept in? What is its root, and what is its seed? Has it no being at all? Why, then, do we fear and shun what has no being? Or, if we fear it needlessly, then surely that fear is evil by which the heart is unnecessarily stabbed and tortured, and, indeed, a greater evil since we have nothing real to fear, and yet do fear. Therefore, either that is evil which we fear, or the act of fearing is in itself evil. But then, whence does it come, since God, who is good, has made all these things good? Indeed, he is the greatest and chiefest good, and hath created these lesser goods. But both creator and created are all good. Whence, then, is evil? Or, again, was there some evil matter out of which he made and formed and ordered it? but left something in his creation that he did not convert into good? But why should this be? Was he powerless to change the whole lump so that no evil would remain in it, if he is the omnipotent? Finally, 
Why would he make anything at all out of such stuff? Why did he not rather annihilate it by his same almighty power? Could evil exist contrary to his will? And if it were from eternity, why did he permit it to be non-existent for unmeasured intervals of time in the past? And why, then, was he pleased to make something out of it after so long a time? Or, if he wished now all of a sudden to create something, would not an almighty being have chosen to annihilate this evil matter and live by himself, the perfect, true, sovereign, and infinite good? Or, if it were not good that he who was good should not also be the framer and creator of what was good, then why was that evil matter not removed and brought to nothing, so that he might form good matter, out of which he might then create all things? For he would not be omnipotent if he were not able to create something good without being assisted by that matter which had not been created by himself. Such perplexities I revolved in my wretched breast, overwhelming with gnawing cares lest I die before I discovered the truth. And still, the faith of thy Christ, our Lord and Savior, as it was taught me by the Catholic Church, stuck fast in my heart. As yet it was unformed on many points and diverged from the rule of right doctrine, but my mind did not utterly lose it and every day drank in more and more of it. Chapter 6 By now I had also repudiated the lying divinations and impious absurdities of the astrologers. Let thy mercies, out of the depth of my soul, confess this to thee, O my God. For thou, Thou only, for who else is it who calls us back from the death of all errors except the life which does not know how to die, and the wisdom which gives light to minds that need it, although itself has no need of light, by which the whole universe is governed, even to the fluttering leaves of the trees? Thou alone providest also for my obstinacy, with which I struggled, against Vindicianus, a sagacious old man, and Nebridius, that remarkably talented young man. The former declared vehemently, and the latter frequently, though with some reservation, that no art existed by which we foresee future things. But men's surmises have oftentimes the help of chance, and out of many things which they foretold, some came to pass unawares to the predictors, who lighted on the truth by making so many guesses. And thou also providest a friend for me, who was not a negligent consulter of the astrologers, even though he was not thoroughly skilled in the art either, as I said, one who consulted them out of curiosity. He knew a good deal about it, which, he said, he had heard from his father, and never realized how far his ideas would help to overthrow my estimation of that art. His name was Ferminius, and he had received a liberal education and was a cultivated rhetorician. It also happened that he consulted me, as one very dear to him, as to what I thought about some affairs of his in which his worldly hopes had risen, viewed in the light of his so-called horoscope. Although I had now begun to learn in this matter toward Nebridius's opinion, I did not quite decline to speculate about the matter or to tell him what thoughts still came into my irresolute mind, although I did add that I was almost persuaded now that these were but empty and ridiculous follies. He then told me that his father had been very much interested in such books, and that he had a friend who was as much interested in them as he was himself. They, in combined study and consultation, fanned the flame of their affection for this folly, going so far as to observe the moment when the dumb animals which belonged to their household gave birth to young, and then observed the position of the heavens with regard to them, so as to gather fresh evidence for this so-called art. Moreover, he reported that his father had told him that, at the same time his mother was about to give birth to him, 
a female slave of a friend of his father's was also pregnant. This could not be hidden from her master, who kept records with the most diligent exactness of the birth dates even of his dogs. And so it happened to pass that, under the most careful observations, one for his wife and the other for his servant, with exact calculations of the days, hours, and minutes, both women were delivered at the same moment, so that both were compelled to cast the self-same horoscope down to the minute, the one for his son, the other for his young slave. For as soon as the women began to be in labor, they each sent word to the other as to what was happening in their respective houses, and had messengers ready to dispatch to one another as soon as they had information of the actual birth. And each, of course, knew instantly the exact time. It turned out, Ferminius said, that the messengers from the respective houses met one another at a point equidistant from either house, so that neither of them could discern any difference either in the position of the stars or any other of the most minute points. And yet Ferminius, born in a high estate in his parents' house, ran his course through the prosperous paths of this world, was increased in wealth and elevated to honors. At the same time, the slave, the yoke of his condition being still unrelaxed, continued to serve his master as Ferminius, who knew him, was able to report. Upon hearing and believing these things related to so reliable a person, all my resistance melted away. First, I endeavored to reclaim Ferminius himself from his superstition by telling him that after inspecting his horoscope, I ought, if I could foretell truly, to have seen in it parents eminent among their neighbors, a noble family in its own city, a good birth, a proper education, and liberal learning. But if that servant had consulted me with the same horoscope, since he had the same one, I ought again to tell him likewise truly that I saw in it the lowliness of his origin, the abjectness of his condition, and everything else different and contrary to the former prediction. If, then, by casting up the same horoscopes I should, in order to speak the truth, make contrary analysis— or else speak falsely if I made identical readings, then surely it followed that whatever was truly foretold by the analysis of the horoscopes was not by art, but by chance. And whatever was said falsely was not from incompetence in the art, but from the error of chance. An opening being thus made in my darkness, I began to consider other implications involved here. Suppose that one of the fools— who followed such an occupation, and whom I longed to assail, and to reduce to confusion, should urge against me that Ferminius had given me false information, or that his father had informed him falsely. I then turned my thoughts to those that are born twins, who generally come out of the womb so near the one to the other that the short interval between them, whatever importance they may ascribe to it in the nature of things, cannot be noted by human observation or expressed in those tables which the astrologer uses to examine when he undertakes to pronounce the truth. But such pronouncements cannot be true. For looking into the same horoscopes, he must have foretold the same future for Esau and Jacob, whereas the same future did not turn out for them. He must therefore speak falsely. If he is to speak truly, then he must read contrary predictions into the same horoscopes. But this would mean that it was not by art, but by chance, that he would speak truly. For thou, O Lord, most righteous ruler of the universe, dost work by a secret impulse. Whether those who inquire, or those inquired of know it or not, so that the inquirer may hear what, according to the secret merit of his soul, he ought to hear from the deeps of thy righteous judgment. Therefore let no man say to thee, What is this? Or, Why is that? Let him not speak thus, for he is only a man. Chapter 7 By now, O oh my helper, 
Thou hadst freed me from those fetters. But still I inquired, Whence is evil? And found no answer. But thou didst not allow me to be carried away from the faith by these fluctuations of thought. I still believed both that thou dost exist, and that thy substance is immutable, and that thou dost care for and wilt judge all men, and that in Christ, thy Son our Lord, and the holy scriptures, which the authority of thy Catholic Church pressed on me, thou hast planned the way of man's salvation to that life which is to come after this death. With these convictions safe and immovably settled in my mind, I eagerly inquired, Whence is evil? What torments did my travailing heart then endure? What sighs, oh my God! Yet even then thy ears were open, and I knew it not. And when in stillness I sought earnestly, those silent contritions of my soul were loud cries to thy mercy. No man knew, but thou knewest what I endured. How little of it could I express in words to the ears of my dearest friends! How could the whole tumult of my soul, for which neither time nor speech was sufficient, come to them? Yet the whole of it went into thy ears, all of which I bellowed out in the anguish of my heart. My desire was before thee, and the light of my eyes was not with me, for it was within, and I was without. Nor was that light in any place, but I still kept thinking only of things that are contained in a place, and can find among them no place to rest in. They did not receive me in such a way that I could say, It is sufficient, it is well nor did they allow me to turn back to where it might be well enough with me, for I was higher than they, though lower than thou. Thou art my true joy if I depend upon thee, and thou hast subjected me to what thou didst create lower than I. And this was the true mean and middle way of salvation for me, to continue in thy image, and by serving thee have dominion over the body." But when I lifted myself proudly against thee, and ran against the Lord even against his neck, with the thick bosses of my buckler, even the lower things were placed above me and pressed down on me, so that there was no respite or breathing space. They thrust on my sight on every side, in crowds and masses, and when I tried to think, the images of bodies obtruded themselves into my way back to thee as if they would say to me, Where are you going, unworthy and unclean one? And all these had sprung out of my wound, for thou hast humbled the haughty as one that is wounded. By my swelling pride I was separated from thee, and my bloated cheeks blinded my eyes. <laughs> Chapter 8 but thou, O Lord, art forever the same. Yet thou art not forever angry with us, for thou hast compassion on our dust and ashes. It was pleasing in thy sight to reform my deformity, and by inward stings thou didst disturb me so that I was impatient until thou wert made clear to my inward sight. By the secret hand of thy healing my swelling was lessened, the disordered and darkened eyesight of my mind was from day to day made whole by the stinging salve of wholesome grief. Chapter 9 And first of all, willing to show me how thou dost resist the proud, but give grace to the humble, and how mercifully thou hast made known to men the way of humility in that thy word was made flesh and dwelt among men, thou didst procure for me, through one inflated, with the most monstrous pride, certain books of the Platonists translated from Greek into Latin. And therein I found, not indeed the same words, but to the self-same effect, enforced by many and various reasons that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, 
and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. That which was made by Him is life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shined in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Furthermore, I read that the soul of man, though it bears witness to the light, yet itself is not the light. But the word of God, being God, is that true light that lights every man who comes into the world. And furthermore, that he was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. But that he came unto us his own, and his own received him not. And as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believed on his name. This I did not find there. Similarly, I read there that God the Word was born not of flesh nor of blood, nor of the will of man, nor the will of the flesh, but of God. But that the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, I found this nowhere there. And I discovered in those books, expressed in many and various ways, that the Son was in the form of God, and thought it not robbery to be equal in God, for he was naturally of the same substance. But that he emptied himself, and took upon himself the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him from the dead, and given him a name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This those books have not. I read further in them that before all times, and beyond all times, thy only Son remaineth unchangeably co-eternal with thee, and that of his fullness all souls receive that they may be blessed, and that by participation in that wisdom which abides in them, they are renewed, that they may be wise. But that in due time Christ died for the ungodly, and that thou sparedst not thy only Son, but deliveredst him up for us all. This is not there. For thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes, that they that labor and are heavy laden might come unto him, and he might refresh them, because he is meek and lowly in heart. The meek will he guide in judgment, and the meek will he teach his way beholding our lowliness and our trouble and forgiving all our sins. But those who strut in the high boots of what they deem to be superior knowledge will not hear him who says, Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. Thus, though they know God, yet they do not glorify him as God, nor are they thankful. Therefore, they become vain in their imaginations. Their foolish heart is darkened, and professing themselves to be wise, they become fools. And moreover, I also read there how they changed the glory of thy incorruptible nature into idols and various images, into an image made like corruptible man, and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things, namely, into that Egyptian food, for which Esau lost his birthright, so that thy firstborn people worshipped the head of a four-footed beast instead of thee, turning back in their hearts toward Egypt, and prostrating thy image, their own soul, before the image of an ox that eats grass. These things I found there, but I fed not on them. For it pleased thee, O Lord." to take away the reproach of his minority from Jacob, that the elder should serve the younger, and thou mightest call the Gentiles, 
and I sought strenuously after that gold which thou didst allow thy people to take from Egypt, since wherever it was, it was thine. And thou saidst unto the Athenians by the mouth of thy apostle, that in thee we live and move and have our being, as one of their own poets had said. And truly, these books came from there. But I did not set my mind on the idols of Egypt, which they fashioned of gold, changing the truth of God into a lie, and worshipping and serving the creature more than the Creator. Chapter 10 And being admonished by these books to return into myself, I entered into my inward soul, guided by thee. This I could do, because thou wast my helper. And I entered, and with the eye of my soul, such as it was, saw above the same eye of my soul, and above my mind, the immutable light. It was not the common light, which all flesh can see. Nor was it simply a greater one of the same sort, as if the light of day were to grow brighter and brighter and flood all space. It was not like that light, but different, yea, very different from all earthly light whatever. Nor was it above my mind in the same way as oil is above water or heaven above earth. But it was higher because it made me and I was below it because I was made by it. He who knows the truth knows that light, and he who knows it knows eternity. Love knows it, O oh, eternal truth and true love and beloved eternity. Thou art my God, to whom I sigh both night and day. When I first knew thee, thou didst lift me up, that I might see that there was something to be seen, though I was not yet fit to see it. And thou didst beat back the weakness of my sight, shining forth upon me thy dazzling beams of light, and I trembled with love and fear. I realized that I was far away from thee in the land of unlikeness, as if I'd heard thy voice from on high. I am the food of strong men. Grow, and you shall feed on me, nor shall you change me, like the food of your flesh into yourself, but you shall be changed into my likeness. And I understood that thou chastenest man for his iniquity, and makest my soul to be eaten away as though by a spider. And I said, Is truth, therefore, nothing? because it is not diffused through space, neither finite nor infinite? And thou didst cry to me from afar, I am that I am. And I heard this, as things are heard in the heart, and there was no room for doubt. I should have more readily doubted that I am alive than that the truth exists, the truth which is clearly seen being understood by the things that are made. Chapter 11 And I viewed all the other things that are beneath thee, and I realized that they are neither wholly real nor wholly unreal. They are real in so far as they come from thee, but they are unreal in so far as they are not what thou art. For that is truly real which remains immutable. It is good, then, for me to hold fast to God. For if I do not remain in him, neither shall I abide in myself. But he, remaining in himself, renews all things. And thou art the Lord my God, since thou standest in no need of my goodness. Chapter 12 
Chapter 12 And it was made clear to me that all things are good, even if they are corrupted. They could not be corrupted if they were supremely good. But unless they were good, they could not be corrupted. If they were supremely good, they would be incorruptible. If they were not good at all, there would be nothing in them to be corrupted. For corruption harms, but unless it could diminish goodness, it could not harm. Either, then, corruption does not harm, which cannot be, or, as is certain, all that is corrupted is thereby deprived of good. But if they are deprived of good, they will cease to be. For if they are at all, and cannot be at all corrupted, they will become better, because they will remain incorruptible. Now what can be more monstrous than to maintain that by losing all good they have become better? If, then, they are deprived of all good, they will cease to exist. So long as they are, therefore, they are good. Therefore, whatsoever is, is good. Evil, then, the origin of which I had been seeking, has no substance at all. For if it were a substance, it would be good. For either it would be an incorruptible substance, and so a supreme good, or a corruptible substance, which could not be corrupted unless it were good. I understood, therefore, and it was made clear to me that thou madest all things good, nor is there any substance at all not made by thee. And because all that thou madest is not equal, each by itself is good. And the sum of all of them is very good, for our God made all things very good. Chapter 13 To thee there is no such thing as evil, and even in thy whole creation taken as a whole, there is not because there is nothing from beyond it that can burst in and destroy the order which thou hast appointed for it. But in the parts of creation, some things, because they do not harmonize with others, are considered evil. Yet those same things harmonize with others and are good, and in themselves are good. And all these things which do not harmonize with each other still harmonize with the inferior part of creation which we call earth, having its own cloudy and windy sky of like nature with itself. Far be it from me, then, to say, these things should not be. For if I could see nothing but these, I should indeed desire something better. But still I ought to praise thee if only for these created things. For that thou art to be praised is shown from the fact that earth, dragons, and all deeps, fire and hail, snow and vapors, stormy winds fulfilling thy word, mountains and all hills, fruitful trees and all cedars, beasts and all cattle, creeping things, and flying fowl, things of the earth, and all people, princes, and all judges of the earth, both young men and maidens, old men and children, praise thy name. But seeing also that in heaven all thy angels praise thee, O God, praise thee in the heights, and all thy hosts sun and moon, all stars and light, the heavens of heavens, and the waters that are above the heavens, praise thy name. Seeing this, I say, I no longer desire a better world, because my thought ranged all over, and with a sounder judgment I reflected that the things above were better 
than those below. Yet that all creation together was better than the higher things alone. <laughs> Chapter 14 There is no health in those who find fault with any part of thy creation, as there was no health in me when I found fault with so many of thy works. And, because my soul dared not to be displeased with my God, it would not allow that the things which displeased me were from thee. Hence it had wandered into the notion of two substances, and could find no rest, but talked foolishly. And turning from that error, it had then made for itself a god, extended through infinite space. And it thought that this was thou, and set it up in its heart, and it became once more the temple of its own idol, an abomination to thee. But thou didst soothe my brain, though I was unaware of it, and closed my eyes lest they should behold vanity, and thus I ceased from preoccupation with self by a little, and my madness was lulled to sleep, and I awoke in thee, and beheld thee as the infinite, but not in the way I had thought, and this vision was not derived from the flesh. <laughs> Chapter 15 And I looked around at other things, and I saw that it was to thee that all of them owed their being, and that they were all finite in thee. Yet they are in thee not as in a space, but because thou holdest all things in the hand of thy truth, and because all things are true in so far as they are, and because falsehood is nothing except the existence in thought of what does not exist in fact. And I saw that all things harmonize, not only in their places, but also in their seasons. And I saw that thou, who alone art eternal, didst not begin to work after unnumbered periods of time, because all ages, both those which are past and those which shall pass, neither go nor come, except through thy working and abiding. Chapter 16 And I saw and found it no marvel that bread, which is distasteful to an unhealthy palate, is pleasant to a healthy one or that the light, which is painful to sore eyes, is a delight to sound ones. Thy righteousness displeases the wicked, and they find even more fault with the viper and the little worm, which thou hast created good, fitting in as they do with the inferior parts of creation. The wicked themselves also fit in here, and proportionately more so, as they become unlike thee. But they harmonize with the higher creation proportionately as they become like thee. And I asked what wickedness was, and I found that it was no substance but a perversion of the will bent aside from thee, O oh God, the supreme substance, toward these lower things, casting away its inmost treasure and becoming bloated with external good. Chapter 17 And I marveled that I now loved thee, and no phantasm in thy stead, and yet I was not stable enough to enjoy my God steadily. Instead, I was transported to thee by thy beauty, and then presently torn away from thee by my own weight, sinking with grief into these lower things. This weight, 
was carnal habit. But thy memory dwelt with me, and I never doubted in the least that there was one for me to cleave to. But I was not yet ready to cleave to thee firmly, for the body, which is corrupted, presses down the soul, and the earthly dwelling weighs down the mind, which muses upon many things. My greatest certainty was that the invisible things of thine from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Even thy eternal power and Godhead. For when I inquired how it was that I could appreciate the beauty of bodies, both celestial and terrestrial, and what it was that supported me in making correct judgments about things mutable, and when I concluded, this ought to be thus, this ought not. Then, when I inquired how it was that I could make such judgments, since I did, in fact, make them, I realized that I had found the unchangeable and true eternity of truth above my changeable mind. And thus... By degrees I was led upward from bodies to the soul which perceives them by means of the bodily senses, and from thereon to the soul's inward faculty, to which the bodily senses report outward things. And this belongs even to the capacities of the beasts, and thence on up to the reasoning power, to whose judgment is referred the experience received from the bodily sense. And when this power of reason within me also found that it was changeable, it raised itself up to its own intellectual principle and withdrew its thoughts from experience, abstracting itself from the contradictory throng of phantasms in order to seek for that light in which it was bathed. Then, without any doubting, it cried out that the unchangeable was better than the changeable. From this it follows that the mind somehow knew the unchangeable, for unless it had known it in some fashion, it could have no sure ground for preferring it to the changeable. And thus, with the flash of a trembling glance, it arrived at that which is. And I saw thy invisibility, understood by means of the things that are made, but I was not able to sustain my gaze. My weakness was dashed back, and I lapsed again into my accustomed ways, carrying along with me nothing but a loving memory of my vision and an appetite for what I had, as it were, smelled the odor of, but was not yet able to eat. <laughs> Chapter 18 I sought, therefore, some way to acquire the strength sufficient to enjoy thee. But I did not find it until I embraced that mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who is over all, God blessed forever, who came calling and saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life and mingling with our fleshly humanity the heavenly food I was unable to receive. For the word was made flesh, in order that thy wisdom, by which thou didst create all things, might become milk for our infancy. And as yet, I was not humble enough to hold the humble Jesus, nor did I understand what lesson his weakness was meant to teach us. For thy word, the eternal truth, far exalted above even the higher parts of thy creation, lifts his subjects up toward himself. But in this lower world, he built for himself a humble habitation of our own clay, so that he might pull down from themselves and win over to himself those whom he is to bring subject to him, lowering their pride and heightening their love, 
to the end that they might go on no farther in self-confidence, but rather should become weak, seeing at their feet the deity made weak by sharing our coats of skin, so that they might cast themselves exhausted upon him and be uplifted by his rising. <laughs> Chapter 19 But I thought otherwise. I saw in our Lord Christ only a man of eminent wisdom to whom no other man could be compared, especially because he was miraculously born of a virgin, sent to set us an example of despising worldly things for the attainment of immortality, and thus exhibiting his divine care for us. Because of this, I held that he had merited his great authority as leader. But concerning the mystery contained in The Word Was Made Flesh, I could not even form a notion. From what I learned from what has been handed down to us in the books about him, that he ate, drank, slept, walked, rejoiced in spirit, was sad, and discoursed with his fellows, I realized that his flesh alone was not bound unto thy word, but also that there was a bond with the human soul and body. Everyone knows this who knows the unchangeableness of thy word. And this I knew by now, as far as I was able, and I had no doubts at all about it. For at one time to move the limbs by an act of will, at another time not, at one time to feel some emotion, at another time not, at one time to speak intelligibly through verbal signs, at another not. These are all properties of a soul and mind subject to change. And if these things were falsely written about him, all the rest would risk the imputation of falsehood and there would remain in those books no saving faith for the human race. Therefore, because they were written truthfully, I acknowledged a perfect man to be in Christ, not the body of a man only, nor, in the body, an animal soul without a rational one as well, but a true man. And this man I held to be superior to all others, not only because he was a form of the truth, but also because of the great excellence and perfection of his human nature due to his participation in wisdom. Alpius, on the other hand, supposed the Catholics to believe that God was so clothed with flesh that besides God, and the flesh there was no soul in Christ, and he did not think that a human mind was ascribed to him and because he was fully persuaded that the actions recorded of him could not have been performed except by a living, rational creature, he moved the more slowly toward Christian faith. But when he later learned that this was the error of the Apollinarian heretics, he rejoiced in the Catholic faith and accepted it. For myself, I must confess that it was even later that I learned how in the sentence the word was made flesh, the Catholic truth can be distinguished from the falsehood of Photinus. For the refutation of heretics makes the tenets of thy church and sound doctrine to stand out boldly. For there must also be heresies that those who are approved may be made manifest among the weak. <laughs> Chapter 20 By having thus read the books of the Platonists, and having been taught by them to search for the incorporeal truth, I saw how thy invisible things are understood through the things that are made. And even when I was thrown back, I still sensed what it was that the dullness of my soul would not allow me to contemplate. 
I was assured that thou wast, and wast infinite, though not diffused in finite space or infinity, that thou truly art, who art ever the same, varying neither in part nor motion, and that all things are from thee, as is proved by this sure cause alone, that they exist. Of all this I was convinced, yet I was too weak to enjoy thee. I chattered away as if I were an expert, but if I had not sought thy way in Christ our Savior, my knowledge would have turned out to be not instruction, but destruction. For now, full of what was in fact my punishment, I had begun to desire to seem wise. I did not mourn my ignorance, but rather was puffed up with knowledge. For where was that love which builds upon the foundation of humility which is Jesus Christ? Or when would these books teach me this? I now believe that it was thy pleasure that I should fall upon these books before I studied thy scriptures, that it might be impressed on my memory how I was affected by them. And then afterward, when I was subdued by thy scriptures, and when my wounds were touched by thy healing fingers, I might discern and distinguish what a difference there is between presumption and confession between those who saw where they were to go even if they did not see the way, and the way which leads, not only to the observing, but also the inhabiting of the blessed country. For had I first been molded in thy holy scriptures, and if thou hadst grown sweet to me through my familiar use of them, and if then I had afterward fallen on those volumes, they might have pushed me off the solid ground of godliness, or, if I had stood firm in that wholesome disposition which I had there acquired, I might have thought that wisdom could be attained by the study of those books alone. <laughs> Chapter 21 With great eagerness, then, I fastened upon the venerable writings of thy spirit, and principally upon the Apostle Paul. I had thought that he sometimes contradicted himself, and that the text of his teaching did not agree with the testimonies of the law and the prophets. But now all these doubts vanished away, and I saw that those pure words had but one face, and I learned to rejoice with trembling. So I began and found that whatever truth I had read was here combined with the exaltation of thy grace. Thus, he who sees must not glory as if he had not received, not only the things that he sees, but the very power of sight. For what does he have that he has not received as a gift? By this he is not only exhorted to see, but also to be cleansed, that he may grasp thee, who art ever the same, and thus he who cannot see thee afar off may yet enter upon the road that leads to reaching, seeing, and possessing thee. For although a man may delight in the law of God after the inward man, what shall he do with that other law in his members which wars against the laws of his mind, and brings him into captivity under the law of sin, which is in his members? Thou art righteous, O Lord. But we have sinned, and committed iniquities, and have done wickedly. Thy hand has grown heavy upon us, and we are justly delivered over to that ancient sinner, the Lord of death. For he persuaded our wills to become like his will, by which he remained not in thy truth. What shall wretched man do? Who shall deliver him from the body of this death, except thy grace through Jesus Christ our Lord? whom thou hast begotten, co-eternal with thyself, and didst create in the beginning of thy ways, in whom the prince of this world found nothing worthy of death, yet he killed him. And so the handwriting which was all against us was blotted out. The books of the Platonists tell nothing of this. Their pages do not contain the expression of this kind of godliness. 
the tears of confession, thy sacrifice, a troubled spirit, a broken and contrite heart, the salvation of thy people, the espoused city, the earnest of the Holy Spirit, the cup of our redemption. In them no man sings, shall not my soul be subject unto God, for from him comes my salvation. He is my God and my salvation, my defender. I shall no more be moved. In them no one hears him calling, Come unto me, all you who labor. They scorn to learn of him, because he is meek and lowly of heart. For thou hast hidden those things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. For it is one thing to see the land of peace from a wooded mountain top, and fail to find the way thither, to attempt impassable ways in vain, opposed and waylaid by fugitives and deserters under their captain, the lion and dragon. But it is quite another thing to keep to the highway that leads thither, guarded by the hosts of the heavenly emperor, on which there are no deserters from the heavenly army to rob the passers-by, for they shun it as a torment. These thoughts sank wondrously into my heart when I read that least of thy apostles, and when I had considered all thy works, and trembled. This audio recording is copyrighted 2007 Christian Classics Ethereal Library at Calvin College. All rights reserved. The Christian Classics Ethereal Library is a non-profit digital library of classic Christian literature. Please visit us at www.ccel.org. The cellist, Peter Plantinga, is currently a high school student. When he was young, he and his sister were the source of inspiration for the CCEL. You can read more about this online at ccel.org by clicking the About tab. From the Christian Classics Ethereal Library, on the web at www.ccel.org. Confessions of Augustine, newly translated and edited by Albert C. Outlet, Ph.D., D.D. Book 8 conversion to Christ. Augustine is deeply impressed by Simplicianus's story of the conversion to Christ of the famous orator and philosopher Marius Victorinus. He is stirred to emulate him, but finds himself still enchained by his incontinence and preoccupation with worldly affairs. He is then visited by a court official, Ponticianus, who tells him and Alpius the stories of the conversion of Anthony, and also of two imperial secret service agents. These stories throw him into a violent turmoil, in which his divided will struggles against himself. He almost succeeds in making the decision for continence, but is still held back. Finally, a child song, overheard by chance, sends him to the Bible. A text from Paul resolves the crisis. The conversion is a fact. Alpius also makes his decision, and the two inform the rejoicing Monica. Chapter 1 O oh, my God, let me remember with gratitude and confess to Thee Thy mercies toward me. Let my bones be bathed in thy love, and let them say, Lord, who is like unto thee? Thou hast broken my bonds in sunder. I will offer unto thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving. And how thou didst break them, I will declare, and all who worship thee shall say, when they hear these things, Blessed be the Lord in heaven and earth. Great and wonderful is his name. Thy words had stuck fast in my breast, 
and I was hedged round about by thee on every side. Of thy eternal life I was now certain, although I had seen it through a glass darkly. And I had been relieved of all doubt that there is an incorruptible substance, and that it is the source of every other substance. Nor did I any longer crave the greater certainty about thee, but rather greater steadfastness in thee. But as for my temporal life, everything was uncertain, and my heart had to be purged of the old leaven. The way, the Savior himself, pleased me well, but as yet I was reluctant to pass through the straight gate. And thou didst put it into my mind, and it seemed good in my own sight, to go to Simplicianus, who appeared to me a faithful servant of thine, and thy grace shone forth in him. I had also been told that from his youth up he had lived in entire devotion to thee. He was already an old man, and because of his great age, which he had passed in such a zealous discipleship in thy way, he appeared to me likely to have gained much wisdom, and, indeed, he had. From all his experience, I desired him to tell me, setting before him all my agitations, which would be the most fitting way for one who felt as I did to walk in thy way. For I saw the church full, and one man was going this way and another that. Still, I could not be satisfied with the life I was living in the world. Now, indeed, my passions had ceased to excite me, as of old with hopes of honor and wealth, and it was a grievous burden to go on in such servitude. For, compared with thy sweetness and the beauty of thy house, which I loved, those things delighted me no longer. But I was still tightly bound by the love of women, nor did the apostle forbid me to marry, although he exhorted me to something better, wishing earnestly that all men were as he himself was. But I was weak, and I chose the easier way, and for this single reason my whole life was one of inner turbulence and listless indecision, because from so many influences I was compelled, even though unwilling, to agree to a married life which bound me hand and foot. I had heard from the mouth of truth that there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. But, said he, he that is able to receive it, let him receive it. Of a certainty, all men are vain who do not have the knowledge of God, or have not been able, from the good things that are seen, to find him who is good. But I was no longer fettered in that vanity. I had surmounted it, and from the united testimony of thy whole creation had found thee, our Creator, and thy word, God with thee, and together with thee and the Holy Spirit, one God, by whom thou hast created all things. There is still another sort of wicked men, who, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. Into this also I had fallen, but thy right hand held me up and bore me away, and thou didst place me where I might recover. For thou hadst said to men, Behold the fear of the Lord. This is wisdom. And be not wise in your own eyes, because they that profess themselves to be wise become fools. But I had now found the goodly pearl, and I ought to have sold all that I had and bought it. Yet, I hesitated. Chapter 2 I went, therefore, to Simplicianus, the spiritual father of Ambrose, then a bishop, whom Ambrose truly loved as a father. I recounted to him all the mazes of my wanderings, but when I mentioned to him that I had read certain books of the Platonists, which Victorinus, formerly professor of rhetoric at Rome, who died a Christian, as I had been told, had translated into Latin, Simplicianus congratulated me that I had not fallen upon the writings of other philosophers, 
which were full of fallacies and deceit, after the beggarly elements of this world, whereas in the Platonists, at every turn, the pathway led to belief in God and His Word. Then, to encourage me to copy the humility of Christ, which is hidden from the wise and revealed to babes, he told me about Victorinus himself, whom he had known intimately at Rome, and I cannot refrain from repeating what he told me about him, for it contains a glorious proof of thy grace, which ought to be confessed to thee, how that old man, most learned, most skilled in all the liberal arts, who had read, criticized, and explained so many of the writings of the philosophers, the teacher of so many noble senators, one who, as a mark of his distinguished service in office, had both merited and obtained a statue in the Roman Forum, which men of this world esteem a great honor, this man who, up to an advanced age, had been a worshipper of idols, a communicant in the sacrilegious rites to which almost all the nobility of Rome were wedded, and who had inspired the people with the love of Osiris and the dog of Anubis, and a medley crew of monster gods who against Neptune stand in arms, against Venus and Minerva, steel-clad Mars, whom Rome once conquered and now worshipped, all of which old Victorinus had with thundering eloquence defended for so many years. Despite all this, he did not blush to become a child of thy Christ, a babe at thy font, bowing his neck to the yoke of humility, and submitting his forehead to the ignominy of the cross. O Lord, Lord who didst bow the heavens and didst descend, who didst touch the mountains and they smoked, by what means did thou find thy way into that breast? He used to read the holy scriptures, as Simplicianus said, and thought out and studied all the Christian writings most studiously. He said to Simplicianus, not openly, but secretly as a friend, You must know that I am a Christian. To which Simplicianus replied, I shall not believe it, nor shall I count you among the Christians, until I see you in the Church of Christ. Victorinus then asked with mild mockery, Is it then the walls that make Christians? Thus he would often affirm that he was already a Christian, and as often Simplicianus made the same answer, and just as often his jest about the walls was repeated. He was fearful of offending his friends, proud demon worshippers, from the height of whose Babylonian dignity as from the tops of the cedars of Lebanon which the Lord had not yet broken down, he feared that a storm of enmity would descend upon him. But he steadily gained strength from reading and inquiry, and came to fear lest he should be denied by Christ before the holy angels, if he now was afraid to confess him before men. Thus he came to appear to himself guilty of a great fault, in being ashamed of the sacraments of the humility of thy word, when he was not ashamed of the sacrilegious rites of those proud demons, whose pride he had imitated and whose rites he had shared. From this he became bold-faced against vanity and shame-faced toward the truth. Thus, suddenly and unexpectedly, he said to Simplicianus, as he himself told me, let us go to the church. I wish to become a Christian. Simplicianus went with him, scarcely able to contain himself for joy. He was admitted to the first sacraments of instruction, and not long afterward gave in his name that he might receive the baptism of regeneration. At this Rome marveled, and the church rejoiced. The proud saw, and were enraged. They gnashed their teeth and melted away. But the Lord God was thy servant's hope, and he paid no attention to their vanity and lying madness. Finally, when the hour arrived for him to make a public profession of his faith, 
which at Rome those who are about to enter into thy grace from a platform in the full sight of the faithful people, in a set form of words learned by heart, the presbyters offered Victorinus the chance to make his profession more privately, for this was the custom for some who were likely to be afraid through bashfulness. But Victorinus chose rather to profess his salvation in the presence of the holy congregation, for there was no salvation in the rhetoric which he taught, yet he had professed that openly. Why, then, should he shrink from naming thy word before the sheep of thy flock, when he had not shrunk from uttering his own words before the mad multitude? So then, when he ascended the platform to make his profession, every one, as they recognized him, whispered his name one to the other in tones of jubilation. Who was there among them that did not know him? And a low murmur ran through the mouths of all the rejoicing multitude. Victorinus! Victorinus! There was a sudden burst of exultation at the sight of him, and suddenly they were hushed that they might hear him. He pronounced the true faith with an excellent boldness, and all desired to take him to their very heart. Indeed, by their love and joy they did take him to their heart, and they received him with loving and joyful hands. <laughs> Chapter 3 O oh, good God, what happens in a man to make him rejoice more at the salvation of a soul that has been despaired of, and then delivered from greater danger than over one who has never lost hope, or never been in such imminent danger? For thou also, O oh, most merciful Father, dost rejoice more over one that repents than over ninety and nine just persons that need no repentance. And we listen with much delight whenever we hear how the lost sheep is brought home again on the shepherd's shoulders, while the angels rejoice. Or when the piece of money is restored to its place in the treasury, and the neighbors rejoice with the woman who found it. And the joy of the solemn festival of thy house constrains us to tears when it is read in thy house about the younger son who was dead and is alive again, was lost and is found. For it is thou who rejoicest both in us and in thy angels who are holy through holy love. For thou art ever the same because thou knowest unchangeably all things which remain neither the same nor forever. What, then, happens in the soul when it takes more delight at finding, or having restored to it the things it loves, than if it had always possessed them? Indeed, many other things bear witness that this is so. All things are full of witnesses, crying out, So it is. The commander triumphs in victory. Yet he could not have conquered if he had not fought. And the greater the peril of the battle, the more the joy of the triumph. The storm tosses the voyagers, threatens shipwreck, and everyone turns pale in the presence of death. Then the sky and sea grow calm, and they rejoice as much as they had feared. A loved one is sick, and his pulse indicates danger. All who desire his safety are themselves sick at heart. He recovers, though not able as yet to walk with his former strength. And there is more joy now than there was before when he walked sound and strong. Indeed, the very pleasures of human life, not only those which rush upon us unexpectedly and involuntarily, but also those which are voluntary and planned, men obtain by difficulties. There is no pleasure in caring and drinking unless the pains of hunger and thirst have proceeded. Drunkards even eat certain salt meats in order to create a painful thirst, and when the drink allays this, it causes pleasure. It is also the custom that the affianced bride should not be immediately given in marriage, 
so that the husband may not esteem her any less, whom as his betrothed he longed for. This can be seen in the case of base and dishonorable pleasure, but it is also apparent in pleasures that are permitted and lawful, in the sincerity of honest friendship, and in him who was dead and lived again, who had been lost and was found. The greater joy is everywhere preceded by the greater pain. What does this mean, O Lord my God, when thou art an everlasting joy to thyself, and some creatures about thee are ever rejoicing in thee? What does it mean that this portion of creation thus ebbs and flows alternately in want and satiety? Is this their mode of being? And is this all thou hast allotted to them? That from the highest heaven to the lowest earth, from the beginning of the world to the end, from the angels to the worm, from the first movement to the last, thou wast assigning to all their proper places and their proper seasons, to all the kinds of good things, and to all thy just works? Alas, how high thou art in the highest, and how deep in the deepest! Thou never departest from us, and yet only with difficulty do we return to thee. Chapter 4 Go on, O Lord, and act. Stir us up and call us back. Inflame us and draw us to thee. Stir us up and grow sweet to us. Let us now love thee. Let us run to thee. Are there not many men who, out of a deeper pit of darkness than that of Victorinus, return to thee, who draw near to thee and are illuminated by that light which gives those who receive it power from thee to become thy sons? But if they are less well known, even those who know them rejoice less for them. For when many rejoice together, the joy of each one is fuller, in that they warm one another, catch fire from each other. Moreover, those who are well known influence many toward salvation, and take the lead with many to follow them. Therefore, even those who took the way before them rejoice over them greatly, because they do not rejoice over them alone. But it ought never to be that in thy tabernacle the persons of the rich should become welcome before the poor, or the nobly born before the rest, since thou hast rather chosen the weak things of the world to confound the strong, and hast chosen the base things of the world, and things that are despised, and the things that are not, in order to bring to naught the things that are. It was even the least of the apostles by whose tongue thou didst sound forth these words. And when Paulus, the proconsul, had his pride overcome by the onslaught of the apostle, and he was made to pass under the easy yoke of thy Christ, and become an officer of the great king, he also desired to be called Paul instead of Saul, his former name, in testimony to such a great victory. For the enemy is more overcome in one on whom he has a greater hold, and whom he has hold of more completely. But the proud he controls more readily through their concern about their rank, and through them he controls more by means of their influence the more, therefore, the world prized the heart of Victorinus, which the devil had held in an impregnable stronghold, and the tongue of Victorinus, that sharp, strong weapon with which the devil had slain so many, all the more exultingly should thy sons rejoice, because our king hath bound the strong man, and they saw his vessels taken from him, and cleansed, and made fit for thy honor and profitable to the Lord for every good work. Chapter 5 
Chapter 5 Now when this man of thine, Simplicianus, told me the story of Victor Innes, I was eager to imitate him. Indeed, indeed, this was Simplicianus's purpose in telling it to me. But when he went on to tell how, in the reign of the Emperor Julian, there was a law passed by which Christians were forbidden to teach literature and rhetoric, and how Victorinus, in ready obedience to the law, chose to abandon his school of words rather than thy word, by which thou makest eloquent the tongues of the dumb, he appeared to me not so much brave as happy, because he had found a reason for giving his time wholly to thee. For this was what I was longing to do, but as yet I was bound by the iron chain of my own will. The enemy held fast my will, and had made of it a chain, and had bound me tight with it. For out of the perverse will came lust, and the service of lust ended in habit, and habit, not resisted, became necessity. By these links, as it were, forged together, which is why I called it a chain, a hard bondage held me in slavery. But that new will, which had begun to spring up in me freely to worship thee and to enjoy thee, O oh my God, the only certain joy, was not able as yet to overcome my former willfulness, made strong by long indulgence. Thus my two wills, the old and the new, the carnal and the spiritual, were in conflict within me, and by their discord they tore my soul apart. Thus I came to understand from my own experience what I had read, how the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. I truly lusted both ways, yet more in that which I approved in myself than in that which I disapproved in myself. For in the latter, it was not now really I that was involved, because here I was rather an unwilling sufferer than a willing actor. And yet it was through me that habit had become an armed enemy against me, because I had willingly come to be what I unwillingly found myself to be. Who, then, can with any justice speak against it, when just punishment follows the sinner? I had now no longer my accustomed excuse that, as yet, I hesitated to forsake the world and serve thee, because my perception of the truth was uncertain. For now it was certain. But still bound to the earth, I refused to be thy soldier, and was as much afraid of being freed from all entanglements as we ought to fear to be entangled. Thus with the baggage of the world I was sweetly burdened, as one in slumber, and my musings on thee were like the efforts of those who desire to awake, but who are still overpowered with drowsiness and fall back into deep slumber. And as no one wishes to sleep forever, for all men rightly count waking better, yet a man will usually defer shaking off his drowsiness when there is a heavy lethargy in his limbs, and he is glad to sleep on, even when his reason disapproves, and the hour for rising has struck. So was I assured that it was much better for me to give myself up to thy love than to go on yielding myself to my own lust. Thy love satisfied and vanquished me. My lust pleased and fettered me. I had no answer to thy calling to me. Awake, you who sleep, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give you light. On all sides thou didst show me that thy words are true, and I, convicted by the truth, had nothing at all to reply but the drawling and drowsy words. Presently, see presently, leave me alone a little while. But presently, presently, had no present, and my leave me alone a little while went on for a long while. In vain did I delight in thy law in the inner man, while another law in my members warred against the law of my mind, and brought me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. 
For the law of sin is the tyranny of habit, by which the mind is drawn and held, even against its will. Yet it deserves to be so held because it so willingly falls into the habit. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? But thy grace alone, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Chapter 6 And now I will tell and confess unto thy name, O Lord, my helper and my redeemer, how thou didst deliver me from the chain of sexual desire by which I was so tightly held, and from the slavery of worldly business. With increasing anxiety I was going about my usual affairs and daily sighing to thee. I attended thy church as frequently as my business, under the burden of which I groaned, left me free to do so. Alpius was with me, disengaged at last from his legal post, after a third term as assessor, and now waiting for private clients to whom he might sell his legal advice, as I sold the power of speaking, as if it could be supplied by teaching. But Nebridius had consented, for the sake of our friendship, to teach under Vericundus, a citizen of Milan, and professor of grammar, and a very intimate friend of us all, who ardently desired, and by right of friendship demanded from us, the faithful aid he greatly needed. Nebridius was not drawn to this by any desire of gain, for he could have made much more out of his learning had he been so inclined. But as he was a most sweet and kindly friend, he was unwilling, out of respect for the duties of friendship, to slight our request." But in this he acted very discreetly, taking care not to become known to those persons who had great reputations in the world. Thus he avoided all distractions of mind, and reserved as many hours as possible to pursue or read or listen to discussions about wisdom. On a certain day, then, when Nebridius was away, for some reason I cannot remember, there came to visit Alpius and me at our house one Ponticianus, a fellow countryman of ours from Africa, who held high office in the emperor's court. What he wanted with us I do not know, but we sat down to talk together, and it chanced that he noticed a book on the game-table before us. He took it up, opened it, and contrary to his expectation, found it to be the Apostle Paul, for he imagined that it was one of my wearisome rhetoric textbooks. At this he looked up at me with a smile, and expressed his delight and wonder that he had so unexpectedly found this book, and only this one, lying before my eyes. For he was indeed a Christian, and a faithful one at that, and, and often he prostrated himself before thee, our God, in the church in constant daily prayer. When I had told him that I had given much attention to these writings, a conversation followed, in which he spoke of Anthony, the Egyptian monk, whose name was in high repute among thy servants, although up to that time not familiar to me. When he learned this, he lingered on the topic, giving us an account of this eminent man and marveling at our ignorance. We in turn were amazed to hear of thy wonderful works, so fully manifested in recent times, almost in our own occurring in the true faith in the Catholic Church. We all wondered, we, that these things were so great, and he, that we had never heard of them. From this, his conversation turned to the multitudes in the monasteries, and their manners so fragrant to thee, and to the teeming solitudes of the wilderness, of which we knew nothing at all. There was even a monastery at Milan, outside the city's walls, full of good brothers under the fostering care of Ambrose, and we were ignorant of it. He went on with his story, and we listened intently and in silence. He then told us how, on a certain afternoon, at Trier, when the emperor was occupied watching the gladiatorial games, he and three comrades went out for a walk in the gardens close to the city walls. There, as they chanced to walk two by two, one strolled away with him, while the other two went on by themselves. 
As they rambled, these first two came upon a certain cottage where lived some of thy servants, some of the poor in spirit, where they found the book in which was written the life of Anthony. One of them began to read it, to marvel, and to be inflamed by it. While reading, he meditated on embracing just such a life, giving up his worldly employment to seek thee alone. These two belonged to the group of officials called secret service agents. Then, suddenly being overwhelmed with a holy love and a sober shame, and as if in anger with himself, he fixed his eye on his friend, exclaiming, Tell me, I beg you, what goal are we seeking in all these toils of ours? What is it that we desire? What is our motive in public service? Can our hopes in the court rise higher than to be friends of the emperor? But how frail, how beset with peril is that pride? Through what dangers must we climb to a greater danger? And when shall we succeed? But if I choose to become a friend of God, see, I can become one now. Thus he spoke, and in the pangs of the travail of the new life he turned his eyes again onto the page, and continued reading. He was inwardly changed, as thou didst see, and the world dropped away from his mind, as soon became plain to others. For as he read with a heart like a stormy sea, more than once he groaned. Finally, he saw the better course, and resolved on it. Then, having become thy servant, he said to his friend, Now I have broken loose from those hopes we had, and I am determined to serve God, and I enter into that service from this hour in this place. If you are reluctant to imitate me, do not oppose me. The other replied that he would continue bound in his friendship, to share in so great a service for so great a prize. So both became thine, and began to build a tower, counting the cost, namely of forsaking all that they had, and following thee. Shortly after, Ponticianus and his companion, who had walked with him in the other part of the garden, came in search of them to the same place, and having found them, reminded them to return, as the day was declining. But the first two, making known to Ponticianus their resolution and purpose, and how a resolve had sprung up and become confirmed in them, entreated them not to take it ill if they refused to join themselves with them. But Ponticianus and his friend, although not changed from their former course, did nevertheless, as he told us, bewail themselves and congratulated their friends on their godliness, recommending themselves to their prayers. And with hearts inclining again toward earthly things, they returned to the palace. But the other two, setting their affections on heavenly things, remained in the cottage. Both of them had affianced brides who, when they heard of this, likewise dedicated their virginity to thee. Chapter 7 Such was the story Ponticianus told. But while he was speaking, thou, O Lord, turned me toward myself, taking me from behind my back, where I had put myself while unwilling to exercise self-scrutiny. And thou didst set me face to face with myself, that I might see how ugly I was, and how crooked and sordid, besotted and ulcerous. And I looked, and I loathed myself, but whither to fly from myself I could not discover. And if I sought to turn my gaze away from myself, he would continue his narrative, and thou wouldst oppose me to myself, and thrust me before my own eyes that I might discover my iniquity, and hate it. I had known it, but acted as though I knew it not. I winked at it, and forgot it. But now, the more ardently I loved those whose wholesome affections I heard reported, 
that they had given themselves up wholly to thee to be cured. The more did I abhor myself when compared with them. For many of my years, perhaps twelve, had passed away since my nineteenth, when upon the reading of Cicero's Hortensius, I was roused to a desire for wisdom. And here I was, still postponing the abandonment of this world's happiness to devote myself to the search. For not just the finding alone, but also the bare search for it, ought to have been preferred above the treasures and kingdoms of this world, better than all bodily pleasures, though they were to be had for the taking. But wretched youth that I was, supremely wretched even in the very outset of my youth, I had entreated chastity of thee, and had prayed, Grant me chastity and continence, but not yet, for I was afraid lest thou shouldst hear me too soon, and too soon cure me of my disease of lust which I desired to have satisfied rather than extinguished. And I had wandered through perverse ways of godless superstition, not really sure of it either, but preferring it to the other, which I did not seek in piety, but opposed in malice. And I had thought that I delayed from day to day in rejecting those worldly hopes, and following thee alone, because there did not appear anything certain by which I could direct my course. And now the day had arrived, in which I was laid bare to myself, and my conscience was to chide me. Where are you, O oh, my tongue? You said indeed that you were not willing to cast off the baggage of vanity for uncertain truth. But behold, now it is certain, and still that burden oppresses you. At the same time, those who have not worn themselves out with searching for it as you have, nor spent ten years and more in thinking about it, have had their shoulders unburdened, and have received wings to fly away. Thus was I inwardly confused, and mightily confounded with a horrible shame, while Ponticianus went ahead speaking such things. And when he had finished his story, and the business he came for, he went his way. And then what did I not say to myself within myself? With what scourges of rebuke did I not lash my soul to make it follow me, as I was struggling to go after thee? Yet it drew back. It refused. It would not make an effort. All its arguments were exhausted and confuted. Yet it resisted in sullen disquiet, fearing the cutting off of that habit by which it was being wasted to death, as if it were death itself. Chapter 8 Then, as this vehement quarrel, which I waged with my soul in the chamber of my heart, was raging inside my inner dwelling, agitated both in mind and countenance, I seized upon Alpheus and exclaimed, What is the matter with us? What is this? What did you hear? The uninstructed start up and take heaven, and we, with all our learning but so little heart, see where we wallow in flesh and blood, because others have gone before us. Are we ashamed to follow, and not rather ashamed at our not following? I scarcely knew what I said, and in my excitement I flung away from him, while he gazed at me in silent astonishment, for I did not sound like myself. My face, eyes, color, tone expressed my meaning more clearly than my words. There was a little garden belonging to our lodging, of which we had the use, as of the whole house, for the master, our landlord, who did not live there. The tempest in my breast hurried me out into the garden, where no one might interrupt the fiery struggle in which I was engaged with myself, until it came to the outcome that thou knewest, though I did not. But I was mad for health, and dying for life, knowing what evil thing I was, but not knowing what good thing I was so shortly to become. I fled into the garden, with Alpheus following step by step, 
for I had no secret in which he did not share. And how could he leave me in such distress? We sat down, as far from the house as possible. I was greatly disturbed in spirit, angry at myself with a turbulent indignation because I had not entered thy will and covenant. Oh, my God! While all my bones cried out to me to enter, extolling it to the skies. The way therein is not by ships or chariots or feet. Indeed, it was not as far as I had come from the house to the place where we were seated. For to go along that road, and indeed to reach the goal, is nothing else but the will to go. But it must be a strong and single will, not staggering and swaying about this way and that, a changeable, twisting, fluctuating will, wrestling with itself while one part falls as another rises. Finally, in the very fever of my indecision, I made many motions with my body, like men do when they will to act but cannot, either because they do not have the limbs, or because their limbs are bound or weakened by disease, or incapacitated in some other way. Thus, if I tore my hair, struck my forehead, or, entwining my fingers, clasped my knee, these I did because I willed it. But I might have willed it, and still not have done it, if the nerves had not obeyed my will. Many things then I did, in which the will and power to do were not the same. Yet I did not do that one thing which seemed to me infinitely more desirable, which before long I should have power to will, because shortly, when I willed, I would will with a single will. For in this, the power of willing is the power of doing, and as yet, I could not do it. Thus, my body more readily obeyed the slightest wish of the soul in moving its limbs at the order of my mind than my soul obeyed itself to accomplish in the will alone its great resolve. <laughs> Chapter 9 How can there be such a strange anomaly? And why is it? Let thy mercy shine on me, that I may inquire and find an answer amid the dark labyrinth of human punishment and in the darkest contritions of the sons of Adam. Whence such an anomaly? And why should it be? The mind commands the body, and the body obeys. The mind commands itself, and is resisted. The mind commands the hand to be moved, and there is such readiness that the command is scarcely distinguished from the obedience in act. Yet the mind is mind, and the hand is body. The mind commands the mind to will, and yet though it be itself, it does not obey itself. Whence this strange anomaly, and why should it be? I repeat, the will commands itself to will, and could not give the command unless it wills. And yet what is commanded is not done. But actually, the will does not will entirely. Therefore, it does not command entirely. For as far as it wills, it commands. And as far as it does not will, the thing commanded is not done. For the will commands that there be an act of will, not another, but itself. But it does not command entirely. Therefore, what is commanded does not happen. For if the will were whole and entire, it would not even command it to be, because it would already be. It is, therefore, no strange anomaly, partly to will and partly to be unwilling. This is actually an infirmity of mind, which cannot wholly rise, while pressed down by habit, even though it is supported by the truth. And so there are two wills, because one of them is not whole, and what is present in this one is lacking in the other. Chapter 10 
Chapter 10 Let them perish from thy presence, O God, as vain talkers and deceivers of the soul perish, who, when they observe that there are two wills in the act of deliberation, go on to affirm that there are two kinds of minds in us, one good, the other evil. They are indeed themselves evil when they hold these evil opinions, and they shall become good only when they come to hold the truth and consent to the truth, that thy apostle may say to them, You were formerly in darkness, but now are you in the light in the Lord. But they desired to be light, not in the Lord, but in themselves. They conceived the nature of the soul to be the same as what God is, and they have become a thicker darkness than they were, for in their dread arrogance they have gone farther away from thee, from thee, the true light that lights every man that comes into the world. Mark what you say and blush for shame. Draw near to him and be enlightened, and your faces shall not be ashamed. While I was deliberating whether I would serve the Lord my God now, as I had long purposed to do, it was I who willed it, and it was also I who was unwilling. In either case, it was I. I neither willed with my whole will, nor was I wholly unwilling. And so I was at war with myself, and torn apart by myself. And this strife was against my will. Yet it did not show the presence of another mind, but the punishment of my own. Thus it was no more I who did it, but the sin that dwelt in me, the punishment of a sin freely committed by Adam, and I was a son of Adam. For if there are as many opposing natures as there are opposing wills, there will not be two, but many more. If any man is trying to decide whether he should go to their covenantical or to the theater, the Manichaeans at once cry out, See, here are two natures, one good, drawing this way, another bad, drawing back that way. For how else can you explain this indecision between conflicting wills? But I reply that both impulses are bad, that which draws to them and that which draws back to the theater. But they do not believe that the will which draws to them can be anything but good. Suppose, then, that one of us should try to decide, and through the conflict of his two wills, should waver whether he should go to the theater or to our church. Would not those also waver about the answer here? For either they must confess, which they are unwilling to do, that the will that leads to our church is as good as that which carries their own adherents and those captivated by their mysteries, or else they must imagine that there are two evil natures and two evil minds in one man, both at war with each other. And then it will not be true what they say, that there is one good and another bad, else they must be converted to the truth, and no longer deny that when anyone deliberates there is one soul fluctuating between conflicting wills. Let them no longer maintain that when they perceive two wills to be contending with each other in the same man, the contest is between two opposing minds, of two opposing substances, from two opposing principles, the one good and the other bad. Thus, O true God, thou dost reprove and confute and convict them, for both wills may be bad, as when a man tries to decide whether he should kill a man by poison or by the sword, whether he should take possession of this field or that one belonging to someone else, when he cannot get both, whether he should squander his money to buy pleasure or hold on to his money through the motive of covetousness whether he should go to the circus or to the theater, if both are open on the same day, or whether he should take a third course, open at the same time, and rob another man's house, or a fourth option, whether he should commit adultery, if he has the opportunity, all these things concurring in the same space of time, and all being equally longed for, although impossible to do at one time. 
for the mind is pulled four ways by four antagonistic wills, or even more, in view of the vast range of human desires. But even the Manichaeans do not affirm that there are these many different substances. The same principle applies as in the action of good wills. For I ask them, Is it a good thing to have delight in reading the Apostle? Or is it a good thing to delight in a sober psalm? Or is it a good thing to discourse on the gospel? To each of these they will answer, It is good. But what, then, if all delight us equally, and all at the same time? Do not different wills distract the mind when a man is trying to decide what he should choose? Yet they are all good and are at variance with each other until one is chosen. When this is done, the whole united will may go forward on a single track, instead of remaining as it was before, divided in many ways. So also, when eternity attracts us from above, and the pleasure of earthly delights pull us down from below, the soul does not will either the one or the other with all its force. But still, it is the same soul that does not will this or that with a united will, and is therefore pulled apart with grievous perplexities, because for truth's sake it prefers this, but for custom's sake it does not lay that aside. <laughs> Chapter 11 Thus I was sick and tormented, reproaching myself more bitterly than ever, rolling and writhing in my chain till it should be utterly broken. By now I was held but slightly, but still was held. And thou, O Lord, didst press upon me in my inmost heart with a severe mercy, redoubling the lashes of fear and shame, lest I should again give way, and that same slender remaining tie not be broken off, but recover strength, and enchain me yet more securely. I kept saying to myself, See, let it be done now, let it be done now. And as I said this, I all but came to a firm decision, I all but did it. Yet I did not quite. Still I did not fall back to my old condition, but stood aside for a moment and drew breath. And I tried again, and lacked only a very little of reaching the resolve, and then somewhat less, and then all but touched and grasped it. Yet I still did not quite reach, or touch, or grasp the goal, because I hesitated to die to death and to live to life, and the worse way to which I was habituated was stronger in me than the better, which I had not tried, and up to the very moment in which I was to become another man, the nearer the moment approached, the greater horror did it strike in me. But it did not strike me back, nor turn me aside, but held me in suspense. It was, in fact, my old mistresses, trifles of trifles and vanities of vanities who still enthralled me. They tugged at my fleshly garments and softly whispered, Are you going to part with us? And from that moment will we never be with you any more? And from that moment will not this and that be forbidden you forever? What were they suggesting to me in those words, this or that? What is it they suggested, O oh my God? Let thy mercy guard the soul of thy servant from the vileness and the shame they did suggest. And now I scarcely heard them, for they were not openly showing themselves and opposing me face to face, but muttering, as it were, behind my back, and furtively plucking at me as I was leaving, trying to make me look back at them. Still, they delayed me, so that I hesitated to break loose and shake myself free of them and leap over to the place to which I was being called, for unruly habit kept saying to me, 
do you think you can live without them? But now it said this very faintly, for in the direction I had set my face, and yet toward which I still trembled to go, the chaste dignity of countenance appeared to me, cheerful but not wanton, modestly alluring me to come and doubt nothing, extending her holy hands, full of multitude of good examples, to receive and embrace me. There were there so many young men and maidens, a multitude of youth and every age, grave widows and ancient virgins, and continence herself in their midst, not barren, but a fruitful mother of children, her joys, by thee, O Lord, her husband. And she smiled on me with a challenging smile, as if to say, Can you not do what these young men and maidens can? Or can any of them do it of themselves, and not rather in the Lord their God? The Lord their God gave me to them. Why do you stand in your own strength, and so stand not? Cast yourself on him, fear not. He will not flinch, and you will not fall. Cast yourself on him without fear, for he will receive and heal you. And I blushed violently, for I still heard the muttering of those trifles and hung suspended. Again she seemed to speak. Stop your ears against those unclean members of yours, that they may be mortified. They tell you of delights, but not according to the law of the Lord thy God. This struggle raging in my heart was nothing but the contest of self against self. And Alpius kept close beside me, and awaited in silence the outcome of my extraordinary agitation. <laughs> Chapter 12 Now when deep reflection had drawn up out of the secret depths of my soul all my misery, and had heaped it up before the sight of my heart, there arose a mighty storm, accompanied by a mighty rain of tears. That I might give way fully to my tears and lamentations, I stole away from Alpius, for it seemed to me that solitude was more appropriate for the business of weeping. I went far enough away that I could feel that even his presence was no restraint upon me. This was the way I felt at the time, and he realized it. I suppose I had said something before I started up, and he noticed the sound of my voice was choked with weeping. And so he stayed alone, where we had been sitting together, greatly astonished. I flung myself down under a fig tree, how I know not and gave free course to my tears. The streams of my eyes gushed out an acceptable sacrifice to thee. And, not indeed in these words, but to this effect, I cried to thee, And thou, O Lord, how long, how long, O Lord, wilt thou be angry forever? O remember not against us our former iniquities. For I felt that I was still enthralled by them, I sent up these sorrowful cries. How long, how long? Tomorrow and tomorrow? Why not now? Why not this very hour make an end to my uncleanness? I was saying these things and weeping in the most bitter contrition of my heart, when suddenly I heard the voice of a boy, or a girl I know not which, coming from the neighboring house, chanting over and over again, Pick it up, read it, pick it up, read it. Immediately I ceased weeping, and began most earnestly to think whether it was usual for children in some kind of game to sing such a song. But I could not remember ever having heard the like. So damning the torrent of my tears, I got to my feet, for I could not but think that this was a divine command to open the Bible and read the first passage I should light upon. For I had heard how Anthony, accidentally coming into church while the gospel was being read, 
received the admonition as if what was read had been addressed to him. Go and sell what you have, and give it to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. By such an oracle he was forthwith converted to thee. So I quickly returned to the bench where Alpheus was sitting, for there I had put down the apostle's book when I had left there. I snatched it up, opened it, and in silence read the paragraph on which my eyes first fell. Not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. I wanted to read no further, nor did I need to. For instantly, as the sentence ended, there was infused in my heart something like the light of full certainty, and all the gloom of doubt vanished away. Closing the book then, and putting my finger or something else for a mark, I began, now with a tranquil countenance, to tell it all to Alpheus, and he in turn disclosed to me what had been going on in himself, of which I knew nothing. He asked to see what I had read. I showed him, and he looked on even further than I had read. I had not known what followed, but indeed it was this. Him that is weak in the faith, receive. This he applied to himself, and told me so. By these words of warning he was strengthened, and by exercising his good resolution and purpose, all very much in keeping with his character, in which, these respects, he was always far different from, and better than I, he joined me in full commitment without any restless hesitation. Then we went in to my mother, and told her what happened, to her great joy. We explained to her how it had occurred, and she leaped for joy triumphant, and she blessed thee, who art able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. For she saw that thou hadst granted her far more than she had ever asked for in all her pitiful and doleful lamentations. For thou didst convert me to thee that I sought neither a wife nor any other of this world's hopes, but set my feet on that rule of faith which so many years before thou hadst showed her in her dream about me. And so thou didst turn her grief into gladness, more plentiful than she had ventured to desire, and dearer and purer than the desire she used to cherish of having grandchildren of my flesh. This audio recording is copyrighted 2007 Christian Classics Ethereal Library at Calvin College. All rights reserved. The Christian Classics Ethereal Library is a non-profit digital library of classic Christian literature. Please visit us at www.ccel.org. The cellist, Peter Plantinga, is currently a high school student. When he was young, he and his sister were the source of inspiration for the CCEL. You can read more about this online at ccel.org by clicking the About tab. From the Christian Classics Ethereal Library, on the web at www.ccel.org. Confessions of Augustine, newly translated and edited by Albert C. Outler, Ph.D., D.D. Book 9 The End of the Autobiography Augustine tells of his resigning from his professorship, and of the days at Cassi Kiacum, in preparation for baptism. He is baptized together with Adiodatus and Alpius. Shortly thereafter, they start back for Africa. Augustine recalls the ecstasy he and his mother shared in Ostia, and then reports her death 
and burial and his grief. The book closes with a moving prayer for the souls of Monica Patricius and all his fellow citizens of the heavenly Jerusalem. <laughs> Chapter 1 O Lord, I am thy servant, I am thy servant, and the son of thy handmaid. Thou hast loosed my bonds. I will offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving. Let my heart and my tongue praise thee, and let all my bones say, Lord, who is like unto thee? Let them say so, and answer thou me, and say unto my soul, I am your salvation. Who am I, and what is my nature? What evil is there not in me and my deeds? Or if not in my deeds, my words? Or if not in my words, my will? But thou, O Lord, art good and merciful, and thy right hand didst reach into the depth of my death, and didst empty out the abyss of corruption from the bottom of my heart. And this was the result. Now I did not will to do what I willed, and began to will to do what thou didst will. But where was my free will during all those years, and from what deep and secret retreat was it called forth in a single moment, whereby I gave my neck to thy easy yoke, and my shoulders to thy light burden? O Christ Jesus, my strength and my Redeemer! How sweet did it suddenly become to me to be without the sweetness of trifles! And it was now a joy to put away what I formerly feared to lose. For thou didst cast them away from me, O true and highest sweetness. Thou didst cast them away, and in their place thou didst enter in thyself, sweeter than all pleasure, though not to flesh and blood, brighter than all light, but more veiled than all mystery, more exalted than all honor though not to them that are exalted in their own eyes. Now was my soul free from the gnawing cares of seeking and getting, of wallowing in the mire and scratching the itch of lust. And I prattled like a child to thee, O Lord my God, my light, my riches, and my salvation. Chapter 2 and it seemed right to me, in thy sight, not to snatch my tongue's service abruptly out of the speech market, but to withdraw quietly, so that the young men who were not concerned about thy law or thy peace, but with mendacious follies and forensic strifes, might no longer purchase from my mouth weapons for their frenzy. Fortunately, there were only a few days before the vintage vacation, and I determined to endure them, so that I might resign in due form, and now bought by thee, return for sale no more. My plan was known to thee, but save for my own friends, it was not known to other men, for we had agreed that it should not be made public, although in our ascent from the Valley of Tears, and our singing of the Song of Degrees, Thou hast given us sharp arrows and hot burning coals to stop that deceitful tongue which opposes under the guise of good counsel and devours what it loves as though it were food. Thou hadst pierced our heart with thy love, and we carried thy words, as it were, thrust through our vitals. The examples of thy servants whom thou hast changed from black to shining white and from death to life, crowded into the bosom of our thoughts and burned and consumed our sluggish temper, that we might not topple back into the abyss. And they fired us exceedingly, so that every breath of the deceitful tongue of our detractors might fan the flame and not blow it out. Though this vow and purpose of ours should find those who would loudly praise it for the sake of thy name which thou hast sanctified throughout the earth, it nevertheless looked like a self-vaunting not to wait until the vacation time now so near. For if I had left such a public office ahead of time, and had made the break in the eye of the general public, 
all who took notice of this act of mine, and observed how near was the vintage time that I wished to anticipate, would have talked about me a great deal, as if I were trying to appear a great person. And what purpose would it serve that people should consider and dispute about my conversion so that my good should be evil spoken of? Furthermore, this same summer my lungs had begun to be weak from too much literary labor. Breathing was difficult. The pains in my chest showed that the lungs were affected and were soon fatigued by too loud or prolonged speaking. This had at first been a trial to me, for it would have compelled me almost of necessity to lay down that burden of teaching. Or, if I was to be cured and become strong again, at least to take a leave for a while. But as soon as the full desire to be still that I might know that thou art the Lord, arose and was confirmed in me, thou knowest, my God, that I began to rejoice that I had this excuse ready, and not a feigned one either, which might somewhat temper the displeasure of those who for their son's freedom wished me never to have any freedom of my own.'